Part One of Lizzie Lee by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a Weekly Journal, Number One, Saturday, March the thirtieth, eighteen fifty. Lizzie Lee in four chapters, Chapter One. When death is present in a household on Christmas Day, the very contrast between the time as it now is and the day as it has often been gives a poignancy to sorrow, a more utter blankness to the desolation. James Lee died just as the faraway bells of Rochdale Church were ringing for morning service on Christmas Day, 1836. A few minutes before his death, he opened his already glazing eyes and made a sign to his wife, by the faint motion of his lips, that he had yet something to say. She stooped close down, and caught the broken whisper. I forgive her, Anne. May God forgive me. Oh, my love, my dear, only get well, and I will never cease showing my thanks for those words. May God in heaven bless thee for saying them. Thou art not so restless, my lad. Maybe... Oh, God! For even while she spoke, he died. They had been two and twenty years man and wife. For nineteen of those years their life had been as calm and happy as the most perfect uprightness on the one side and the most complete confidence and loving submission on the other could make it. Milton's famous line might have been framed and hung up as the rule of their married life for he was truly the interpreter who stood between God and her. She would have considered herself wicked if she had ever dared even to think him austere, though as certainly as he was an upright man, so surely was he hard, stern and inflexible. But for three years the moan and the murmur had never been out of her heart. She had rebelled against her husband as against a tyrant, with a hidden, sullen rebellion, which tore up the old landmarks of wifely duty and affection, and poisoned the fountains whence gentlest love and reverence had once been for ever springing. But those last blessed words replaced him on his throne in her heart, and called out penitent anguish for all the bitter estrangement of later years. It was this which made her refuse all the entreaties of her sons that she would see the kind-hearted neighbours who called on their way from church to sympathise and condole. No, she would stay with the dead husband that had spoken tenderly at last, if for three years he had kept silence. Who knew but what, if she had only been more gentle and less angrily reserved, he might have relented earlier, and in time. She sat rocking herself to and fro by the side of the bed, while the footsteps below went in and out. She had been in sorrow too long to have any violent burst of deep grief now. The furrows were well worn in her cheeks, and the tears flowed quietly, if incessantly, all the day long. But when the winter's night drew on, and the neighbours had gone away to their homes, she stole to the window and gazed out, long and wistfully, over the dark grey moors. She did not hear her son's voice as he spoke to her from the door, nor his footstep as he drew nearer. She started when he touched her. Mother, come down to us. There's no one but Will and me. Dearest mother, we do so want you. The poor lad's voice trembled and he began to cry. It appeared to require an effort on Mrs Lee's part to tear herself away from the window, but with a sigh she complied with his request. The two boys, for though Will was nearly twenty-one, she still thought of him as a lad, had done everything in their power to make the house-place comfortable for her. She herself, in the old days before her sorrow, had never made a brighter fire or a cleaner hearth, ready for her husband's return home, than now awaited her. The tea-things were all put out, and the kettle was boiling, and the boys had calmed their grief down into a kind of sober cheerfulness. They paid her every attention they could think of, but received little notice on her part, she did not resist, she rather submitted to all their arrangements, but they did not seem to touch her heart. When tea was ended, 
it was merely the form of tea that had been gone through, Will moved the things away to the dresser. His mother leant back languidly in her chair. Mother, shall Tom read you a chapter? He's a better scholar than I. Ay, lad, said she, almost eagerly. That's it. Read me the prodigal son. Ay, ay, lad, thank thee. Tom found the chapter and read it in the high-pitched voice which is customary in village schools. His mother bent forward, her lips parted, her eyes dilated, her whole body instinct with eager attention. Will sat with his head depressed and hung down. He knew why that chapter had been chosen, and to him it recalled the family's disgrace. When the reading was ended, he still hung down his head in gloomy silence. But her face was brighter than it had been before for the day. Her eyes looked dreamy, as if she saw a vision, and by and by she pulled the Bible towards her, and putting her finger underneath each word, began to read them aloud in a low voice to herself. She read again the words of bitter sorrow and deep humiliation, but most of all she paused and brightened over the father's tender reception of the repentant prodigal. So passed the Christmas evening in the up-close farm. The snow had fallen heavily over the dark waving moorland before the day of the funeral. The black storm-laden dome of heaven lay very still and close upon the white earth as they carried the body forth out of the house which had known his presence so long as its ruling power. Two and two the mourners followed, making a black procession in their winding march over the unbeaten snow to Milnrow Church, now lost in some hollow of the bleak moors, now slowly climbing the heaving ascents. There was no long tarrying after the funeral, for many of the neighbours who accompanied the body to the grave had far to go, and the great white flakes which came slowly down were the boding forerunners of a heavy storm. One old friend alone accompanied the widow and her sons to their home. The up-close farm had belonged for generations to the Lees, and yet its possession hardly raised them above the rank of labourers. There was the house and outbuildings, all of an old-fashioned kind, and about seven acres of barren, unproductive land which they had never possessed capital enough to improve. Indeed, they could hardly rely upon it for subsistence, and it had been customary to bring up the sons to some trade, such as a wheelwright's or blacksmith's. James Lee had left a will in the possession of the old man who accompanied them home. He read it aloud. James had bequeathed the farm to his faithful wife, Anne Lee, for her lifetime, and afterwards to his son, William. The hundred and odd pounds in the savings bank was to accumulate for Thomas. After the reading was ended, Anne Lee sat silent for a time, and then she asked to speak to Samuel Orme alone. The sons went into the back kitchen, and then strolled out into the fields, regardless of the driving snow. The brothers were dearly fond of each other, although they were very different in character. Will, the elder, was like his father, stern, reserved, and scrupulously upright. Tom, who was ten years younger, was gentle and delicate as a girl, both in appearance and character. He had always clung to his mother and dreaded his father. They did not speak as they walked, for they were only in the habit of talking about facts, and hardly knew the more sophisticated language applied to the description of feelings. Meanwhile their mother had taken hold of Samuel Orme's arm with her trembling hand. Samuel, I must let the farm, I must. Let the farm? What's come o'er the woman? Oh, Samuel, said she, her eyes swimming in tears. I'm just fain to go and live in Manchester. I mun let the farm. Samuel looked and pondered, but did not speak for some time. At last he said, if thou hast made up thy mind, there's no speaking again it, and thou must e'en go. Thou wilt be sadly potted wi' Manchester ways, for that's not my lookout. Why, thou'lt have to buy potatoes, a thing thou hast never done afore in all thy born life. Well, it's not my lookout. It's rather for me than again me. Our Jenny is going to be married to Tom Higginbottom, and he was speaking of wanting a bit of land to begin upon. His father will be dying some time, I reckon, and then he'll step into the croft farm. 
but meanwhile then thou let the farm said she still as eagerly as ever ay ay he'll take it fast enough i've a notion but i'll not drive a bargain with thee just now it would not be right we'll wait a bit no i cannot wait settle it out at once well well i'll speak to will about it i see him out yonder i'll step to him and talk it over accordingly he went and joined the two lads and without more ado began the subject to them will thy mother is fain to go live in manchester and covets to let the farm now i'm willing to take it for tommy gimbottom but i like to drive a keen bargain and there would be no fun chaffering with thy mother just now let thee and me buckle to me lad and try and cheat each other it will warm us this cold day let the farm said both the lads at once with infinite surprise go live in manchester when samuel orme found that the plan had never before been named to either will or tom he would have nothing to do with it he said until they had spoken to their mother likely she was dazed by her husband's death he would wait a day or two and not name it to any one not to tom higginbottom himself and maybe he would set his heart upon it the lads had better go in and talk it over with their mother he bade them good day and left them will looked very gloomy but he did not speak till they got near the house then he said tom go to the shippen and supper the cows i want to speak to mother alone when he entered the house place she was sitting before the fire looking into its embers she did not hear him come in for some time she had lost her quick perception of outward things mother what's this about going to manchester asked he oh lad said she turning round and speaking in a beseeching tone i must go and seek our lizzie i cannot rest here for thinking on her many's the time i've left thy father sleeping in bed and stole to th window and looked and looked my heart out towards manchester till i thought i must just set out and tramp over moor and moss straight away till i got there and then lift up every downcast face till i came to our lizzie and often when the south wind was blowing soft among the hollows i fancied it could but be fancy thou knowest i heard a crying upon me and i thought the voice came closer and closer till at last it was sobbing out mother close to the door and i've stolen down and undone the latch before now and looked out into the still black night thinking to see her and turned sick and sorrowful when i heard no living sound but the sough of the wind dying away oh speak not to me of stopping here when she may be perishing for hunger like the poor lad in the parable and now she lifted up her voice and wept aloud will was deeply grieved he had been old enough to be told the family shame when more than two years before his father had had his letter to his daughter returned by her mistress in manchester telling him that lizzie had left her service some time and why he had sympathised with his father's stern anger though he had thought him something hard it is true when he had forbidden his weeping heart-broken wife to go and try to find her poor sinning child and declared that henceforth they would have no daughter that she should be as one dead and her name never more be named at market or at meal-time in blessing or in prayer he had held his peace with compressed lips and contracted brow when the neighbours had noticed to him how poor lizzie's death had aged both his father and his mother and how they thought the bereaved couple would never hold up their heads again he himself had felt as if that one event had made him old before his time and had envied tom the tears he had shed over poor pretty innocent dead lizzie he thought about her sometimes till he ground his teeth together and could have struck her down in her shame his mother had never named her to him until now mother said he at last she may be dead most likely she is no will she is not dead said mrs lee god will not let her die till i have seen her once again thou dost not know how i prayed and prayed just once again to see her sweet face and tell her i've forgiven her though she's broken my heart she has will she could not go on for a minute or two for the choking sobs thou dost not know that 
or thou wouldst not say she could be dead for god is very merciful will he is he is much more pitiful than man i could never have spoken to thy father as i did to him and yet thy father forgave her at last the last words he said were that he forgave her thou'lt not be harder than thy father will do not try and hinder me going to seek her for it's no use will sat very still for a long time before he spoke at last he said i'll not hinder you i think she's dead but that's no matter she's not dead said her mother with low earnestness will took no notice of the interruption we will all go to manchester for a twelvemonth and let the farm to tom higginbottom i'll get blacksmith's work and tom can have good schooling for a while which he's always craving for at the end of the year you'll come back mother and give over fretting for lizzie and think with me that she is dead and to my mind that would be more comfort than to think of her living he dropped his voice as he spoke these last words she shook her head but made no answer he asked again will your mother agree to this i'll agree to it to this uns said she if i hear and see naught of her for a twelvemonth me being in manchester looking out i'll just have broken my heart fairly before the year's ended and then i shall know neither love nor sorrow for her any more when i'm at rest in the grave i'll agree to that will well i suppose it must be so i shall not tell tom mother why we flit into manchester best spare him as thou wilt said she sadly so that we go that's all before the wild daffodils were up in flower in the sheltered copses round up close farm the lees were settled in their manchester home if they could ever grow to consider that place as a home where there was no garden or outbuilding no fresh breezy outlet no far stretching view over moor and hollow no dumb animals to be tended and what more than all they missed no old haunting memories even though those remembrances told of sorrow and the dead and gone mrs lee heeded the loss of all these things less than her sons she had more spirit in her countenance than she had had for months because now she had hope of a sad enough kind to be sure but still it was hope she performed all her household duties strange and complicated as they were and bewildered as she was with all the town necessities of her new manner of life but when her house was sided and the boys came home from their work in the evening she would put on her things and steal out unnoticed as she thought but not without many a heavy sigh from will after she had closed the house door and departed it was often past midnight before she came back pale and weary with almost a guilty look upon her face but that face so full of disappointment and hope deferred that will had never the heart to say what he thought of the folly and hopelessness of the search night after night it was renewed till days grew to weeks and weeks to months all this time will did his duty towards her as well as he could without having sympathy with her he stayed at home in the evenings for tom's sake and often wished he had tom's pleasure in reading for the time hung heavy on his hands as he sat up for his mother i need not tell you how the mother spent the weary hours and yet i will tell you something she used to wander out at first as if without a purpose till she rallied her thoughts and brought all her energies to bear on the one point then she went with earnest patience along the least known ways to some new part of the town looking wistfully with dumb entreaty into people's faces sometimes catching a glimpse of a figure which had a kind of momentary likeness to her child's and following that figure with never wearying perseverance till some light from shop or lamp showed the cold strange face which was not her daughter's once or twice a kind-hearted passer-by struck by her look of yearning woe turned back and offered help or asked her what she wanted when so spoken to she answered only you don't know a poor girl they call lizzie lee do you and when they denied all knowledge she shook her head and went on again i think they believed her to be crazy but she never spoke first to any one she sometimes took a few minutes rest on the doorsteps and sometimes very seldom covered her face and cried but she could not afford to lose time and chances in this way 
while her eyes were blinded with tears, the lost one might pass by unseen. One evening in the rich time of shortening autumn days, Will saw an old man, who without being absolutely drunk, could not guide himself rightly along the footpath, and was mocked for his unsteadiness of gait by the idle boys of the neighbourhood. For his father's sake, Will regarded old age with tenderness, even when most degraded and removed from the stern virtues which dignified that father. So he took the old man home, and seemed to believe his often repeated assertions that he drank nothing but water. The stranger tried to stiffen himself up into steadiness as he drew near a home, as if there was someone there for whose respect he cared even in his half-intoxicated state, or whose feelings he feared to grieve. His home was exquisitely clean and neat, even in outside appearance. Threshold window and window sill were outward signs of some spirit of purity within. Will was rewarded for his attention by a bright glance of thanks, succeeded by a blush of shame from a young woman of twenty or thereabouts. She did not speak or second her father's hospitable invitations to him to be seated. She seemed unwilling that a stranger should witness her father's attempts at stately sobriety, and Will could not bear to stay and see her distress. But when the old man, with many a flabby shake of the hand, kept asking him to come again some other evening and see them, Will sought her downcast eyes, and though he could not read their veiled meaning, he answered timidly, If it's agreeable to everybody, I'll come and thank ye. But there was no answer from the girl to whom this speech was in reality addressed, and Will left the house liking her all the better for never speaking. He thought about her a great deal for the next day or two. He scolded himself for being so foolish as to think of her, and then fell to with fresh vigour, and thought of her more than ever. He tried to depreciate her. He told himself she was not pretty, and then made indignant answer that he liked her looks much better than any beauty of them all. He wished he was not so country-looking, so red-faced, so broad-shouldered, while she was like a lady, with her smooth, colourless complexion, her bright dark hair and her spotless dress. Pretty or not pretty, she drew his footsteps towards her. He could not resist the impulse that made him wish to see her once more and find out some fault which should unloose his heart from her unconscious keeping. But there she was, pure and maidenly as before. He sat and looked, answering her father at cross purposes, while she drew more and more into the shadow of the chimney corner out of sight. Then the spirit that possessed him, it was not he himself, sure, that did so impudent a thing, made him get up and carry the candle to a different place, under the pretence of giving her more light at her sewing, but in reality to be able to see her better. She could not stand this much longer, but jumped up and said she must put her little niece to bed. And surely there never was, before or since, so troublesome a child of two years old. For though Will stayed an hour and a half longer, she never came down again. He won the father's heart, though, by his capacity as a listener. For some people are not at all particular, and so that they themselves may talk on undisturbed, are not so unreasonable as to expect attention to what they say. Will did gather this much, however, from the old man's talk. He had once been quite in a genteel line of business, but had failed for more money than any greengrocer he had heard of, at least any who did not mix up fish and game with greengrocery proper. This grand failure seemed to have been the event of his life, and one on which he dwelt with a strange kind of pride. It appeared as if, at present, he rested from his past exertions, in the bankrupt line, and depended on his daughter, who kept a small school for very young children. But all these particulars Will only remembered and understood when he had left the house, and at the time he heard them, he was thinking of Susan. After he had made good his footing at Mr. Palmer's, he was not long, you may be sure, without finding some reason for returning again and again. He listened to her father, he talked to the little niece, but he looked at Susan, both while he listened and while he talked. Her father kept on insisting upon his former gentility, the details of which would have appeared very questionable to Will's mind, if the sweet, delicate, modest Susan 
had not thrown an inexplicable air of refinement over all she came near. She never spoke much, she was generally diligently at work, but when she moved it was so noiselessly, and when she did speak it was in so low and soft a voice, that silence, speech, motion and stillness alike seemed to remove her high above Will's reach into some saintly and inaccessible air of glory, high above his reach even as she knew him, and if she were made acquainted with the dark secret behind of his sister's shame, which was kept ever present to his mind by his mother's nightly search among the outcast and forsaken, would not Susan shrink away from him with loathing, as if he were tainted by the involuntary relationship? This was his dread, and thereupon followed a resolution that he would withdraw from her sweet company before it was too late. So he resisted internal temptation, and stayed at home, and suffered and sighed. He became angry with his mother for her untiring patience in seeking for one who, he could not help hoping, was dead rather than alive. He spoke sharply to her, and received only such sad, deprecatory answers as made him reproach himself, and still more lose sight of peace of mind. This struggle could not last long without affecting his health, and Tom, his sole companion through the long evenings, noticed his increasing languor his restless irritability, with perplexed anxiety, and at last resolved to call his mother's attention to his brother's haggard, careworn looks. She listened with a startled recollection of Will's claims upon her love. She noticed his decreasing appetite and half-checked sighs. "'Well, lad, what's come o'er thee?' said she to him, as he sat listlessly gazing into the fire. "'There's naught the matter with me,' said he as if annoyed at her remark. Nay, lad, but there is. He did not speak again to contradict her. Indeed, she did not know if he had heard her, so unmoved did he look. Would like to go back to Upclose Farm? asked she sorrowfully. It's just Blackbrain time, said Tom. Will shook his head. She looked at him a while, as if trying to read that expression of despondency and trace it back to its source. Will and Tom could go, said she. I must stay here till I've found her the nost, continued she, dropping her voice. He turned quickly round, and with the authority that he at all times exercised over Tom, bade him be gone to bed. When Tom had left the room, he prepared to speak. End of part one Part two of Lizzie Lee by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Household Words, a weekly journal. Number two, Saturday, April the sixth, eighteen fifty. Chapter two. Mother, then said Will, why will you keep on thinking she's alive? If she were but dead, we need never name her name again. We've never heard naught on her since father wrote her that letter. We never knew whether she'd got it or not. She'd left her place before then. Many a one dies is. Oh, my lad, don't speak so to me, and my heart will break outright, said his mother with a sort of cry. Then she calmed herself, for she yearned to persuade him to her own belief. Thou never asked, and thou art too like thy father for me to tell without asking. But it were all to be near Lizzie's old place that I settled down on this side of Manchester, and the very day at after we came, I went to her old missus and asked to speak a word wi' her. I had a strong mind to cast it up to her that she should have sent my poor lass away without telling on it to us first, but she were in black and looked so sad I couldn't have find it in my heart to threep it up. But I did ask her a bit about our Lizzie. The master would have her turned away at a day's warning. He is gone to t'other place. I hope he'll meet with more mercy there than he showed our Lizzie. I do. And when the missus asked her, should she write to us? She says, Lizzie shook her head. And when she speared at her again, the poor lass went down on her knees and begged her not. For she said it would break my heart, as it has done will. God knows it has, said the poor mother choking with her struggle to keep down her hard overmastering grief. 
and her father would curse her. Oh, God, teach me to be patient. She could not speak for a few minutes. And the lass threatened, and said she'd go drown herself in the canal if Mrs. wrote home, and so, well, I got a trace of me child. The missus thought she'd gone to the workhouse to be nursed, and there I went, and there, sure enough, she had been, and they turned her out as soon as she was strong, and told her she were young enough to work, but what an kind of work would be open to her lad, and a baby to keep. Will listened to his mother's tale with deep sympathy, not unmixed with the old bitter shame. But the opening of her heart had unlocked his, and after a while he spoke. Mother, I think I'd even better go home. Tom can stay with thee. I know I should stay too, but I cannot stay in peace so near, her, without craving to see her. Susan Palmer, I mean. Has the old Mr Palmer thou telled me on a daughter? asked Mrs Lee. Ah, he has, and I love her above a bit, and it's because I love her I want to leave Manchester. That's all. Mrs. Lee tried to understand this speech for some time, but found it difficult of interpretation. Why shouldst thou not tell her thou lovest her? Thou art a likely lad, and sure a work. Thou'lt have up close at my death, and as for that, I could let thee have it now, and keep myself by doing a bit of charring. It seems to me a very backward sort of way of winning her to think of leaving Manchester. Oh, mother, she's so gentle and so good, she's downright holy. She's never known a touch of sin. Can I ask her to marry me, knowing what we do about Lizzie, and fearing worse? I doubt if one like her could ever care for me. But if she knew about my sister, it would put a gulf between us, and she'd shudder up at the thought of crossing it. You don't know how good she is, mother. Well, if she's so good as thou sayest, she'll have pity on such as my Lizzie. If she has no pity for such, she's a cruel Pharisee, and thou art best without her. But he only shook his head and sighed, and for the time the conversation dropped. But a new idea sprang up in Mrs. Lee's head. She thought that she would go and see Susan Palmer, and speak up for Will, and tell her the truth about Lizzie, and according to her pity for the poor sinner, would she be worthy or unworthy of him? She resolved to go the very next afternoon, but without telling anyone of her plan. Accordingly, she looked out the Sunday clothes she had never before had the heart to unpack since she came to Manchester, but which she now desired to appear in, in order to do credit to Will. She put on her old-fashioned black mode bonnet, trimmed with real lace, her scarlet cloth cloak, which she had had ever since she was married, and always spotlessly clean, she set forth on her unauthorised embassy. She knew the Palmers lived in Crown Street, though where she had heard it she could not tell, and modestly asking her way, she arrived in the street about a quarter to four o'clock. She stopped to inquire the exact number, and the woman whom she addressed told her that Susan Palmer's school would not be loose till four and asked her to step in and wait until then at her house. For, said she, smiling, them that want Susan Palmer wants a kind friend of ours, so we, in a manner, call cousins. Sit down, missus, sit down. I'll wipe the chair so that it shanna dirty your cloak. My mother used to wear them bright cloaks, and they're right gradely things again a green field. And ye known Susan Palmer long? asked Mrs. Lee, pleased with the admiration of her cloak. Ever since they come to live in our street, our Sally goes to her school. What an sort of a lass is she, for I never seen her. Well, as for Luke's, I cannot say. It's so long since I first knowed her that I've clean forgotten what I thought of her then. My master says he never saw such a smile for gladdening the heart, but maybe it's not Luke's you're asking about. The best thing I can say of her Luke's is that she's just one a stranger would stop in the street to ask help from if he needed it. All the little childer creeps as close as they can to her. She'll have as many as three or four hanging to her apron all at once. Is she cocket at all? Cocket? Bless you! You never saw a creature less set up in all your life. Her father's cocket enough. No, she's not cocket anyway. You've not heard much of Susan Palmer, I reckon, if you think she's cocket. She's just one to come quietly in and do the very thing most wanted. 
little things maybe that any one could do but the few would think on for another she'll bring a thimble wi her and mend up after the childer o nights and she writes all betty harker's letters to her grandchild out at service and she's in nobody's way and that's a great matter i take it here's the childer running past school is loosed you'll find her now missis ready to hear and to help but we're none on us frabber by going nearer in school time poor mrs lee's heart began to beat and she could almost have turned round and gone home again her country breeding had made her shy of strangers and this susan palmer appeared to her like a real born lady by all accounts so she knocked with a timid feeling at the indicated door and when it was opened dropped a simple curtsy without speaking susan had her little niece in her arms curled up with fond endearment against her breast but she put her gently down to the ground and instantly placed a chair in the best corner of the room for mrs lee when she told her who she was it's not will that has asked me to come said the mother apologetically had a wish just to speak to you myself susan coloured up to her temples and stooped to pick up the little toddling girl in a minute or two mrs lee began again will thinks you wouldna respect us if you knew all but i think you couldna help feeling for us in the sorrow god has put upon us so i just put on my bonnet and came off unknowns to the lads every one says you're very good and that the lord has keeped you from falling from his ways but maybe you've never yet been tried and tempted as some is and perhaps speaking too plain but my heart's welly broken and i can't be choice in me words as them who are happy can well now i'll tell you the truth will dread you to hear it but i'll just tell it you you mun know but here the poor woman's words failed her as she could do nothing but sit rocking herself backwards and forwards with sad eyes straight gazing into susan's face as if they tried to tell the tale of agony which the quivering lips refused to utter those wretched stony eyes forced the tears down susan's cheeks and as if this sympathy gave the mother strength she went on in a low voice i had a daughter once my heart's darling her father thought i made too much on her and that she'd grow mad staying at home so he said she mun go among strangers and learn to rough it she were young and liked the thought of seeing a bit of the world and her father heard on a place in manchester well i'll not weary you that poor girl were led astray and the first thing we heard on it was when a letter of her father's was sent back by a missus saying she'd left a place or to speak right the master had turned her into the street soon as he had heard of her condition and she not seventeen she now cried aloud and susan wept too the little child looked up into their faces and catching their sorrow began to whimper and wail susan took it softly up and hiding her face in its little neck tried to restrain her tears and think of comfort for the mother at last she said where is she now lass i dunnot know said mrs lee checking her sobs to communicate this addition to her distress mrs lomax telled me she went mrs lomax what mrs lomax her as lives in brabazon street she telled me my poor wench went to the workhouse for there i'll not speak again the dead but if her father would but a letter me but he were one who had no notion no i'll not say that best say nought he forgave her on his deathbed i dare say i didna go the right way to work will you hold the child for me one instant said susan ay if it will come to me childy used to be fond on me till i got the sad look on my face that scares them i think but the little girl clung to susan so she carried it upstairs with her mrs lee sat by herself how long she did not know susan came down with a bundle of far-worn baby clothes you must listen to me a bit and not think too much about what i'm going to tell you nanny is not my niece nor any kin to me that i know of i used to go out working by the day one day as i came home i thought some woman was following me i turned to look the woman before i could see her face for she turned it to one side 
offered me something. I held out my arms by instinct. She dropped a bundle into them with a bursting sob that went straight to my heart. It was a baby. I looked round again, but the woman was gone. She had run away as quick as lightning. There was a little packet of clothes, very few, and as if they were made out of its mother's gowns, for they were large patterns to buy for a baby. I was always fond of babies, and I had not my wits about me, father says, for it was very cold, and when I'd seen as well as I could, for it was past ten, that there was no one in the street. I brought it in and warmed it. Father was very angry when he came, and said he'd take it to the workhouse the next morning, and flighted me sadly about it. But when morning came, I could not bear to part with it. It had slept in my arms all night, and I've heard what workhouse bringing up is. So I told father I'd give up going out working and stay at home, and keep school if I might only keep the baby and after a while he said if I earned enough for him to have his comforts he'd let me. But he's never taken to her. Now, don't tremble so. I've put a little more to tell, and maybe I'm wrong in telling it. But I used to work next door to Mrs Lomax's in Brabazon Street, and the servants were all thick together, and I heard about Bessie, they called her, being sent away. I don't know that I ever saw her, but the time would be about fitting to this child's age and I've sometimes fancied it was hers. And now, will you look at the little clothes that came with her? Bless her. But Mrs. Lee had fainted. The strange joy and shame and gushing love for the little child had overpowered her. It was some time before Susan could bring her round. There she was, all trembling, sick in patience to look at the little frocks. Among them was a slip of paper which Susan had forgotten to name, that had been pinned to the bundle. On it was scrawled in a round, stiff hand. Call her Anne. She does not cry much, and takes a deal of notice. God bless you, and forgive me. The writing was no clue at all. The name Anne, common though it was, seemed something to build upon. But Mrs. Lee recognised one of the frocks instantly, as being made out of part of a gown that she and her daughter had bought together in Rochdale. She stood up, and stretched out her hands in the attitude of blessing over Susan's bent head. God bless you, and show you his mercy in your need, as you have shown it to this little child. She took the little creature in her arms, and smoothed away her sad looks to a smile, and kissed it fondly, saying over and over again, Nanny, Nanny, my little Nanny. At last the child was soothed, and looked in her face, and smiled back again. "'It has her eyes,' said she to Susan. "'I never saw her to the best of my knowledge. "'I think it must be hers by the frock, but where can she be?' "'God knows,' said Mrs. Lee. "'I dare not think she's dead. I'm sure she isn't.' "'No, she's not dead. "'Every now and then a little packet is thrust in under our door, "'with maybe two half-crowns in it. "'Once it was a half-sovereign.' Altogether, I've got seven and thirty shillings wrapped up for Nanny. I never touch it, but I've often thought the poor mother feels near to God when she brings this money. Father wanted to set the policeman to watch, but I said no, for I was afraid if she was watched, she might not come, and it seemed such a holy thing to be cheeking her in. I could not find it in my heart to do it. Oh, if we could just, if we could but find her. I'd take her in my arms, and we'd just lie down and die together. Nay, don't speak so, said Susan gently. For all that's come and gone, she may turn right at last. Mary Magdalene did, you know. Eh, but I were nearer right about thee than Will. He thought you would never look on him again if you knew about Lizzie, but thou'rt not a Pharisee. I'm sorry he thought I could be so hard said Susan in a low voice, and colouring up. Then Mrs. Lee was alarmed, and in her motherly anxiety she began to fear lest she had injured Will in Susan's estimation. You see, Will thinks so much of you. Gold would not be good enough for you to walk on in his eye. He said you'd never look at him as he was, let alone his being brother to my poor wench. He loves you so. It makes him think meanly on everything belonging to himself as not fit to come near ye. 
but he's a good lad and a good son. Thou'lt be a happy woman if thou'lt have him, so don't let my words go against him, don't. But Susan hung her head and made no answer. She had not known until now that Will thought so earnestly and seriously about her, and even now she felt afraid that Mrs. Lee's words promised her too much happiness, and that they could not be true. At any rate, the instinct of modesty made her shrink from saying anything which might seem like a confession of her own feelings to a third person. Accordingly, she turned the conversation on the child. "'I'm sure he could not help loving Nanny,' said she. "'There never was such a good little darling. Don't you think she'd win his heart if he knew that she was his niece, and perhaps bring him to think kindly on his sister?' "'I don't know,' said Mrs. Lee, shaking her head. "'He has a turn in his eye like his father that makes me. "'He's right down good, though. "'But you see, I've never been a good one at managing folk. "'Once he be a look turns me sick. "'And then I say just the wrong thing. "'I'm so fluttered. "'Now I should like nothing better than to take Nancy home with me. "'But Tom knows nothing but that his sister is dead, "'and I've not the knack of speaking rightly to Will. "'I dare not do it, and that's the truth.' But you mun not think badly of Will. He's so good hissel that he can't understand how anyone can do wrong. And above all, I'm sure he loves you dearly. I don't think I could part with Nancy, said Susan, anxious to stop this revelation of Will's attachment to herself. He'll come round to her soon. He can't fail. And I'll keep a sharp lookout after the poor mother and try to catch her the next time she comes with her little parcels of money. Ay, lass, we mun get hold of her, my Lizzie. I love thee dearly for thy kindness to her child, but if thou canst catch her for me, I'll pray for thee when I'm too near my death to speak words, and while I live, I'll serve thee next to her. She mun come first, thou knowst. God bless thee, lass. My heart is lighter by a deal than it was when I comed in. Them lads will be looking for me home, and I mun go and leave this little sweet one kissing it. If I can take courage, I'll tell Will all that has come and gone between us two. He may come and see thee, mayn't he? Father will be very glad to see him, I'm sure, replied Susan. The way in which this was spoken satisfied Mrs. Lee's anxious heart that she had done Will no harm by what she had said, and with many a kiss to the little one, and one more fervent tearful blessing on Susan, she went homewards. End of part two. Part three of Lizzie Lee by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Household Words, a weekly journal. Number three, Saturday, April the 13th, 1850. Chapter three. That night, Mrs. Lee stopped at home the only night for many months. Even Tom the scholar looked up from his books in amazement, but then he remembered that Will had not been well, and that his mother's attention having been called to the circumstance, it was only natural that she should stay to watch him, and no watching could be more tender or more complete. Her loving eyes seemed never averted from his face, his grave, sad, careworn face. When Tom went to bed, the mother left her seat, and going up to Will where he sat, looking at the fire, but not seeing it, she kissed his forehead, and said, Will, lad, have been to see Susan Palmer. She felt the start under her hand, which was placed on his shoulder, but he was silent for a minute or two. Then he said, What took you there, mother? Why, my lad, it was likely I should wish to see one you cared for. I did not put myself forward. I put on my Sunday clothes and tried to behave as you'd have liked me. At least I remember trying at first, but after I forgot all. She rather wished that he would question her as to what made her forget all. But he only said, How was she looking, mother? Well, thou seest I never set eyes on her before, but she's a good, gentle-looking creature, and I love her dearly, as I've reason to. Will looked up with momentary surprise, for his mother was too shy to be usually taken with strangers. 
but after all it was natural in this case for who could look at susan without loving her so still he did not ask any questions and his poor mother had to take courage and try again to introduce the subject near to her heart but how well said she jerking it out in sudden despair of her own powers to lead to what she wanted to say i tell her all mother you've ruined me said he standing up and standing opposite to her with a stern white look of affright on his face no my own dear lad dunnot look so scared i've not ruined you she exclaimed placing her two hands on his shoulders and looking fondly into his face she's not one to harden her heart against her mother's sorrow my own lad she's too good for that she's not one to judge and scorn the sinner she's too deep read in a new testament for that take courage will and thou mayst for i watched her well though it is not for one woman to let out another's secret sit thee down lad for thou look'st very white he sat down his mother drew a stool towards him and sat at his feet did you tell her about lizzie then asked he hoarse and low i did i telled her all and she fell a crying over my deep sorrow and the poor wench's sin and then a light comed into her face trembling and quivering with some new glad thought and what dost thou think it was will lad nay i'll not misdoubt but that thy heart will give thanks as mine did afore god and his angels for a great goodness that little nanny is not her niece she's our lizzie's own child my little grandchild she could no longer restrain her tears and they fell hot and fast but still she looked into his face did she know it was lizzie's child i do not comprehend said he flushing red she knows now she did not at first but took the little helpless creature in out of her own pitiful loving heart guessing only that it was the child of shame and she's worked for it and kept it and tended it ever sin it were a mere baby and loves it fondly will won't you love it asked she beseechingly he was silent for an instant then he said mother i'll try give me time for all these things startle me to think of susan having to do with such a child i will and to think as may be yet of susan having to do with the child's mother for she is tender and pitiful and speaks hopefully of my lost one and will try and find her for me when she comes as she does sometimes to thrust money under the door for a baby think of that will here's susan good and pure as the angels in heaven yet like them full of hope and mercy and one who like them will rejoice over her as repents will my lad i'm not afeard of you now and i must speak and you must listen i am your mother and i dare to command you because i know i am in the right and that god is on my side if he should lead the poor wandering lassie to susan's door and she comes back crying and sorrowful led by that good angel to us once more thou shalt never say a casting up word to her about her sin but be tender and helpful towards one who was lost and is found so may god's blessing rest on thee and so mayst thou lead susan home as thy wife she stood no longer as the meek imploring gentle mother but firm and dignified as if the interpreter of god's will her manner was so unusual and solemn that it overcame all will's pride and stubbornness he rose softly while she was speaking and bent his head as if in reverence at her words and the solemn injunction which they conveyed when she had spoken he said in so subdued a voice that she was almost surprised at the sound mother i will i may be dead and gone but all the same thou wilt take home the wandering sinner and heal up her sorrows and lead her to her father's house my lad i can speak no more i'm turned very faint he placed her in a chair he ran for water she opened her eyes and smiled god bless you will oh i'm so happy it seems as if she were found my heart is so filled with gladness 
That night Mr. Palmer stayed out late and long. Susan was afraid that he was at his old haunts and habits, getting tipsy at some public house, and this thought oppressed her, even though she had had so much to make her happy, in the consciousness that Will loved her. She sat up long, and then she went to bed, leaving all arranged as well she could for her father's return. She looked at the little rosy sleeping girl, who was her bedfellow, with redoubled tenderness, and with many a prayerful thought. The little arms entwined her neck as she lay down, for Nanny was a light sleeper, and was conscious that she, who was loved with all the power of that sweet childish heart, was near her, and by her, although she was too sleepy to utter any of her half-formed words. And by and by she heard her father come home, stumbling, uncertain, trying first the windows and next the door fastenings, with many a loud incoherent murmur. The little innocent twined round her seemed all the sweeter and more lovely when she thought sadly of her erring father. And presently he called aloud for a light, she had left the matches and all arranged as usual on the dresser, but fearful of some accident from fire in his unusually intoxicated state, she now got up softly and putting on a cloak went down to his assistance. Alas, the little arms that were unclosed from her soft neck belonged to a light, easily awakened sleeper. Nanny missed her darling Susie and terrified at being left alone in the vast mysterious darkness which had no bounds and seemed infinite, she slipped out of bed and tottered in her little nightgown towards the door. There was a light below, and there was Susie and safety, so she went onwards two steps towards the steep, abrupt stairs, and then, dazzled with sleepiness, she stood, she wavered, she fell, down on her head on the stone floor she fell, Susan flew to her and spoke all soft, entreating, loving words, but her white lids covered up the blue violets of eyes, and there was no murmur came out of the pale lips. The warm tears that rained down did not awaken her. She lay stiff and weary with her short life on Susan's knee. Susan went sick with terror. She carried her upstairs and laid her tenderly in bed, she dressed herself most hastily with her trembling fingers. Her father was asleep on the settle downstairs, and useless, and worse than useless if awake. But Susan flew out of the door and down the quiet resounding street towards the nearest doctor's house. Quickly she went, but as quickly a shadow followed, as if impelled by some sudden terror. Susan rung wildly at the night bell. The shadow crouched near. The doctor looked out from an upstairs window. A little child has fallen downstairs at number nine Crown Street and is very ill. Dying, I'm afraid. Please, for God's sake, sir, come directly. Number nine Crown Street. I'll be there directly, said he, and shut the window. For that God you've just spoken about, for his sake, tell me, are you Susan Palmer? Is it my child that lies a dying? said the shadow, springing forwards and clutching poor Susan's arm. It is a little child of two years old. I, I do not know whose it is. I love it as my own. Come with me, whoever you are, come with me. The two sped along the silent streets, as silent as the night were they. They entered the house. Susan snatched up the light and carried it upstairs. The other followed. She stood with wild glaring eyes by the bedside, never looking at Susan, but hungrily gazing at the little white still child. She stooped down and put her hand tight on her own heart, as if to still its beating, and bent her ear to the pale lips. Whatever the result was, she did not speak, but threw off the bedclothes wherewith Susan had tenderly covered up the little creature, and felt its left side. Then she threw up her arms with a cry of wild despair. She's dead! She's dead! She looked so fierce, so mad, so haggard, that for an instant Susan was terrified. The next, the holy God had put courage into her heart, and her pure arms were round that guilty, wretched creature, and her tears were falling fast and warm upon her breast. But she was thrown off with violence. You killed her! 
You slighted her. You let her fall down those stairs. You killed her. Susan cleared off the thick mist before her, and gazing at the mother with her clear, sweet angel eyes, said mournfully, I would have laid down my own life for her. Oh, the murder is on my soul, exclaimed the wild, bereaved mother, with the fierce impetuosity of one who has none to love her and to be beloved, regard to whom might teach self-restraint. Hush, said Susan, her finger on her lips. Here is the doctor. God may suffer her to live. The poor mother turned sharp round. The doctor mounted the stair. Ah, that mother was right. The little child was really dead and gone. And when he confirmed her judgment, the mother fell down in a fit. Susan, with her deep grief, had to forget herself and forget her darling, her charge for years, and question the doctor what she must do with the poor wretch who lay on the floor in such extreme of misery. She is the mother, said she. Why did she not take better care of her child? asked he, almost angrily. But Susan only said, The little child slept with me, and it was I that left her. I will go back and make up a composing draught, and while I am away you must get her to bed. Susan took out some of her own clothes, and there was no other bed in the house but the one in which her father slept. So she tenderly lifted the body of her darling, and was going to take it downstairs. But the mother opened her eyes, and seeing what she was about, she said, I'm not worthy to touch her. I'm so wicked. I have spoken to you as I never should have spoken. But I think you are very good. May I have my own child to lie in my arms for a little while? Her voice was so strange a contrast to what it had been before she had gone into the fit that Susan hardly recognised it. It was now so unspeakably soft, so irresistibly pleading. The features too had lost their fierce expression and were almost as placid as death. Susan could not speak, but she carried the little child and laid it in its mother's arms. Then, as she looked at them, something overpowered her, and she knelt down, crying aloud. Oh, my God, my God, have mercy on her, and forgive and comfort her. But the mother kept smiling and stroking the little face, murmuring soft, tender words as if it were alive. She was going mad, Susan thought, but she prayed on and on, and ever still she prayed with streaming eyes. The doctor came with the draught. The mother took it with docile unconsciousness of its nature as medicine. The doctor sat by her, and soon she fell asleep. Then he rose softly, and beckoning Susan to the door, he spoke to her there. You must take the corpse out of her arms. She will not awake. That draught will make her sleep for many hours. I will call before noon again. It is now daylight. Good-bye. Susan shut him out, and then, gently extricating the dead child from its mother's arms, she could not resist making her own quiet moan over her darling. She tried to learn off its little placid face, dumb and pale before her, not all the scalding tears of care shall wash away that vision fair. Not all the thousand thoughts that rise, Not all the sights that dim her eyes, She'll e'er usurp the place Of that little angel face. And then she remembered what remained to be done. She saw that all was right in the house. Her father was still dead asleep on the settle, In spite of all the noise of the night. She went out through the quiet streets, Deserted still, although it was broad daylight, and to where the Lees lived. Mrs. Lee, who kept her country hours, was opening the window shutters. Susan took her by the arm, and without speaking went into the house place. There she knelt down before the astonished Mr. Lee, and cried as she had never done before. But the miserable night had overpowered her, and she, who had gone through so much calmly, now that the pressure seemed removed, could not find the power to speak. My poor dear, what has made thy heart so sore as to come and cry a thisens? Speak and tell me. Nay, cry on, poor wench, if thou canst not speak yet. It will ease the heart, and then thou canst tell me. Nanny is dead, said Susan, 
I left her to go to father, and she fell downstairs and never breathed again. Oh, that's my sorrow, but I've more to tell. Her mother is come, is in our house. Come and see if it's your Lizzie. Mrs. Lee could not speak, but trembling put on her things and went with Susan in a dizzy haste back to Crown Street. As they entered the house in Crown Street, they perceived that the door would not open freely on its hinges, and Susan instinctively looked behind to see the cause of the obstruction. She immediately recognised the appearance of a little parcel, wrapped in a scrap of newspaper and evidently containing money. She stooped and picked it up. Look, said she sorrowfully, the mother was bringing this for her child last night. But Mrs. Lee did not answer. So near to the ascertaining if it were her lost child or no, she could not be arrested, but pressed onwards with trembling steps and a beating, fluttering heart. She entered the bedroom, dark and still. She took no heed of the little corpse, over which Susan paused, but she went straight to the bed, and withdrawing the curtain, saw Lizzie, but not the former Lizzie, bright, gay, buoyant and undimmed. This Lizzie was old before her time, her beauty was gone, deep lines of care, and alas, of want, or thus the mother imagined, were printed on the cheek, so round and fair and smooth when last she gladdened her mother's eyes. Even in her sleep she bore the look of woe and despair which was the prevalent expression of her face by day. Even in her sleep she had forgotten how to smile. But all these marks of sin and sorrow she had passed through only made her mother love her the more. She stood, looking at her with greedy eyes which seemed as though no gazing could satisfy their longing, and at last she stooped down and kissed the pale worn hand that lay outside the bedclothes. No touch disturbed the sleeper. The mother need not have laid the hand so gently down upon the counterpane. There was no sign of life, save only now and then a deep sob-like sigh. Mrs. Lee sat down beside the bed, and still holding back the curtain, looked on and on, as if she would never be satisfied. Susan would fain have stayed by her darling one, but she had many calls upon her time and thoughts, and her will had now, as ever, to be given up to that of others. All seemed to devolve the burden of their cares on her. Her father, ill-humoured from his last night's intemperance, did not scruple to reproach her with being the cause of little Nanny's death, and when, after bearing his upbraiding meekly for some time, she could no longer restrain herself, but began to cry, he wounded her even more by his injudicious attempts at comfort, for he said that it was as well the child was dead, it was none of theirs, and why should they be troubled with it? Susan wrung her hands at this, and came and stood before her father, and implored him to forbear. Then she had to take all requisite steps for the coroner's inquest, she had to arrange for the dismissal of her school, she had to summon a little neighbour, and send his willing feet on a message to William Lee, who, she felt, ought to be informed of his mother's whereabouts, and of the whole state of affairs. She asked her messenger to tell him to come and speak to her, that his mother was at her house. She was thankful that her father sauntered out to have a gossip at the nearest coach stand, and to relate as many of the night's adventures as he knew, for as yet he was in ignorance of the watcher and the watched, who silently passed away the hours upstairs. At dinner time Will came. He looked red, glad, impatient, excited. Susan stood calm and white before him, her soft loving eyes gazing straight into his. Will, said she, in a low quiet voice, your sister is upstairs. My sister, said he, as if affrighted at the idea, and losing his glad look in one of gloom. Susan saw it, and her heart sank a little, but she went on, as calm to all appearance as ever. She was little Nanny's mother, as perhaps you know. Poor little Nanny was killed last night by a fall downstairs. All the calmness was gone. All the suppressed feeling was displayed in spite of every effort. She sat down and hid her face from him, and cried bitterly. He forgot everything but the wish, 
the longing to comfort her. He put his arm around her waist and bent over her. But all he could say was, Oh, Susan, how can I comfort you? Don't take on so. Pray don't. He never changed the words, but the tone varied every time he spoke. At last she seemed to regain her power over herself, and she wiped her eyes and once more looked upon him with her own quiet, earnest, unfearing gaze. Your sister was near the house. She came in on hearing my words to the doctor. She is asleep now, and your mother is watching her. I wanted to tell you all myself. Would you like to see your mother? No, said he. I would rather see none but thee. Mother told me thou knewst all. His eyes were downcast in their shame, but the holy and pure did not lower or veil her eyes. She said, Yes, I know all, all but her sufferings. Think what they must have been. He made answer low and stern. She deserved them all, every jot. In the eye of God, perhaps she does. He is the judge, we are not. Oh, she said with a sudden burst, Will thee, I've thought so well of you. Don't go and make me think you cruel and hard. Goodness is not goodness unless there is mercy and tenderness with it. There's your mother, who's been nearly heartbroken, now full of rejoicing over her child. Think of your mother. I do think of her, said he. I remember the promise I gave her last night. Thou shouldst give me time. I would do right in time. I never think it o'er in quiet, but I will do what is right and fitting, never fear. Thou hast spoken out very plain to me, and misdoubted me, Susan. I love thee so, that thy words cut me. If I did hang back a bit for making sudden promises, it was because not even for love of thee would I say what I was not feeling. And at first I could not feel all at once as thou wouldst have me. But I'm not cruel and hard, for if I had been, I shouldn't have grieved as I have done. He made as if he were going away, and indeed he did feel he would rather think it over in quiet. But Susan grieved at her incautious words, which had all the appearance of harshness, went a step or two nearer, paused, and then, all over blushes, said, in a low, soft whisper, Oh, Will, I beg your pardon. I am very sorry. Won't you forgive me? She, who had always drawn back and been so reserved, said this in the very softest manner, with eyes now uplifted beseechingly now dropped to the ground. Her sweet confusion told more than words could do, and Will turned back, all joyous in his certainty of being beloved, and took her in his arms and kissed her. My own Susan, he said. Meanwhile the mother watched her child in the room above. It was late in the afternoon before she awoke, for the sleeping draught had been very powerful. The instant she awoke, her eyes were fixed on her mother's face, with a gaze as unflinching as if she were fascinated. Mrs. Lee did not turn away, nor move, for it seemed as if motion would unlock the stony command over herself, which, while so perfectly still, she was unable to preserve. But by and by Lizzie cried out in a piercing voice of agony, "'Mother, don't look at me! I've been so wicked!' And instantly she hid her face and grovelled among the bedclothes and lay like one dead. So motionless was she. Mrs. Lee knelt down by the bed and spoke in the most soothing tones. Lizzie, dear, don't speak so. I'm thy mother, darling. Don't be afraid of me. I never left off loving thee, Lizzie. I was always a-thinking of thee. Thy father forgave thee afore he died. There was a little start here, but no sound was heard. Lizzie, lass, I'll do aught for thee. I'll live for thee, only don't be afeard of me. Whate'er thou art or hast been, we'll ne'er speak on't. We'll leave thou times behind us, and go back to Thupclose Farm. I but left it to find thee, my lass, and God has led me to thee. Blessed be his name. And God is good too, Lizzie. Thou hast not forgot thy Bible, I'll be bound, for thou was always a scholar. I'm no reader, but I learnt off them texts to comfort me a bit, and I've said them many a time a day to myself. Lizzie, lass, 
don't hide thy head so it's thy mother as is speaking to thee thy little child clung to me only yesterday and if it's gone to be an angel it will speak to god for thee nay don't sob her that has thou shalt have it again in heaven i know thou'll strive to get there for thy little nancy's sake and listen i'll tell thee god's promises to them that are penitent only don't be afeard mrs lee folded her hands and strove to speak very clearly while she repeated every tender and merciful text she could remember she could tell from the breathing that her daughter was listening but she was so dizzy and sick herself when she had ended that she could not go on speaking it was all that she could do to keep from crying aloud at last she heard her daughter's voice where are they taken her to she asked she's downstairs so quiet and peaceful and happy she looks could she speak oh if god if i might but have heard a little voice mother i used to dream of it oh may i see her once again oh mother if i strive very hard and god is very merciful and i go to heaven i shall not know her i shall not know my own again she will shun me as a stranger and cling to susan palmer and you oh woe she shook with exceeding sorrow in her earnestness of speech she had uncovered her face and tried to read mrs lee's thoughts through her looks and when she saw those aged eyes brimming full of tears and marked the quivering lips she threw her arms round the faithful mother's neck and wept there as she had done in many a childish sorrow but with a deeper a more wretched grief her mother hushed her on her breast and lulled her as if she were a baby and she grew still and quiet they sat thus for a long long time at last susan palmer came up with some tea and bread and butter for mrs lee she watched the mother feed her sick unwilling child with every fond inducement to eat which she could devise they neither of them took notice of susan's presence that night they lay in each other's arms but susan slept on the ground beside them they took the little corpse the little unconscious sacrifice whose early calling home had reclaimed her poor wandering mother to the hills which in her lifetime she had never seen they dared not lay her by the stern grandfather in milnrow churchyard but they bore her to a lone moorland graveyard where long ago the quakers used to bury their dead they laid her there on the sunny slope where the earliest spring flowers blow will and susan live at the upclose farm mrs lee and lizzie dwell in a cottage so secluded that until you drop into the very hollow where it is placed you do not see it tom is a schoolmaster in rochdale and he and will help to support their mother i only know that if the cottage be hidden in a green hollow of the hills every sound of sorrow in the whole upland is heard there every call of suffering or of sickness for help is listened to by a sad gentle-looking woman who rarely smiles and when she does her smile is more sad than other people's tears but who comes out of her seclusion whenever there's a shadow in any household many hearts bless lizzie lee but she she prays always and ever for forgiveness such forgiveness as may enable her to see her child once more mrs lee is quiet and happy lizzie is to her eyes something precious as the lost piece of silver found once more susan is the bright one who brings sunshine to all children grow around her and call her blessed one is called nanny her lizzie often takes to the sunny graveyard in the uplands and while the little creature gathers the daisies and makes chains lizzie sits by a little grave and weeps bitterly end of lizzie lee by elizabeth gaskell read by phil benson Part One of The Well of Penmorfa by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, number 34, Saturday, November the 16th, 1850. Chapter 1 Of a hundred travellers who spend a night at Trimadoc in North Wales, there is not one, perhaps, who goes to the neighbouring village of Penmorfa. The new town, built by Mr. Maddox, Shelley's friend, has taken away all the importance of the ancient village, formerly, as its name imports, the head of the marsh. That marsh, which Mr. Maddox drained and diked, and reclaimed from the Trath Moor, till Pen Morfa, against the walls of whose cottages the winter tides lashed in former days, has come to stand high and dry, three miles from the sea, on a disused road to Carnarvon. I do not think there has been a new cottage built in Pen Morfa this hundred years, and many an old one has dates in some obscure corner which tell of the fifteenth century. The joists of timber where they meet overhead are blackened with the smoke of centuries. There is one large room round which the beds are built like cupboards, with wooden doors to open and shut, somewhat in the old Scotch fashion I imagine, and below the bed at least in one instance I can testify that this was the case, and I was told it was not uncommon, is a great wide wooden drawer, which contained the oat cake, baked for some months' consumption by the family. They call the promontory of Clin, the point at the end of Carnarvonshire, Welsh Wales. I think they might call Penmorfa a Welsh Welsh village. It is so national in its ways and buildings and inhabitants, and so different from the towns and hamlets into which the English throng in summer. How these said inhabitants of Pen Morfa ever are distinguished by their names, I, uninitiated, cannot tell. I only know for a fact that in a family there with which I am acquainted, the eldest son's name is John Jones, because his father's was John Thomas, that the second son is called David Williams, because his grandfather was William Wynne, and that the girls are called indiscriminately by the names of Thomas and Jones. I have heard some of the Welsh chuckle over the way in which they have baffled the barristers at Carnarvon Assizes, denying the name under which they have been subpoenaed to give evidence, if they were unwilling witnesses. I could tell you of a great deal which is peculiar and wild in these true Welsh people, who are what I suppose we English were a century ago, but I must hasten on to my tale. I have received great, true, beautiful kindness from one of the members of the family of whom I just now spoke as living at Pen Morfa, and when I found that they wished me to drink tea with them, I gladly did so, though my friend was the only one in the house who could speak English at all fluently. After tea, I went with them to see some of their friends, and it was then I saw the interiors of the houses of which I have spoken. It was an autumn evening, we left mellow sunset light in the open air when we entered the houses, in which all seemed dark, save in the ruddy sphere of the firelight, for the windows were very small and deep set in the thick walls. Here were an old couple, who welcomed me in Welsh, and brought forth milk and oat cake with patriarchal hospitality. Sons and daughters had married away from them. They lived alone, he was blind or nearly so, and they sat one on each side of the fire, so old and so still, till we went in and broke the silence, that they seemed to be listening for death. At another house lived a woman, stern and severe looking. She was busy hiving a swarm of bees alone and unassisted. I do not think my companion would have chosen to speak to her, but seeing her out in her hillside garden, she made some inquiry in Welsh, which was answered in the most mournful tone I ever heard in my life a voice of which the freshness and timbre had been choked up by tears long years ago. I asked who she was. I dare say the story is common enough, but the sight of the woman and her few words had impressed me. She had been the beauty of Pen Morfa, had been in service, had been taken to London by the family whom she served, had come down in a year or so, back to Pen Morfa, her beauty gone into that sad, wild, despairing look which I saw and she about to become a mother. Her father had died during her absence, and left her a very little money, and after her child was born, she took the little cottage where I saw her, and made a scanty living by the produce of her bees. 
she associated with no one. One event had made her savage and distrustful to her kind. She kept so much aloof that it was some time before it became known that her child was deformed and had lost the use of its lower limbs. Poor thing! When I saw the mother, it had been for fifteen years bedridden. But go past when you would in the night, you saw a light burning. It was often that of the watching mother, solitary and friendless, soothing the moaning child. Or you might hear her crooning some old Welsh air in hopes to still the pain with the loud monotonous music. Her sorrow was so dignified, and her mute endurance and her patient love won her such respect that the neighbours would fain have been friends. But she kept alone and solitary. This is a most true story. I hope that woman and her child are dead now, and their souls above. Another story which I heard of these old primitive dwellings I mean to tell at somewhat greater length. There are rocks high above Penmorfa. They are the same that hang over Trimadoc, but near Penmorfa they sweep away and are lost in the plain. Everywhere they are beautiful. The great sharp ledges which would otherwise look hard and cold are adorned with the brightest coloured moss and the golden lichen. Close to you see the scarlet leaves of the crane's bill and the tufts of purple heather which fill up every cleft and cranny, but in the distance you see only the general effect of infinite richness of colour broken here and there by great masses of ivy. At the foot of these rocks come a rich verdant meadow or two, and then you are at Penmorfa. The village well is sharp down under the rocks. There are one or two large sloping pieces of stone in that last field, on the road leading to the well, which are always slippery, slippery in the summer's heat, almost as much as in the frost of winter, when some little glassy stream that runs over them is turned into a thin sheet of ice. Many, many years back, a lifetime ago, there lived in Penmorfa a widow and her daughter. Very little is required in those out-of-the-way Welsh villages. The wants of the people are very simple. Shelter, fire, a little oat cake and buttermilk, and garden produce, perhaps some pork and bacon from the pig in winter, clothing which is principally of home manufacture and of the most enduring kind. These take very little money to purchase, especially in a district into which the large capitalists have not yet come to buy up two or three acres of the peasants. And nearly every man about Penmorfa owned at the time of which I speak his dwelling and some land beside. Eleanor Gwynne inherited the cottage by the roadside on the left hand as you go from Trimadoc to Penmorfa, in which she and her husband had lived all their married life, and a small garden sloping southwards in which her bees lingered before winging their way to the more distant heather. She took rank among her neighbours as the possessor of a moderate independence, not rich and not poor, but the young men of Penmorfa thought her very rich in the possession of a most lovely daughter. Most of us know how very pretty Welsh women are, but from all accounts Nest Gwyn, Nest or Nesta is the Welsh for Agnes, was more regularly beautiful than any one for miles around. The Welsh are still fond of triads, and, as beautiful as a summer's morning at sunrise, as white as a seagull on the green sea wave, and as Nest Gwyn, is yet a saying in that district. Nest knew she was beautiful and delighted in it. Her mother sometimes checked her in her happy pride, and sometimes reminded her that beauty was a great gift of God, for the Welsh are a very pious people. But when she began her little homily, Nest came dancing to her, and knelt down before her, and put her face up to be kissed. And so, with a sweet interruption, she stopped her mother's lips. Her high spirits made some few shake their heads, and some called her a flirt and a coquette, for she could not help trying to please all, both old and young, both men and women. A very little from Nest sufficed for this, a sweet glittering smile, a word of kindness, a merry glance, or a little sympathy, all these pleased and attracted. She was like the fairy gifted child, and dropped inestimable gifts. But some who had interpreted her smiles and kind words, rather as their wishes led them than as they were really warranted, found that the beautiful beaming nest could be decided and saucy enough, and so they revenged themselves by calling her a flirt. 
her mother heard it and sighed but nest only laughed it was her work to fetch water for the day's use from the well i told you about old people say it was the prettiest sight in the world to see her come stepping lightly and gingerly over the stones with the pail of water balanced on her head she was too adroit to need to steady it with her hand they say now that they can afford to be charitable and speak the truth that in all her changes to other people there never was a better daughter to a widowed mother than nest there is a picturesque old farmhouse under moel gwyn on the road from tremadoc to Cricaith, called by some welsh name which i now forget but its meaning in english is the end of time a strange boding ominous name perhaps the builder meant his work to endure to the end of time i do not know but there the old house stands and will stand for many a year when nest was young it belonged to one edward williams his mother was dead and people said he was on the lookout for a wife they told nest so but she tossed her head and reddened and said she thought he might look long before he got one so it was not strange that one morning when she went to the well one autumn morning when the dew lay heavy on the grass and the thrushes were busy among the mountain ash berries edward williams happened to be there on his way to the coursing match near and somehow his greyhounds threw her pail of water over in their romping play and she was very long in filling it in again and when she came home she threw her arms round her mother's neck and in a passion of joyous tears told her that edward williams of the end of time had asked her to marry him and that she had said yes eleanor gwynne shed her tears too but they fell quietly when she was alone she was thankful nest had found a protector one suitable in age and apparent character and above her in fortune but she knew she should miss her sweet daughter in a thousand household ways miss her in the evenings by the fireside miss her when at night she wakened up with a start from a dream of her youth and saw her fair face lying calm in the moonlight pillowed by her side then she forgot her dream and blessed her child and slept again but who could be so selfish as to be sad when nest was so supremely happy she danced and sang more than ever and then sat silent and smiled to herself if spoken to she started and came back to the present with a scarlet blush which told what she had been thinking of that was a sunny happy enchanted autumn but the winter was nigh at hand and with it came sorrow one fine frosty morning nest went out with her lover she to the well he to some farming business which was to be transacted at the little inn of penmorfa he was late for his appointment so he left her at the entrance of the village and hastened to the inn and she in her best cloak and new hat put on against her mother's advice but they were a recent purchase and very becoming went through the dull moor radiant with love and happiness one who lived until lately met her going down towards the well that morning and said he turned round to look after her she looked unusually lovely he wondered at the time at her wearing her sunday clothes for the pretty hooded blue cloth cloak is kept among the welsh women as a church and market garment and not commonly used even on the coldest days of winter for such household errands as fetching water from the well however as he said it was not possible to look her in the face and fault anything she wore down the sloping stones the girl went blithely with her pail she filled it at the well and then she took off her hat tied the strings together and slung it over her arm she lifted the heavy pail and balanced it on her head but alas in going up the smooth slippery treacherous rock the encumbrance of her cloak it might be such a trifle as her slung hat something at any rate took away the evenness of poise the freshet had frozen on the slanting stone and was one coat of ice poor nest fell and put out her hip no more flushing rosy colour on that sweet face no more look of beaming innocent happiness instead there was deadly pallor and filmy eyes over which dark shades seemed to chase each other as the shoots of agony grew more and more intense she screamed once or twice but the exertion involuntary and forced out of her by excessive pain overcame her and she fainted 
a child coming an hour or so afterwards on the same errand saw her lying there ice glued to the stone and thought she was dead it flew crying back nest gwyn is dead nest gwyn is dead and crazy with fear it did not stop until it had hid its head in its mother's lap the village was alarmed and all who were able went in haste towards the well poor nest had often thought she was dying in that dreary hour had taken fainting for death and struggled against it and prayed that god would keep her alive till she could see her lover's face once more and when she did see it white with terror bending over her she gave a feeble smile and let herself faint away into unconsciousness many a month she lay on her bed unable to move sometimes she was delirious sometimes worn out into the deepest depression through all her mother watched her with tenderest care the neighbours would come and offer help they would bring presents of country dainties and i do not suppose that there was a better dinner than ordinary cooked in any household in penmorfa parish but a portion of it was sent to eleanor gwynne if not for her sick daughter to try and tempt her herself to eat and be strengthened for to no one would she delegate the duty of watching over her child edward williams was for a long time most assiduous in his enquiries and attentions but by and by ah you see the dark fate of poor nest now he slackened so little at first that eleanor blamed herself for her jealousy on her daughter's behalf and chid her suspicious heart but as spring ripened into summer and nest was still bedridden edward's coolness was visible to more than the poor mother the neighbours would have spoken to her about it but she shrunk from the subject as if they were probing a wound at any rate thought she nest shall be strong before she is told about it i will tell lies i shall be forgiven but i must save my child and when she is stronger perhaps i may be able to comfort her oh i wish she would not speak to him so tenderly and trustfully when she is delirious i could curse him when she does and then nest would call for her mother and eleanor would go and invent some strange story about the summonses edward had had to carnarvon assizes or to harley cattle market but at last she was driven to her wit's end it was three weeks since he had even stopped at the door to inquire and eleanor mad with anxiety about her child who was silently pining off to death for want of tidings of her lover put on her cloak when she had lulled her daughter to sleep one fine june evening and set off to the end of time the great plain which stretches out like an amphitheatre in the half circle of hills formed by the ranges of mulguin and the tremadoc rocks was all golden green in the mellow light of sunset to eleanor it might have been black with winter frost she never noticed outward thing till she reached the end of time and there in the little farmyard she was brought to a sense of her present hour and errand by seeing edward he was examining some hay newly stacked the air was scented by its fragrance and by the lingering sweetness of the breath of the cows when edward turned round at the footstep and saw eleanor he coloured and looked confused however he came forward to meet her in a cordial manner enough it's a fine evening said he how is nest but indeed your being here is a sign she is better won't you come in and sit down he spoke hurriedly as if affecting a welcome which he did not feel thank you i'll just take this milking stool and sit down here the open air is like balm after being shut up so long it is a long time he replied more than five months mrs gwynne was trembling at heart she felt an anger which she did not wish to show for if by any manifestations of temper or resentment she lessened or broke the waning thread of attachment which bound him to her daughter she felt she should never forgive herself she kept inwardly saying patience patience he may be true and love her yet but her indignant convictions gave her words the lie it's a long time edward williams since you've been near us to ask after nest said she she may be better or she may be worse for aught you know she looked up at him reproachfully but spoke in a gentle quiet tone ay you see the hay has been a long piece of work the weather has been fractious and a master's eye is needed 
Besides, said he, as if he had found the reason for which he sought to account for his absence, I have heard of her from Roland Jones. I was at the surgery for some horse medicine. He told me about her. And a shade came over his face as he remembered what the doctor had said. Did he think that shade would escape the mother's eye? You saw Roland Jones? Oh, man alive! Tell me what he said of my girl. He'll say nothing to me, but just hems and haws the more I pray him. But you will tell me. You must tell me. She stood up and spoke in a tone of command, which his feeling of independence, weakened just then by an accusing conscience, did not enable him to resist. He strove to evade the question, however. It was an unlucky day that ever she went to the well. Tell me what the doctor said of my child, repeated Mrs. Gwynne. Will she live or will she die? He did not dare to disobey the imperious tone in which this question was put. Oh, she will live, don't be afraid. The doctor said she would live. He did not mean to lay any peculiar emphasis on the word live, but somehow he did, and she, whose every nerve vibrated with anxiety, caught the word. She will live, repeated she, but there is something behind. Tell me, for I will know. If you won't say, I'll go to Roland Jones tonight and make him tell me what he has said to you. There had passed something in this conversation between himself and the doctor, which Edward did not wish to have known, and Mrs. Gwynne's threat had the desired effect, but he looked vexed and irritated. You have such impatient ways with you, Mrs. Gwynne, he remonstrated. I am a mother asking news of my sick child, said she. Go on, what did he say? She'll live, as if giving the clue. She'll live, he has no doubt of that, but he thinks... Now don't clench your hands so. I can't tell you if you look in that way. You are enough to frighten a man. I am not speaking, she said in a low husky tone. Never mind my looks. She'll live. But she'll be a cripple for life. There, you would have it out, said he sulkily. A cripple for life, repeated she slowly, and I'm one and twenty years older than she is. She sighed heavily. "'And as we're about it, I'll just tell you what is in my mind,' said he, hurried and confused. "'I've a deal of cattle, and the farm makes heavy work as much as an able, healthy woman can do. So you see—' He stopped, wishing her to understand his meaning without words. But she would not. She fixed her dark eyes on him, as if reading his soul, till he flinched under her gaze. "'Well,' said she, at length, "'say on. Remember, I've a deal of work in me yet, and what strength is mine is my daughter's. You're very good, but altogether you must be aware, Nest will never be the same as she was. And you've not yet sworn in the face of God to take her for better or worse, and as she is worse. She looked in his face, caught her breath, and went on. As she is worse, why, you cast her off, not being church tied to her. Though her body may be crippled, a poor heart is the same, alas, and full of love for you. Edward, you don't mean to break it off because of our sorrows. You're only trying me, I know, said she, as if begging him to assure her that her fears were false. But you see, I'm a foolish woman, a poor foolish woman, and ready to take fright at a few words. She smiled up in his face, but it was a forced doubting smile and his face still retained its sullen, dogged aspect. "'Nay, Mrs. Gwynne,' said he, "'you spoke truth at first. Your own good sense told you Nest would never be fit to be any man's wife, unless, indeed, she could catch Mr. Griffiths of Tinwin Tiribilch. He might keep her a carriage, maybe.' Edward really did not mean to be unfeeling, but he was obtuse and wished to carry off his embarrassment by a kind of friendly joke which he had no idea would sting the poor mother as it did. He was startled at her manner. Put it in words like a man. Whatever you mean by my child, say it for yourself, and don't speak as if my good sense had told me anything. I stand here, doubting my own thoughts, cursing my own fears. Don't be a coward. I ask you whether you and Nest are troth plight. I am not a coward. Since you ask me, I answer. Nest and I were troth plight, but we are not. I cannot. No one would expect me to wed a cripple. 
it's your own doing i've told you now i had made up my mind but i should have waited a bit before telling you very well said she and she turned to go away but her wrath burst the floodgates and swept away discretion and forethought she moved and stood in the gateway her lips parted but no sound came with an hysterical motion she threw her arms suddenly up to heaven as if bringing down lightning towards the grey old house to which she pointed as they fell and then she spoke the widow's child is unfriended as surely as the saviour brought the son of a widow from death to life for her tears and cries so surely will god and his angels watch over my nest and avenge her cruel wrongs she turned away weeping and wringing her hands edward went indoors he had no more desire to reckon his stores he sat by the fire looking gloomily at the red ashes he might have been there half an hour or more when someone knocked at the door he would not speak he wanted no one's company another knock sharp and loud he did not speak then the visitor opened the door and to his surprise almost to his affright eleanor gwynne came in i knew you were here i knew you could not go out into the clear holy night as if nothing had happened oh did i curse you if i did i beg you to forgive me and i will try to ask the almighty to bless you if you will but have a little mercy a very little it will kill my nest if she knows the truth now she is so very weak why she cannot feed herself she is so low and feeble you would not wish to kill her i think edward she looked at him as if expecting an answer but he did not speak she went down on her knees on the flags by him you will give me a little time edward to get her strong won't you now i ask it on my bended knees perhaps if i promise never to curse you again you will come sometimes to see her till she is well enough to know how all is over and her heart's hopes crushed only say you'll come for a month or so as if you still loved her the poor cripple forlorn of the world i'll get her strong and not tax you long her tears fell too fast for her to go on get up mrs gwynne edward said don't kneel to me i have no objection to come and see nest now and then so that all is clear between you and me poor thing i am sorry as it happens she's so taken up with the thought of me it was likely was it not and you to have been her husband before this time if oh miserable me to let my child go and dim her bright life but you'll forgive me and come sometimes just for a little quarter of an hour once or twice a week perhaps she'll be asleep sometimes when you call and you know you need not come in if she were not so ill i'd never ask you so low and humble was the poor widow brought through her exceeding love for her daughter End of part one part two of the well of pen morpha by elizabeth gaskell this librivox recording is in the public domain from household words a weekly journal number thirty five saturday november the twenty third eighteen fifty chapter two nest revived during the warm summer weather edward came to see her and stayed the allotted quarter of an hour but he dared not look her in the face she was indeed a cripple one leg was much shorter than the other and she halted on a crutch her face formerly so brilliant in colour was wan and pale with suffering the bright roses were gone never to return her large eyes were sunk deep down into their hollow cavernous sockets but the light was in them still when edward came her mother dreaded her returning strength dreaded yet desired it for the heavy burden of her secret was most oppressive at times and she thought edward was beginning to weary of his enforced attentions one october evening she told her the truth she even compelled her rebellious heart to take the cold reasoning side of the question and she told her child that her disabled frame was a disqualification for ever becoming a farmer's wife she spoke hardly 
because her inner agony and sympathy was such, she dared not trust herself to express the feelings that were rending her. But Ness turned away from cold reason. She revolted from her mother. She revolted from the world. She bound her sorrow tight up in her breast to corrode and fester there. Night after night her mother heard her cries and moans, more pitiful by far than those wrung from her by bodily pain a year before. And night after night, if her mother spoke to soothe, she proudly denied the existence of any pain but what was physical and consequent upon her accident. If she would but open her sore heart to me, to me, her mother, Eleanor wailed forth in prayer to God, I would be content. Once it was enough to have my nest all my own. Then came love, and I knew it would never be as before. And then I thought the grief I felt when Edward spoke to me was as sharp a sorrow as could be. But this present grief, O oh Lord, my God, is worst of all. And thou only, thou canst help. When Nest grew as strong as she was ever likely to be on earth, she was anxious to have as much labour as she could bear. She would not allow her mother to spare her anything. Hard work, bodily fatigue, she seemed to crave. She was glad when she was stunned by exhaustion into a dull insensibility of feeling. She was almost fierce when her mother, in those first months of convalescence, performed the household tasks which had formerly been hers, but she shrank from going out of doors. Her mother thought that she was unwilling to expose her changed appearance to the neighbours' remarks, but Nest was not afraid of that. She was afraid of their pity as being one deserted and cast off. If Eleanor gave way before her daughter's imperiousness and sat by while Nest tore about her work with the vehemence of a bitter heart, Eleanor could have cried, but she durst not. Tears or any mark of commiseration irritated the crippled girl so much she even drew away from caresses. Everything was to go on as it had been before she had known Edward, and so it did, outwardly, but they trod carefully, as if the ground on which they moved was hollow, deceptive. There was no more careless ease, every word was guarded, and every action planned. It was a dreary life to both. Once Eleanor brought in a little baby, a neighbour's child, to try and tempt Nest out of herself by her old love of children. Nest's pale face flushed as she saw the innocent child in her mother's arms, and for a moment she made as if she would have taken it. But then she turned away and hid her face behind her apron and murmured, I shall never have a child to lie in my breast and call me mother. In a minute she arose with compressed and tightened lips and went about her household work without her noticing the cooing baby again, till Mrs. Gwynne, heartsick at the failure of her little plan, took it back to its parents. One day the news ran through Penmorpha that Edward Williams was about to be married. Eleanor had long expected this intelligence. It came upon her like no new thing, but it was the filling up of her cup of woe. She could not tell Nest. She sat listlessly in the house and dreaded that each neighbour who came in would speak about the village news. At last someone did. Nest looked around from her employment and talked of the event with a kind of cheerful curiosity as to the particulars, which made her informants go away and tell others that Nest had quite left off caring for Edward Williams. But when the door was shut and Eleanor and she were left alone, Nest came and stood before her weeping mother like a stern accuser. Mother, why did you not let me die? Why did you keep me alive for this? Eleanor could not speak, but she put her arms out towards her girl. Nest turned away, and Eleanor cried aloud in her soreness of spirit. Nest came again. Mother, I was wrong. You did your best. I don't know how it is. I am so hard and cold. I wish I had died when I was a girl and had a feeling heart. Don't speak so, my child. God has afflicted you sore, and your hardness of heart is but for a time. Wait a little. Don't reproach yourself, my poor nest. I understand your ways. I don't mind them, love. The feeling heart will come back to you in time. Anyways, 
don't think you're grieving me because love that may sting you when i'm gone and i'm not grieved my darling most times we're very cheerful i think after this mother and child were drawn more together but eleanor had received her death from these sorrowful hurrying events she did not conceal the truth from herself nor did she pray to live as some months ago she had done for her child's sake she had found out that she had no power to console the poor wounded heart it seemed to her as if her prayers had been of no avail and then she blamed herself for this thought there are many methodist preachers in this part of wales there was a certain old man named david hughes who was held in peculiar reverence because he had known the great john wesley he had been captain of a carnarvon slate vessel he had traded in the mediterranean and had seen strange sights in those early days to use his own expression he had lived without god in the world but he went to mock john wesley and was converted by the white-haired patriarch and remained to pray afterwards he became one of the earnest self-denying much abused band of itinerant preachers who went forth under wesley's direction to spread abroad a more earnest and practical spirit of religion his rambles and travels were of use to him they extended his knowledge of the circumstances in which men are sometimes placed and enlarged his sympathy with the tried and tempted his sympathy combined with the thoughtful experience of fourscore years made him cognizant of many of the strange secrets of humanity and when younger preachers upbraided the hard hearts they met with and despaired of the sinners he suffered long and was kind when eleanor gwynne lay low on her deathbed david hughes came to penmorfa he knew her history and sought her out to him she imparted the feelings i have described i have lost my faith david the tempter has come and i have yielded i doubt if my prayers have been heard day and night have i prayed that i might comfort my child in her great sorrow but god has not heard me she has turned away from me and refused my poor love i wish to die now but i have lost my faith and have no more pleasure in the thought of going to god what must i do david she hung upon his answer and it was long in coming i am weary of earth said she mournfully and can i find rest in death even leaving my child desolate and broken-hearted eleanor said david where you go all things will be made clear and you will learn to thank god for the end of what now seems grievous and heavy to be borne do you think your agony has been greater than the awful agony in the garden or your prayers more earnest than that which he prayed in that hour when the great drops of blood ran down his face like sweat we know that god heard him although no answer came to him through the dread silence of that night god's times are not our times i have lived eighty and one years and never yet have i known an earnest prayer fall to the ground unheeded in an unknown way and when no one looked for it maybe the answer came a fuller more satisfying answer than heart could conceive of although it might be different to what was expected sister you are going where in his light you will see light you will learn there that in very faithfulness he has afflicted you go on you strengthen me said she after david hughes left that day eleanor was calm as one already dead and past mortal strife nest was awed by the change no more passionate weeping no more sorrow in the voice though it was low and weak it sounded with a sweet composure her last look was a smile her last word a blessing nest tearless streaked the poor warm body she laid a plate with salt upon it on the breast and lighted candles for the head and feet it was an old welsh custom but when david hughes came in the sight carried him back to the time when he had seen the chapels in some old catholic cathedral nest sat gazing on the dead with dry hot eyes she is dead said david solemnly she died in christ let us bless god my child he giveth and he taketh away she's dead said nest my mother is dead no one loves me now 
She spoke as if she were thinking aloud, for she did not look at David or ask him to be seated. No one loves you now. No human creature, you mean. You are not yet fit to be spoken to concerning God's infinite love. I, like you, will speak of love for human creatures. I tell you, if no one loves you, it is time for you to begin to love. He spoke almost severely, if David Hughes ever did, for, to tell the truth, he was repelled by her hard rejection of her mother's tenderness, about which the neighbours had told him. Begin to love, said she, her eyes flashing. Have I not loved? Old man, you are dim and worn out. You do not remember what love is. She spoke with a scornful kind of pitying endurance. I will tell you how I have loved by telling you the change it has wrought in me. I was once the beautiful Nest Gwyn. I am now a cripple, a poor, one-faced cripple, old before my time. That is a change, at least people think so. She paused and then spoke lower. I tell you, David Hughes, that outward change is as nothing compared to the change in my nature caused by the love I have felt and have had rejected. I was gentle once, and if you spoke a tender word, my heart came towards you as natural as a little child goes to its mammy. I never spoke roughly, even to the dumb creatures, for I had a kind feeling for all. Of late, since I loved old man, I have been cruel in my thoughts to every one. I have turned away from tenderness with bitter indifference. Listen, she spoke in a hoarse whisper, I will own it. I have spoken hardly to her, pointing towards the corpse. Her, who was ever patient and full of love for me. She did not know, she muttered. She has gone to her grave without knowing how I loved her. I had such a strange, mad, stubborn pride in me. Come back, mother, come back, said she, crying wildly to the still solemn corpse. Come back as a spirit or a ghost. Only come back that I may tell you how I have loved you. But the dead never come back. The passionate adjuration ended in tears, the first she has shed. When they ceased or were absorbed into long quivering sobs, David knelt down. Ness did not kneel, but bowed her head. He prayed while his own tears fell fast. He rose up. They were both calm. Nest, said he, your love has been the love of youth, passionate, wild, natural to youth. Henceforward you must love like Christ, without thought of self or wish for return. You must take the sick and the weary to your heart and love them. That love will lift you up above the storms of the world into God's own peace. The very vehemence of your nature proves that you are capable of this. I do not pity you. You do not require pity. You are powerful enough to trample down your own sorrows into a blessing for others. And to others you will be a blessing. I see it before you. I see in it the answer to your mother's prayer. The old man's dim eyes glittered as if they saw a vision. The firelight sprang up and glinted on his long white hair. Nest was awed as if she saw a prophet, and a prophet he was to her. When next David Hughes came to Penmorfa, he asked about Nest Gwynne, with a hovering doubt as to the answer. The inn-folk told him she was living still in the cottage, which was now her own. "'But would you believe it, David?' said Mrs. Thomas. "'She has gone and taken Mary Williams to live with her. "'You remember Mary Williams, I'm sure.' "'No, David Hughes remembered no Mary Williams at Penmorfa. "'You must have seen her.' "'but I know you've called at Thomas Griffiths, where the parish boarded her. "'You don't mean the half-witted woman, the poor crazy creature.' "'But I do,' said Mrs. Thomas. "'I have seen her sure enough, but I never thought of learning her name, "'and Nest Gwynne has taken her to live with her. "'Yes, I thought I should surprise you. "'She might have had many a decent girl for companion. "'My own niece, her that is an orphan,' would have gone and been thankful. Besides, Mary Williams is a regular savage at times. John Griffith says there were days when he used to beat her till she howled again, and yet she would not do as he told her. Nay, once, he says, 
if he had not seen her eyes glare like a wild beast from under the shadow of the table where she had taken shelter and got pretty quickly out of her way she would have flown upon him and throttled him he gave nest fair warning of what she must expect and he thinks some day she will be found murdered david hughes thought a while how came nest to take her to live with her asked he well folk say john griffiths did not give her enough to eat half which they tell me take more to feed them than others and eleanor gwynne had given her oat cake and porridge a time or two and most likely spoken kindly to her you know eleanor spoke kind to all so some months ago when john griffiths had been beating her and keeping her without food to try and tame her she ran away and came to nest cottage in the dead of night all shivering and starved for she did not know eleanor was dead and thought to meet with kindness from her i've no doubt and nest remembered how her mother used to feed and comfort the poor idiot and made her some gruel and wrapped her up by the fire and in the morning when john griffiths came in search of mary he found her with nest and mary wailed so piteously at the sight of him that nest went to the parish officers and offered to take her to board with her for the same money they gave to him john says he was right glad to be off his bargain david hughes knew that there was a kind of remorse which sought relief in the performance of the most difficult and repugnant tasks he thought he could understand how in her bitter repentance for her conduct towards her mother nest had taken in the first helpless creature that came seeking shelter in her name it was not what he would have chosen but he knew it was god that had sent the poor wandering idiot there he went to see Nest the next morning. As he drew near the cottage, it was summer time and the doors and windows were all open, he heard an angry, passionate kind of sound that was scarcely human. That sound prevented his approach from being heard, and standing at the threshold, he saw poor Mary Williams pacing backwards and forwards in some wild mood. Nest, cripple as she was, was walking with her, speaking low, soothing words, till the pace was slackened and time and breathing was given to put her arm around the crazy woman's neck and soothe her by this tender caress into the quiet luxury of tears tears which gave the hot brain relief then david hughes came in his first words as he took off his hat standing on the lintel were the peace of god be upon this house neither he nor nest recurred to the past those solemn recollections filled their minds before he went all three knelt and prayed for as nest told him some mysterious influence of peace came over the poor half-wit's mind when she heard the holy words of prayer and often when she felt a paroxysm coming on she would kneel and repeat a homily rapidly over as if it were a charm to scare away the demon in possession sometimes indeed the control over herself requisite for this effort was enough to dispel the fluttering burst when david rose up to go he drew nest to the door you are not afraid my child asked he no she replied she is often very good and quiet when she is not i can bear it i shall see your face on earth no more said he god bless you he went on his way not many weeks after David Hughes was born to his grave. The doors of Ness's heart were opened, opened wide by the love she grew to feel for crazy Mary, so helpless, so friendless, so dependent upon her. Mary loved her back again, as a dumb animal loves its blind master. It was happiness enough to be near her. In general, she was only too glad to do what she was bidden by Nest, but there were times when Mary was overpowered by the glooms and fancies of her poor disordered brain. Fearful times! No one knew how fearful. On those days, Nest warned the little children who loved to come and play around her that they must not visit the house. The signal was a piece of white linen hung out of a side window. On those days, the sorrowful and sick waited in vain for the sound of Nest's lame approach but what she had to endure was known only to God, for she never complained. If she had given up the charge of Mary, or if the neighbours had risen out of love and care for her life to compel such a step, 
she knew what hard curses and blows, what starvation and misery would await the poor creature. She told of Mary's docility and her affection and her innocent little sayings, but she never told the details of the occasional days of wild disorder and driving insanity. Nest grew old before her time in consequence of her accident. She knew that she was as old at fifty as many are at seventy. She knew it partly by the vividness with which the remembrance of the days of her youth came back to her mind, while the events of yesterday were dim and forgotten. She dreamt of her girlhood and youth. In sleep she was once more the beautiful Nest Gwynne, the admired of all beholders, the light-hearted girl beloved by her mother. Little circumstances connected with those early days, forgotten since the very time when they occurred, came back to her mind in her waking hours. She had a scar on the palm of her left hand, occasioned by the fall of a branch of a tree when she was a child. It had not pained her since the first two days after the accident, but now it began to hurt her slightly, and clear in her ears was the crackling sound of the treacherous rending wood. Distinct before her rose the presence of her mother, tenderly binding up the wound. With these remembrances came a longing desire to see the beautiful fatal well once more before her death. She had never gone so far since the day when, by her fall there, she lost love and hope and her bright glad youth. She yearned to look upon its waters once again. This desire waxed as her life waxed. She told it to poor crazy Mary. Mary, said she, I want to go to the rock well. If you will help me, I can manage it. There used to be many a stone in the dull moor on which I could sit and rest. We will go tomorrow morning before folks are astir. Mary answered briskly, Up, up, to the rock well. Mary will go, Mary will go. All day long she kept muttering to herself, Mary will go. Nest had the happiest dream that night. Her mother stood beside her, not in the flesh, but in the bright glory of a blessed spirit, and Nest was no longer young, neither was she old. They reckoned not by days nor years where she was gone to dwell, and her mother stretched out her arms to her with a calm, glad look of welcome. She awoke. The woodlark was singing in the near copse. The little birds were astir and rustling in their leafy nests. Nest arose and called Mary, the two set out through the quiet lane. They went along slowly and silently. With many a pause they crossed the broad dull moor and carefully descended the sloping stones on which no trace remained of the hundreds of feet that had passed over them since Nest was last there. The clear water sparkled and quivered in the early sunlight. The shadows of the birch leaves were stirred on the ground. The ferns, Nest could have believed that they were the very same ferns which he had seen thirty years before, hung wet and dripping where the water overflowed. A thrush chanted matins from a holly bush near, and the running stream made a low, soft, sweet accompaniment. All was the same. Nature was as fresh and young as ever. It might have been yesterday that Edward Williams had overtaken her and told her his love. The thought of his words, his handsome looks, he was a grey, hard-featured man by this time. And then she recalled the fatal wintry morning when joy and youth had fled, and as she remembered that faintness of pain, a new, a real faintness, no echo of the memory, came over her. She leant her back against a rock, without a moan or sigh, and died. She found immortality by the wellside, instead of her fragile perishing youth. She was so calm and placid that Mary, who had been dipping her fingers in the well to see the waters drop off in the gleaming sunlight, thought she was asleep, and for some time continued her amusement in silence. At last she turned and said, Mary is tired. Mary wants to go home. Ness did not speak, though the idiot repeated her plaintive words. She stood and looked till a strange terror came over her, a terror too mysterious to be born. Mistress, wake! Mistress, wake! 
she said, wildly shaking the form. But Nest did not awake, and the first person who came to the well that morning found Crazy Mary sitting, awestruck, by the poor dead Nest. They had to get the poor creature away by force before they could remove the body. Mary is in Tremadoc workhouse. They treat her pretty kindly, and in general she is good and tractable. Occasionally the old paroxysms come on, and for a time she is unmanageable. But someone thought of speaking to her about Nest. She stood arrested at the name, and since then it is astonishing to see what effort she makes to curb her insanity, and when the dread time is past, she creeps up to the matron and says, Mary has tried to be good. Will God let her go to nest now? End of the Well of Penmorpha by Elizabeth Gaskell Read by Phil Benson The Heart of John Middleton by Elizabeth Gaskell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal. Number 40, Saturday, December the 28th, 1850. The Heart of John Middleton I was born at Sawley, where the shadow of Pendle Hill falls at sunrise. I suppose Sawley sprang up into a village in the time of the monks who had an abbey there. Many of the cottages are strange old places. Others, again, are built of the abbey stones, mixed up with the shale from the neighbouring quarries, and you may see many a quaint bit of carving worked into the walls or forming the lintels of the doors. There is a row of houses, built still more recently, where one Mr. Peel came to live there, for the sake of the water power, and gave the place of Philip into something like life, though a different kind of life, as I take it, from the grand slow ways folks had when the monks were about. Now it was six o'clock, ring the bell, throng to the factory, sharp home at twelve, and even at night when work was done, we hardly knew how to walk slowly. We had been so bustled all day long. I can't recollect the time when I did not go to the factory. My father used to drag me there when I was quite a little fellow, in order to wind reels for him. I never remember my mother. I should have been a better man than I have been, if I had only a notion of the sound of her voice or the look on her face. My father and I lodged in the house of a man who also worked in the factory. We were sadly thronged in Sawley. So many people came from different parts of the country to earn a livelihood at the new work, and it was some time before the row of cottages I have spoken of could be built. While they were building, my father was turned out of his lodgings for drinking and being disorderly, and he and I slept in the brick kiln, that is to say, when we did sleep o' nights. But often and often we went poaching, and many a hare and pheasant have I rolled up in clay and roasted in the embers of the kiln. Then, as followed to reason, I was drowsy next day over my work, but father had no mercy on me for sleeping, for all he knew the cause of it, but kicked me where I lay, a heavy lump on the factory floor, and cursed and swore at me till I got up for very fear and to my winding again. But when his back was turned, I paid him off with heavier curses than he had given me, and longed to be a man that I might be revenged on him. The words I then spoke would not now dare to repeat, and worse than hating words, a hating heart went with them. I forget the time when I did not know how to hate. When I first came to read and learnt about Ishmael, I thought I must be of his doomed race, for my hand was against every man, and every man's against me. But I was seventeen or more before I cared for my book enough to learn to read. After the row of works was finished, father took one and set up for himself in letting lodgings. I can't say much for the furnishing, but there was plenty of straw and we kept up good fires and there is a set of people who value warmth above everything. The worst lot about the place lodged with us. We used to have a supper in the middle of the night. There was game enough, or if there was not game, there was poultry to be had for the stealing. 
By day we all made a show of working in the factory. By night we feasted and drank. Now this web of my life was black enough and coarse enough, but by and by a little golden filmy thread began to be woven in. The dawn of God's mercy was at hand. One blowy October morning, as I sauntered lazily along to the mill, I came to the little wooden bridge over a brook that falls into the bribble. On the plank there stood a child balancing the pitcher on her head, with which she had been to fetch water. She was so light on her feet that had it not been for the weight of the pitcher, I almost believe the wind would have taken her up and wafted her away as it carries off a blow-ball in seed-time. Her blue cotton dress was blown before her, as if she were spreading her wings for a flight. She turned her face round, as if to ask me for something, but when she saw who it was, she hesitated, for I had a bad name in the village, and I doubt not she had been warned against me. But her heart was too innocent to be distrustful, so she said to me timidly, Please, John Middleton, will you carry me this heavy jug just over the bridge? It was the very first time I had ever been spoken to gently. I was ordered here and there by my father and his rough companions. I was abused and cursed by them if I failed in doing what they wished. If I succeeded, there came no expression of thanks or gratitude. I was informed of facts necessary for me to know, but the gentle words of request or entreaty were aforetime unknown to me and now their tones fell on my ear, soft and sweet as a distant peal of bells. I wished that I knew how to speak properly in reply, but though we were of the same standing as regarded worldly circumstances, there was some mighty difference between us, which made me unable to speak in her language of soft words and modest entreaty. There was nothing for me but to take up the picture in a kind of gruff, shy silence, and carry it over the bridge as she had asked me. When I gave it back again, she thanked me and tripped away, leaving me, wordless, gazing after her, like an awkward lout as I was. I knew well enough who she was. She was grandchild to Eleanor Hadfield, an aged woman who was reputed as a witch by my father and his set, for no other reason that I can make out than her scorn, dignity and fearlessness of rancour. It was true we often met her in the grey dawn of the morning when we returned from poaching, and my father used to curse her under his breath for a witch, such as were burnt long ago on Pendle Hill Top. But I had heard that Eleanor was a skilful, sick nurse, and ever ready to give her services to those who were ill, and I believe that she had been sitting up through the night, the night that we had been spending under wild heavens in deeds as wild, with those who were appointed to die. Nelly was her orphan granddaughter, her little handmaiden, her treasure, her one new lamb. Many and many a day have I watched by the brookside, hoping that some happy gust of wind, coming with opportune bluster down the hollow of the dale, might make me necessary once more to her. I longed to hear her speak to me again. I said the words that she had used to myself, trying to catch her tone, but the chance never came again. I do not know that she ever knew how I watched for her there. I found out that she went to school, and nothing would serve me but that I must go too. My father scoffed at me. I did not care. I knew naught of what reading was, nor that it was likely that I should be laughed at. I, a great hulking lad of seventeen or upwards, for going to learn my ABC in the midst of a crowd of little ones. I stood just this way in my mind. Nelly was at school. It was the best place for seeing her and hearing her voice again. Therefore I would go too. My father talked and swore and threatened, but I stood to it. He said I should leave school, weary of it in a month. I swore a deeper oath than I like to remember that I would stay a year and come out a reader and a writer. My father hated the notion of folks learning to read and said it took all the spirit out of them. Besides, he thought he had a right to every penny of my wages, and though, when he was in good humour, he might have given me many a jug of ale, he grudged my tuppence a week for schooling. However, to school I went. It was a different place to what I had thought it before I went inside. 
The girls sat on one side and the boys on the other, so I was not near Nelly. She too was in the first class. I was put with the little toddling things that could hardly run alone. The master sat in the middle and kept pretty strict watch over us, but I could see Nelly and hear her read a chapter, and even when it was one with a long list of hard names, such as the master was very fond of giving her to show how well she could hit them off without spelling, I thought I had never heard a prettier music. Now and then she read other things. I did not know what they were, true or false, but I listened because she read, and by and by I began to wonder. I remember the first word I ever spoke to her was to ask her, as we were coming out of school, who was the father of whom she had been reading. But when she said the words, our father, her voice dropped into a soft, holy kind of low sound, which struck me more than any loud reading, it seemed so loving and tender. When I asked her this, she looked at me with her great blue wondering eyes, at first shocked, and then, as it were, melted down into pity and sorrow. She said in the same way, below her breath, in which she read the words, Our Father. Don't you know? It's God. God? Yes, the God that Grandmother tells me about. Tell me what she says, will you? So we sat down on the hedge bank, she a little above me, while I looked up into her face, and she told me all the holy texts her grandmother had taught her, as explaining all that could be explained of the Almighty. I listened in silence, for indeed I was overwhelmed with astonishment. Her knowledge was principally rote knowledge. She was too young for much more. But we in Lancashire speak a rough kind of Bible language, and the text seemed very clear to me. I rose up, dazed and overpowered. I was going away in silence when I bethought me of my manners and turned back and said, Thank you, for the first time I ever remember saying it in my life. That was a great day for me in more days than one. I was always one who could keep very steady to an object when once I had set it before me. My object was to know Nelly. I was conscious of nothing more but it made me regardless of all other things. The master might scold, the little ones might laugh, I bore it all without giving it a second thought. I kept to my year and came out a reader and writer, more, however, to stand well in Nelly's good opinion than because of my oath. About this time my father committed some bad cruel deed and had to fly the country. I was glad he went, for I'd never loved or cared for him and wanted to shake myself clear of his set. But it was no easy matter. Honest folk stood aloof. Only bad men held out their arms to me with a welcome. Even Nelly seemed to have a mixture of fear now with her kind ways towards me. I was the son of John Middleton, who, if he were caught, would be hung at Lancaster Castle. I thought she looked at me sometimes with a sort of sorrowful horror. Others were not forbearing enough to keep their expression of feeling confined to Luke's. The son of the overlooker at the mill never ceased twitting me with my father's crime. He now brought up his poaching against him, though I knew very well how many a good supper he himself had made on game, which had been given to him to make him and his father wink at late hours in the morning. And how were such as my father to come honestly by game? This lad, Dick Jackson, was the bane of my life. He was a year or two older than I was, and had much power over the men who worked at the mill, as he could report to his father what he chose. I could not always hold my peace when he threeped me with my father's sins, but gave it him back sometimes in a storm of passion. It did me no good, only threw me farther from the company of better men, who looked aghast and shocked at the oaths I poured out blasphemous words learnt in my childhood, which I could not forget now that I would fain have purified myself of them. While all the time Dick Jackson stood by with a mocking smile of intelligence, and when I had ended breathless and weary with spent passion, he would turn to those whose respect I longed to earn, and ask if I were not a worthy son of my father, and likely to tread in his steps. But this smiling indifference of his to my miserable vehemence, was not all, though it was the worst part of his conduct, 
for it made the rankling hatred grow up in my heart and overshadow it like the great gourd tree of the prophet Jonah. But his was a merciful shade, keeping out the burning sun. Mine blighted what it fell upon. What Dick Jackson did besides was this. His father was a skilful overlooker and a good man. Mr. Peel valued him so much that he was kept on, although his health was failing. And when he was unable, through illness, to come to the mill, he deputed his son to watch over and report the men. It was too much power for one so young. I speak it calmly now. Whatever Dick Jackson became, he had strong temptations when he was young, which will be allowed for hereafter. But at the time of which I am telling, my hate raged like a fire. I believe that he was the one sole obstacle to my being received as fit to mix with good and honest men. I was sick of crime and disorder, and would fain have come over to a different kind of life, and have been industrious, sober, honest and right-spoken. I had no idea of higher virtue then, and at every turn Dick Jackson met me with his sneers. I have walked the night through in the old abbey field, planning how I could outwit him, and win men's respect in spite of him. The first time I ever prayed was underneath the silent stars, kneeling by the old abbey walls, throwing up my arms, and asking God for the power of revenge upon him. I had heard that if I prayed earnestly, God would give me what I asked for, and I looked upon it as a kind of chance for the fulfilment of my wishes. If earnestness would have won the boon for me, Never were wicked words so earnestly spoken. And oh, later on, my prayer was heard and my wish granted. All this time I saw little of Nelly. Her grandmother was failing and she had much to do indoors. Besides, I believed I had read her looks aright when I took them to speak of aversion, and I planned to hide myself from her sight, as it were, until I could stand upright before men with fearless eyes, dreading no face of accusation. It was possible to acquire a good character. I would do it, I did it, but no one brought up among respectable, untempted people can tell the unspeakable hardness of the task. In the evenings, I would not go forth among the village throng, for the acquaintances that claimed me were my father's old associates, who would have been glad enough to enlist a strong young man like me in their projects and the men who would have shunned me and kept aloof, with a steady and orderly. So I stayed indoors and practised myself in reading. You will say I should have found it easier to earn a good character away from Sawley, at some place where neither I nor my father was known. So I should, but it would not have been the same thing to my mind. Besides representing all good men, all goodness to me, in Sawley Nelly lived. In her sight I would work out my life and fight my way upwards to men's respect. Two years passed on. Every day I strove fiercely. Every day my struggles were made fruitless by the son of the overlooker, and I seemed but where I was, but where I must ever be esteemed by all who knew me. But as the son of the criminal, wild, reckless, ripe for crime myself, where was the use of my reading and writing? These acquirements were disregarded and scouted by those among whom I was thrust back to take my portion. I could have read any chapter in the Bible now, and Nelly seemed as though she would never know it. I was driven in upon my books, and few enough of them I had. The peddlers brought them round in their packs, and I bought what I could. I had the Seven Champions and the Pilgrim's Progress, and both seemed to me equally wonderful and equally founded on fact. I got Byron's narrative and Milton's Paradise Lost, but I lacked the knowledge which would give a clue to all. They afforded me, still they afforded me pleasure, because they took me out of myself and made me forget my miserable position, and made me unconscious, for the time at least, of my one great passion of hatred against Dick Jackson. When Nelly was about seventeen, her grandmother died. I stood aloof in the churchyard behind the great yew tree and watched the funeral. It was the first religious service that ever I heard, and to my shame, as I thought, 
it affected me to tears. The words seemed so powerful and holy that I longed to go to church, but I durst not, because I had never been. The parish church was at Bolton, far enough away to serve as an excuse for all who did not care to go. I heard Nellie's sobs filling up every pause in the clergyman's voice, and every sob of hers went to my heart. She passed me on her way out of the churchyard. She was so near, I might have touched her, but her head was hanging down, and I durst not speak to her. Then the question arose, what was to become of her? She must earn her living. Was it to be as a farm servant or by working at the mill? I knew enough of both kinds of life to make me tremble for her. My wages were such as to enable me to marry, if I chose, and I never thought of woman for my wife but Nelly. Still, I would not have married her now if I could, for as yet I had not risen up to the character which I determined it was fit that Nelly's husband should have. When I was rich in good report, I would come forwards and take my chance, but until then I would hold my peace. I had faith in the power of my long-continued dogged breasting of opinion. Sooner or later, it must, it should yield, and I be received among the ranks of good men. But meanwhile, what was to become of Nelly? I reckoned up my wages. I went to inquire what the board of a girl would be, who should help her in a household work and live with her as a daughter at the house of one of the most decent women of the place. She looked at me suspiciously. I kept down my temper and told her I would never come near the place, that I would keep away from that end of the village, and that the girl for whom I made the inquiry should never know but what the parish paid for a keep. It would not do. She suspected me, but I know I had power over myself to have kept to my word, and besides I would not for worlds have had Nelly put under any obligation to me, which should speak the purity of her love, or dim it by a mixture of gratitude. The love that I craved to earn, not for my money, not for my kindness, but for myself. I heard that Nelly had met with a place in Bolland, and I could see no reason that I might not speak to her once before she left our neighbourhood. I meant it to be a quiet, friendly telling her of my sympathy in her sorrow. I felt I could command myself. So, on the Sunday before she was to leave Sawley, I waited near the wood path by which I knew that she would return from afternoon church. The birds made such a melodious warble, such a busy sound among the leaves, that I did not hear approaching footsteps till they were close at hand, and then there were sounds of two persons' voices. The wood was near that part of Sawley where Nelly was staying with friends. The path through it led to their house, and theirs only, so I knew it must be she, for I had watched her setting out to church alone. But who was the other? The blood went to my heart and head, as if I were shot when I saw that it was Dick Jackson. What is the end of it all? In the steps of sin which my father had trod, I would rush to my death and my doom. Even where I stood, I longed for a weapon to slay him. How dared he come near my Nelly? She, too, I thought her faithless and forgot how little I had ever been to her in outward action. How few words, and those how uncouth I had ever spoken to her, and I hated her for a traitress. These feelings passed through me before I could see my eyes and head were so dizzy and blind. When I looked, I saw Dick Jackson holding her hand and speaking quick and low and thick as a man speaks in great vehemence. She seemed white and dismayed, but all at once, at some word of his, and what it was she never would tell me, she looked as though she defied a fiend and wrenched herself out of his grasp. He caught hold of her again and began once more the thick whisper that I loathed. I could hear it no longer, nor did I see why I should. I stepped out from behind the tree where I had been lying. When she saw me, she lost a look of one strung up to desperation, and came and clung to me, and I felt like a giant in strength and might. I held her with one arm, but I did not take my eyes off him. I felt as if they blazed down into his soul and scorched him up. 
He never spoke, but tried to look as though he defied me. At last his eyes fell before mine. I dared not speak, for the old horrid oaths thronged up to my mouth, and I dreaded giving them way and terrifying my poor trembling Nelly. At last he made to go past me. I drew her out of the pathway. By instinct, she wrapped her garments round her as if to avoid his accidental touch, and he was stung by this, I suppose, I believe, to the mad miserable revenge he took. As my back was turned to him, in an endeavour to speak some words to Nelly that might soothe her into calmness, she, who was looking after him like one fascinated with terror, saw him take a sharp shaley stone and aim it at me. Poor darling! She clung round me as a shield, making her sweet body into a defence for mine. It hit her, and she spoke no word, kept back her cry of pain, but fell at my feet in a swoon. He, the coward, ran off as soon as he saw what he had done. I was with Nelly alone in the green gloom of the wood. The quivering and leaf-tinted light made her look as if she were dead. I carried her, not knowing if I bore a corpse or not, to her friend's house. I did not stay to explain, but ran madly for the doctor. Well, I cannot bear to recur to that time again. Five weeks I lived in the agony of suspense, from which my only relief was in laying savage plans for revenge. If I hated him before, what think ye I did now? It seemed as if earth could not hold us twain, but that one of us must go down to Gehenna. I could have killed him, and would have done it without a scruple, but that seemed too poor and bold a revenge. At length, oh, the weary waiting, oh, the sickening of my heart, Nelly grew brighter, as well she was ever to grow. The bright colour had left her cheek, the mouth quivered with repressed pain, the eyes were dim with tears that agony had forced into them, and I loved her a thousand times better and more than when she was bright and blooming. What was best of all, I began to perceive that she cared for me. I know her grandmother's friends warned her against me, and I told her I came of a bad stock, but she had passed the point where remonstrance from bystanders can take effect. She loved me as I was, a strange mixture of bad and good, all unworthy of her. We spoke together now, as those do whose lives are bound up in each other. I told her I would marry her as soon as she had recovered her health. Her friends shook their heads, but they saw she would be unfit for farm service or heavy work, and they perhaps thought, as many a one does, that a bad husband was better than none at all. Anyhow, we were married, and I learned to bless God for my happiness, so far beyond my deserts. I kept her like a lady. I was a skilful workman and earned good wages, and every want she had I tried to gratify. Her wishes were few and simple enough, poor Nelly. If they had been ever so fanciful, I should have had my reward in the new feeling of the holiness of home. She could lead me as a little child with the charm of her gentle voice and her over-kind words. She would plead for all when I was full of anger and passion. Only Dick Jackson's name passed never between our lips during all that time. In the evening she lay back in her beehive chair and read to me. I think I see her now, pale and weak, with her sweet young face, lighted by her holy, earnest eyes, telling me of the Saviour's life and death, till they were filled with tears. I longed to have been there to have avenged him on the wicked Jews. I liked Peter the best of all the disciples. But I got the Bible myself and read the mighty act of God's vengeance in the Old Testament with a kind of triumphant faith that sooner or later he would take my cause in hand and revenge me on mine enemy. In a year or so, Nelly had a baby, a little girl with eyes just like hers, that looked with a grave openness right into yours. Nelly recovered but slowly. It was just before winter, the cotton crop had failed, and Master had to turn off many hands. I thought I was sure of being kept on, 
for I had earned a steady character and did my work well. But once again, it was permitted that Dick Jackson should do me wrong. He induced his father to dismiss me among the first in my branch of the business. And there was I, just before winter set in, with a wife and newborn child, and a small enough store of money to keep body and soul together, till I could get to work again. All my savings had gone by Christmas Eve, and we sat in the house, foodless for the morrow's festival. Nelly looked pinched and worn. The baby cried for a larger supply of milk than its poor starving mother could give it. My right hand had not forgot its cunning, and I went out once more to my poaching. I knew where the gang met, and I knew what a welcome back I should have. A far warmer and more hearty welcome than good men had given me when I tried to enter their ranks. On the road to the meeting place, I fell in with an old man, one who had been a companion to my father in his early days. "'What, lad?' said he. "'At the turning back to the old trade, it's the better business now that cotton has failed.' "'Aye,' said I, "'cotton is starving as outright. A man may bear a deal himself, but he'll do aught bad and sinful to save his wife and child.' "'Nay, lad,' said he, "'poaching is not sinful. It goes against man's laws, but not against God's.' I was too weak to argue or talk much. I had not tasted food for two days. But I murmured. At any rate, I trusted to have been clear of it for the rest of my days. It led my father wrong at first. I've tried and I have striven. Now I give all up. Right or wrong shall be the same to me. Some are foredoomed, and so am I. And as I spoke, some notion of the futurity that would separate Nelly the pure and holy, from me, the reckless and desperate one, came over me with an irrepressible burst of anguish. Just then, the bells of Bolton in Bolland struck up a glad peal, which came over the woods, in the solemn midnight air, like the sons of the morning shouting for joy. They seemed so clear and jubilant. It was Christmas Day, and I felt like an outcast from the gladness and the salvation. Old Jonah spoke out. "'Yon's the Christmas bells. I say, Johnny, my lad, I've no notion of taking such a spiritless chap as thou into the thick of it, with thy rights and thy wrongs. We don't trouble ourselves with such fine lawyer's stuff, and we bring down the varmint all the better. Now, I'll not have thee in our gang, for thou art not up to the fun, and thou'd hang fire when the time came to be doing.' but have a shrewd guess that plaguy wife and child of thine are at the bottom of thy half and half joining. Now, I was thy father's friend of afore he took to them helter-skelter ways, and have five shillings and a neck of mutton at thy service. I'll not list a fasting man, but if thou'lt come to us with a full stomach and say, I like your life, my lads, and I'll make one of you with pleasure the first shiny night, why, we'll give you a welcome and a half, but to-night... Make no more ado, but turn back with me for the mutton and the money. I was not proud. Nay, I was most thankful. I took the meat and boiled some broth for my poor Nelly. She was in a sleep, or a faint, I know not which. But I roused her, and held her up in bed, and fed her with a teaspoon. And the light came back to her eyes, and the faint moonlight smiled to her lips. And when she had ended, she said her innocent grace, and fell asleep with her baby on her breast. I sat over the fire and listened to the bells as they swept past my cottage on the gusts of the wind. I longed and yearned for the second coming of Christ of which Nellie had told me. The world seemed cruel and hard and strong, too strong for me, and I prayed to cling to the hem of his garment and be borne over the rough places when I fainted and bled and found no man to pity or help me but poor old Jonah, the publican and sinner. All this time my own woes and my own self were uppermost in my mind, as they are in the minds of most who have been hardly used. As I thought of my wrongs and my sufferings, my heart burned against Dick Jackson, and as the bells rose and fell, so my hopes waxed and waned, that in those mysterious days, of which they were both the remembrance and the prophecy, he would be purged from off the earth. I took Nellie's Bible and turned, 
not to the gracious story of the Saviour's birth, but to the records of the former days when the Jews took such wild revenge upon all their opponents. I was a Jew, a leader among the people. Dick Jackson was as pharaoh as the king Agag, who walked delicately, thinking the bitterness of death was past. In short, he was the conquered enemy, over whom I gloated, with my Bible in my hand, that Bible which contained our Saviour's words on the cross. As yet those words seemed faint and meaningless to me, like a tract of country seen in the starlight haze, while the histories of the Old Testament were grand and distinct in the blood-red colour of sunset. By and by that night passed into day, and little piping voices came round, carol singing. They wakened Nelly. I went to her as soon as I heard her stirring. Nelly, said I, there's money and food in the house. I'll be off to Padium, seeking work, while thou hast something to go upon. Not to-day, said she. Stay to-day with me, if thou wouldst only go to church with me this once. For you see, I had never been inside a church but when we were married, and she was often praying me to go. And now she looked at me with a sigh, just creeping forth from her lips, as she expected a refusal. But I did not refuse. I had been kept away from church before because I dared not go, and now I was desperate and dared do anything. If I did look like a heathen in the face of all men, why, I was a heathen in my heart, for I was falling back into all my evil ways. I had resolved, if my search of work at Paddyham should fail, I would follow my father's footsteps and take with my own right hand and by my strength of arm what it was denied to me to obtain honestly. I had resolved to leave Sawley, where a curse seemed to hang over me. So what did it matter if I went to church, all unbeknowing what strange ceremonies were there performed? I walked thither as a sinful man, sinful in my heart. Nelly hung on my arm, but even she could not get me to speak. I went in. She found my places and pointed to the words and looked up into my eyes with hers, so full of faith and joy. But I saw nothing but Richard Jackson. I heard nothing but his loud nasal voice making response, and desecrating all the holy words. He was in broadcloth of the best, I in my fustian jacket. He was prosperous and glad, I was starving and desperate. Nelly grew pale as she saw the expression in my eyes and she prayed ever and ever more fervently, as the thought of me tempted by the devil, even at that very moment, came more fully before her. By and by she forgot even me, and laid her soul bare before God, in a long, silent, weeping prayer, before we left the church. Nearly all had gone, and I stood by her, unwilling to disturb her, unable to join her. At last she rose up, heavenly calm. She took my arm, and we went home through the woods, where all the birds seemed tame and familiar. Nelly said she thought all living creatures knew it was Christmas Day, and rejoiced, and were loving together. I believed it was the frost that had tamed them, and I felt the hatred that was in me, and knew that whatever else was loving, I was full of malice and uncharitableness, nor did I wish to be otherwise. That afternoon I bade Nelly and our child farewell, and tramped to Paddyham. I got work, how, I hardly knew, for stronger and stronger came the force of the temptation to lead a wild life, to lead a wild, free life of sin. Legions seemed whispering evil thoughts to me, and only my gentle, pleading Nelly to pull me back from the great gulf. However, as I said before, I got work, and set off homewards to move my wife and child to that neighbourhood. I hated Sawley, and yet I was fiercely indignant to leave it, with my purposes unaccomplished. I was still an outcast from the more respectable, who stood afar off from such as I, and mine enemy lived and flourished in their regard. Paddyham, however, was not so far away for me to despair, to relinquish my fixed determination. It was on the eastern side of the great Pendle Hill 
ten miles away maybe hate will overleap a greater obstacle i took a cottage on the fell high up on the side of the hill we saw a long bleak moorland slope before us and then the grey stone houses of paddiham over which a black cloud hung different from the blue wood or turf smoke about sawley the wild winds came down and whistled round our house many a day when all was still below but i was happy then i rose in men's esteem i had work in plenty our child lived and throve but i forgot not our country proverb keep a stone in thy pocket for seven years turn it and keep it seven years more but have it ever ready to cast at thine enemy when the time comes one day a fellow workman asked me to go to a hillside preaching now i never cared to go to church but there was something newer and freer in the notion of praying to god right under his great dome and the open air had a charm to me ever since my wild boyhood besides they said these ranters had strange ways with them and i thought it would be fun to see their way of setting about it and this ranter of all others had made himself a name in our parts accordingly we went it was a fine summer's evening after work was done when we got to the place we saw such a crowd as i never saw before men women and children all ages were gathered together and sat on the hillside they were careworn diseased sorrowful criminal all that was told on their faces which were hard and strongly marked in the midst standing in a cart was the ranter when i first saw him i said to my companion lord what a little man to make all this pother i could trip him up with one of my fingers and then i sat down and looked about me a bit all eyes were fixed on the preacher and i turned mine upon him too he began to speak it was in no fine drawn language but in words such as we heard every day of our lives and about things we did every day of our lives he did not call our shortcomings pride or worldliness or pleasure-seeking which would have given us no clear notion of what he meant but he just told us outright what we did and then he gave it a name and said that it was accursed and that if we were lost we went on so doing by this time the tears and sweat were running down his face he was wrestling for our souls we wondered how he knew our innermost lives as he did for each one of us saw his sin set before him in plain spoken words then he cried out to us to repent and spoke first to us and then to god in a way that would have shocked many but it did not shock me i liked strong things and i liked the bare full truth and i felt brought nearer to god in that hour the summer darkness creeping over us and one after one the stars coming out above us like the eyes of the angels watching us than i had ever done in my life before when he had brought us to our tears and sighs he stopped his loud voice of upbraiding and there was a hush only broken by sobs and quivering moans in which i heard through the gloom the voices of strong men in anguish and supplication as well as the shriller tones of women suddenly he was heard again by this time we could not see him but his voice was now tender as the voice of an angel and he told us of christ and implored us to come to him i never heard such passionate entreaty he spoke as if he saw satan hovering near us in the dark dense night and as if our only safety lay in a very present coming to the cross i believe he did see satan we know he haunts the desolate old hills awaiting his time and now or never it was with many a soul at length there was a sudden silence and by the cries of those nearest to the preacher we heard that he had fainted we had all crowded round him as if he were our safety and our guide and he was overcome by the heat and the fatigue for we were the fifth set of people whom he had addressed that day i left the crowd who were leading him down and took a lonely path myself here was the earnestness that i needed to this weak and weary fainting man religion was a life and a passion 
I look back now and wonder at my blindness as to what was the root of all my Nelly's patience and long suffering, for I thought now I had found out what religion was, and that hitherto it had all been an unknown thing to me. Henceforward my life was changed. I was zealous and fanatical. Beyond the set to whom I had affiliated myself, I had no sympathy. I would have persecuted all who differed from me, if I had only had the power. I became an ascetic in all bodily enjoyments, and strange and inexplicable mystery, I had some thoughts that by every act of self-denial I was attaining to my unholy end, and that, when I had fasted and prayed long enough, God would place my vengeance in my hands. I have knelt by Nellie's bedside, and vowed to live a self-denying life, as regarded all outward things, if so that God would grant my prayer. I left it in his hands. I felt sure he would trace out the token and the word, and Nellie would listen to my passionate words, and lie awake, sorrowful and heart-sore through the night, and I would get up and make her tea, and rearrange her pillows with a strange and willful blindness, that my bitter words and blasphemous prayers had cost her miserable sleepless nights. My Nelly was suffering yet from that blow. How or where the stone had hurt her, I never understood. But in consequence of that one moment's action, her limbs became numb and dead, and, by slow degrees, she took to her bed, from whence she was never carried alive. There she lay, propped up by pillows, her meek face ever bright, and smiling forth a greeting, her white pale hands ever busy with some kind of work, and our little grace was as the power of motion to her. Fierce as I was away from her, I never could speak to her but in my gentlest tones. She seemed to me as if she had never wrestled for salvation as I had, and when away from her, I resolved many a time and oft that I would rouse her up to her state of danger when I returned home that evening. Even if strong reproach were required, I would rouse her up to her soul's need. But I came in and heard her voice singing softly, some holy word of patience, some psalm, which, maybe, had comforted the martyrs, and when I saw her face, like the face of an angel, full of patience and happy faith, I put off my awakening speeches till another time. One night, long ago, when I was yet young and strong, although my years were past forty, I sat alone in my house-place. Nelly was always in bed, as I have told you, and Grace lay in a cot by her side. I believed them to be both asleep, though how they could sleep I could not conceive, so wild and terrible was the night. The wind came sweeping down from the hilltop in great beats, like the pulses of heaven, and during the pauses while I listened for the coming roar, I felt the earth shiver beneath me. The rain beat against windows and doors and sobbed for entrance. I thought the prince of the air was abroad, and I heard or fancied I heard shrieks come on the blast, like the cries of sinful souls given over to his power. The sounds came nearer and nearer. I got up and saw to the fastenings of the door, for though I cared not for mortal man, I did care for what I believed was surrounding the house in evil might and power. But the door shook, as though it too were in deadly terror and I thought the fastenings would give way. I stood facing the entrance, lashing my heart up to defy the spiritual enemy that I looked to see, every instant, in bodily presence. And the door did burst open, and before me stood, what was it, man or demon? A grey-haired man, with poor worn clothes, all wringing wet, and he himself, battered and piteous to look upon, from the storm he had passed through. "'Let me in,' he said. "'Give me shelter. "'I am poor, or I would reward you, "'and I am friendless too,' he said, "'looking up in my face, "'like one seeking what he cannot find. "'In that look, strangely changed, "'I knew that God had heard me, "'for it was the old cowardly look "'of my life's enemy. "'Had he been a stranger, "'I might not have welcomed him, "'but as he was mine enemy,' I gave him welcome in a lordly dish. 
I sat opposite to him. "'Whence do you come?' said I. "'It is a strange night to be out on the fells.' He looked up at me sharp, but in general he held his head down like a beast or a hound. "'You won't betray me. I'll not trouble you long. As soon as the storm abates, I'll go.' "'Friend,' said I, "'what have I to betray?' and I trembled lest he should keep himself out of my power and not tell me. You come for shelter, and I give you of my best. Why do you suspect me? Because, said he, in his abject bitterness, all the world is against me. I never met with goodness or kindness, and now I am hunted like a wild beast. I'll tell you, I'm a convict returned before my time. I was a sorely man as if I of all men did not know it, and I went back like a fool to the old place. They have hunted me out where I would fain have lived rightly and quietly, and they'll send me back to that hell upon earth if they catch me. I did not know it would be such a night. Only let me rest and get warm once more, and I'll go away. Good, kind man, have pity upon me. I smiled all his doubts away, I promised him a bed on the floor, and I thought of Jael and Sisera. My heart leaped up like a war-horse at the sound of the trumpet, and said, Aha! The Lord hath heard my prayer and supplication. I shall have vengeance at last. He did not dream who I was. He was changed, so that I, who had learned his features with all the diligence of hatred, did not at first recognise him, and he thought not of me only of his own woe and affright. He looked into the fire with the dreamy gaze of one whose strength of character, if he had any, is beaten out of him and cannot return at any emergency whatsoever. He sighed and pitied himself, yet could not decide on what to do. I went softly about my business, which was to make him up a bed on the floor, and when he was lulled to sleep and security, to make the best of my way to Paddyham, and summon the constable into whose hands I would give him up to be taken back to his hell upon earth. I went into Nellie's room. She was awake and anxious. I saw she had been listening to the voices. Who is there? said she. John, tell me. It sounded like a voice I knew. For God's sake, speak. I smiled a quiet smile. It's a poor man who has lost his way. Go to sleep, my dear. I shall make him up on the floor. I may not come for some time. Go to sleep. And I kissed her. I thought she was soothed, but not fully satisfied. However, I hastened away before there was any further time for questioning. I made up the bed, and Richard Jackson, tired out, lay down and fell asleep. My contempt for him almost equalled my hate. If I were avoiding return to a place which I thought to be a hell upon earth, think you I would have taken a quiet sleep under any man's roof, till somehow or another I was secure. Now comes this man, and with incontinence of tongue, blabs out the very thing he most should conceal, and then lies down to a good, quiet, snoring sleep. I looked again. His face was old and worn and miserable. So should mine enemy look, and yet it was sad to gaze upon him, poor hunted creature. I would gaze no more, lest I grew weak and pitiful. Thus I took my hat and softly opened the door. The wind blew in, but did not disturb him. He was so utterly weary. I was out in the open air of night. The storm was ceasing and instead of the black sky of doom that I had seen when I had last looked forth, the moon was come out, wan and pale, as if wearied with the fight in the heavens, and her white light fell ghostly and calm on many a well-known object. Now and then a dark torn cloud was blown across her home in the sky, but they grew fewer and fewer, and at last she shone out steady and clear, I could see Paddyham down before me. I heard the noise of the watercourses down the hillside. My mind was full of one thought, and strained upon that one thought, and yet my senses were most acute and observant. When I came to the brook, 
it was swollen to a rapid tossing river, and the little bridge, with its handrail, was utterly swept away. It was like the bridge at Sawley, where I had first seen Nelly, and I remembered that day even then, in the midst of my vexation at having to go round. I turned away from the brook, and there stood a little figure facing me. No spirit from the dead could have affrighted me as it did, for I saw it was Grace, whom I had left in bed by her mother's side. She came to me and took my hand. Her bare feet glittered white in the moonshine, and sprinkled the light upwards as they plashed through the pool. Father, said she, mother bade me say this. Then, pausing to gather breath and memory, she repeated these words like a lesson of which she feared to forget a syllable. Mother says, There is a God in heaven, and in his house are many mansions. If you hope to meet her there, you'll come back and speak to her. If you're to be separate for ever and ever, you'll go on, and may God have mercy on her and on you. Father, I have said it right, every word. I was silent. At last I said, what made mother say this? How came she to send you out? I was asleep, father, and I heard her cry. I wakened up, and I think you had but just left the house, and that she was calling for you. Then she prayed, with the tears rolling down her cheeks, and kept saying, Oh, that I could walk! Oh, that for one hour I could run and walk! So I said, Mother, I can run and walk. Where must I go? and she clutched at my arm, and bade God bless me, and told me not to fear, for that he would compass me about, and taught me my message. And now, father, dear father, you will meet mother in heaven, won't you, and not be separate for ever and ever? She clung to my knees, and pleaded once more in her mother's words. I took her up in my arms, and turned homewards. Is your man there on the kitchen floor? asked I. Yes, she answered. At any rate, my vengeance was not out of my power yet. When we got home I passed him, dead asleep. In our room to which my child guided me was Nelly. She sat up in bed, a most unusual attitude for her, and one of which I thought she had been incapable of attaining to without help. She had her hands clasped and her face wrapped as if in prayer and when she saw me, she lay back with a sweet, ineffable smile. She could not speak at first, but when I came near, she took my hand and kissed it, and then she called Grace to her, and made her take off her cloak and her wet things, and dressed in her short, scanty nightgown, she slipped into her mother's warm side, and all this time, my Nelly never told me why she summoned me. It seemed enough that she should hold my hand, and feel that I was there. I believed she had read my heart, and yet I durst not speak to ask her. At last she looked up. My husband, said she, God has saved you and me from a great sorrow this night. I would not understand, and I felt her look die away into disappointment. That poor wanderer in the house place is Richard Jackson, is it not? I made no answer. Her face grew white and wan. Oh, said she, this is hard to bear. Speak what is in your mind, I beg of you. I will not thwart you harshly. Dearest John, only speak to me. Why need I speak? You seem to know all. I do know that his is a voice I can never forget, and I do know the awful prayers you have prayed, and I know how I have lain awake to pray that your words might never be heard, and I am a powerless cripple. I put my cause in God's hands. You shall not do the man any harm. What you have it in your thoughts to do I cannot tell, but I know that you cannot do it. My eyes are dim with a strange mist, but some voice tells me that you will forgive even Richard Jackson. Dear husband, dearest John, it is so dark I cannot see you, but speak once to me. I moved the candle, but when I saw her face, I saw what was drawing the mist over those loving eyes. 
how strange and woeful that she could die her little girl lying by her side looked in my face and then at her and the wild knowledge of death shot through her young heart and she screamed aloud nelly opened her eyes once more they fell upon the gaunt sorrow-worn man who was the cause of all he roused him from his sleep at that child's piercing cry and stood at the doorway looking in he knew nelly and understood where the storm had driven him to shelter he came towards her oh woman dying woman you have haunted me in the loneliness of the bush far away you have been in my dreams for ever the hunting of men has not been so terrible as the hunting of your spirit that stone that stone he fell down by her bedside in an agony above which her saint-like face looked on us all for the last time glorious with the coming light of heaven she spoke once again it was a moment of passion i never bore you malice for it i forgive you and so does john i trust could i keep my purpose there it faded into nothing but above my choking tears i strove to speak clear and distinct for her dying ear to hear and her sinking heart to be gladdened i forgive you richard i will befriend you in your trouble she could not see but instead of the dim shadow of death stealing over her face a quiet light came over it which we knew was the look of a soul at rest that night i listened to his tale for her sake and i learnt that it is better to be sinned against than to sin in the storm of the night mine enemy came to me in the calm of the grey morning i let him forth and bade him god speed and a woe had come upon me but the burning burden of a sinful angry heart was taken off i am old now and my daughter is married i try to go about preaching and teaching in my rough rude way and what i teach is how christ lived and died and what was nelly's faith of love end of the heart of john middleton by elizabeth gaskell read by phil benson Disappearances by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, number 63, Saturday, June the 7th, 1851. I am not in the habit of seeing the household words regularly but a friend who lately sent me some of the back numbers recommended me to read all the papers relating to the detective and protective police which i accordingly did not as the generality of readers have done as they appeared week by week or with pauses between but consecutively as a popular history of the metropolitan police and as i suppose it may also be considered a history of the police force in every large town in england when i had ended these papers i did not feel disposed to read any others at that time but preferred falling into a train of reverie and recollection first of all i remembered with a smile the unexpected manner in which a relation of mine was discovered by an acquaintance who had mislaid or forgotten mr b s address now my dear cousin mr b charming as he is in many points has the little peculiarity of liking to change his lodgings once every three months on an average which occasions some bewilderment to his country friends who have no sooner learnt the nineteen bellevue road hampstead than they have to take pains to forget that address and to remember the twenty seven and a half upper brown street camberwell and so on till i would rather learn a page of walker's pronouncing dictionary than try to remember the variety of directions which i have had to put on my letters to mr b during the last three years last summer it pleased him to remove to a beautiful village not ten miles out of london where there is a railway station thither his friend sought him 
I do not now speak of the following scent there had been through three or four different lodgings, where Mr. B. had been residing before his country friend ascertained that he was now lodging at R. He spent the morning in making inquiries as to Mr. B.'s whereabouts in the village, but many gentlemen were lodging there for the summer, and neither butcher nor baker could inform him where Mr. B. was staying. His letters were unknown at the post office, which was accounted for by the circumstance of their always being directed to his office in town. At last, the country friend sauntered back to the railway office, and while he waited for the train, he made inquiry, as a last resource, of the bookkeeper at the station. No, sir, I cannot tell you where Mr. B. lodges. So many gentlemen go by the trains. But I've no doubt but that the person standing by that pillar can inform you. The individual to whom he directed the inquirer's attention had the appearance of a tradesman, respectable enough, yet with no pretensions to gentility, and had, apparently, no more urgent employment than lazily watching the passengers who came dropping into the station. However, when he was spoken to, he answered civilly and promptly. Mr. B., tall gentleman with light hair? Yes, sir, I know Mr. B. He lodges at number 8 Morton Villas. Has done these three weeks or more. But you'll not find him there, sir, now. He went to town by the eleven o'clock train, and does not usually return until the half-past four train. The country friend had no time to lose in returning to the village, to ascertain the truth of this statement. He thanked his informant and said he would call on Mr. B at his office in town. But before he left R station, he asked the bookkeeper who the person was to whom he had referred him for information as to his friend's place of residence. One of the detective police, sir, was the answer. I need hardly say that Mr. B, not without a little surprise, confirmed the accuracy of the policeman's report in every particular. When I heard this anecdote of my cousin and his friend, I thought that there could be no more romances written on the same kind of plot as Caleb Williams, the principal interest of which, to the superficial reader, consists in the alternation of hope and fear, that the hero may or may not escape his pursuer. It is long since I have read the story, and I forget the name of the offended and injured gentleman whose privacy Caleb has invaded, but I know that his pursuit of Caleb his detection of the various hiding places of the latter, his following up of slight clues, all in fact depended upon his own energy, sagacity and perseverance. The interest was caused by the struggle of man against man, and the uncertainty as to which would ultimately be successful in his object. The unrelenting pursuer, or the ingenious Caleb, who seeks by every device to conceal himself. Now, in 1851, the offended master would set the detective police to work. There would be no doubt as to their success. The only question would be as to the time that would elapse before the hiding place could be detected, and that could not be a question long. It is no longer a struggle between man and man, but between a vast organised machinery and a weak, solitary individual. We have no hopes, no fears, only certainty. But if the materials of pursuit and evasion, as long as the chase is confined to England, are taken away from the storehouse of the romancer, at any rate, we can no more be haunted by the idea of the possibility of mysterious disappearances, and anyone who has associated much with those who were alive at the end of the last century can testify that there was some reason for such fears. When I was a child, I was sometimes permitted to accompany a relation to drink tea with a very clever old lady of one hundred and twenty, or so I thought then. I now think she, perhaps, was only about seventy. She was lively and intelligent, and had seen and known much that was worth narrating. She was a cousin of the Snades, the family whence Mr. Edgeworth took two of his wives, had known Major Andre, had mixed in the old Whig society, that the beautiful Duchess of Devonshire and buff and blue Mrs. Crewe gathered round them. Her father had been one of the early patrons of the lovely Miss Linley. I name these facts to show that she was too intelligent and cultivated by association, as well as by natural powers, to lend an over-easy credence to the marvellous. And yet I have heard her relate stories of disappearances, which haunted my imagination longer than any tale of wonder. 
one of her stories was this her father's estate lay in shropshire and his park gates opened right on to a scattered village of which he was landlord the houses formed a straggling irregular street here a garden next a gable end of a farm there a row of cottages and so on now at the end house or cottage lived a very respectable man and his wife they were well known in the village and were esteemed for the patient attention which they paid to the husband's father a paralytic old man in winter his chair was near the fire in summer they carried him out into the open space in front of the house to bask in the sunshine and to receive what placid amusement he could from watching the little passings to and fro of the villagers he could not move from his bed to his chair without help one hot and sultry june day all the village turned out to the hayfields only the very old and the very young remained the old father of whom i have spoken was carried out to bask in the sunshine that afternoon as usual and his son and daughter-in-law went to the haymaking but when they came home in the early evening their paralysed father had disappeared was gone and from that day forwards nothing more was ever heard of him the old lady who told this story said with the quietness that always marked the simplicity of her narration that every inquiry which her father could make was made and that it could never be accounted for no one had observed any stranger in the village no small household robbery to which the old man might have been supposed an obstacle had been committed in his son's dwelling that afternoon the son and daughter-in-law noted too for their attention to the helpless father had been a field among all the neighbours the whole of the time in short it never was accounted for and left a painful impression on many minds i will answer for it the detective police would have ascertained every fact relating to it in a week the story from its mystery was painful but had no consequences to make it tragical the next which i shall tell and although traditionary these anecdotes of disappearances which I relate in this paper are correctly repeated and were believed by my informants to be strictly true, had consequences, and melancholy ones too. The scene of it is in a little country town, surrounded by the estates of several gentlemen of large property. About a hundred years ago there lived in this small town an attorney with his mother and sisters. He was agent for one of the squires near and received rents for him on stated days which of course were well known he went at these times to a small public house perhaps five miles from <clears throat> where the tenants met him paid their rents and were entertained at dinner afterwards one night he did not return from this festivity he never returned the gentleman whose agent he was employed the dogberries of the time to find him and the missing cash the mother whose support and comfort he was sought him with all the perseverance of faithful love but he never returned and by and by the rumour spread that he must have gone abroad with the money his mother heard the whispers all around her and could not disprove it and so her heart broke and she died years after i think as many as fifty the well-to-do butcher and grazier of <clears throat> died but before his death he confessed that he had waylaid mr <clears throat> on the heath close to the town almost within call of his own house intending only to rob him but meeting with more resistance than he anticipated had been provoked to stab him and had buried him that very night deep under the loose sand of the heath there his skeleton was found but too late for his poor mother to know that his fame was cleared his sister too was dead unmarried for no one liked the possibilities which might arise from being connected with the family. None cared if he was guilty or innocent now. If our detective police had only been in existence. This last is hardly a story of unaccounted for disappearance. It is only unaccounted for in one generation. But disappearances never to be accounted for on any supposition are not uncommon among the traditions of the last century. I have heard and i think i have read it in one of the earlier numbers of chambers journal of a marriage which took place in lincolnshire about the year seventeen fifty it was not then de rigueur that the happy couple should set out on a wedding journey but instead 
they and their friends had a merry jovial dinner at the house of either bride or groom and in this instance the whole party adjourned to the bridegroom's residence and dispersed some to ramble in the garden some to rest in the house until the dinner hour the bridegroom it is to be supposed was with his bride when he was suddenly summoned away by a domestic who said that a stranger wished to speak to him and henceforward he was never seen more the same tradition hangs about an old deserted welsh hall standing in a wood near festiniog there too the bridegroom was sent for to give audience to a stranger on his wedding day and disappeared from the face of the earth from that time but there they tell in addition that the bride lived long that she passed her threescore years and ten but that daily during all those years while there was light of sun or moon to lighten the earth she sat watching watching at one particular window which commanded a view of the approach to the house her whole faculties her whole mental powers became absorbed in that weary watching long before she died she was childish and only conscious of one wish to sit in that long high window and watch the road along which he might come she was as faithful as evangeline if pensive and inglorious that these two similar stories of disappearance on a wedding day obtained as the french say shows us that anything which adds to our facility of communication and organization of means adds to our security of life only let a bridegroom try to disappear from an untamed catherine of a bride and he will soon be brought home like a recreant coward overtaken by the electric telegraph and clutched back to his fate by a detective policeman two more stories of disappearance and i have done i will give you the last in date first because it is the most melancholy and we will wind up cheerfully after a fashion some time between eighteen twenty and eighteen thirty there lived in north shields a respectable old woman and her son who was trying to struggle into sufficient knowledge of medicine to go out as a ship surgeon in a baltic vessel and perhaps in this manner to earn money enough to spend a session in edinburgh he was furthered in all his plans by the late benevolent dr g of that town i believe the usual premium was not required in his case the young man did many useful errands and offices which a finer young gentleman would have considered beneath him and he resided with his mother in one of the alleys or chairs which lead down from the main street of north shields to the river dr g had been with a patient all night and left her very early on a winter's morning to return home to bed but first he stepped down to his apprentice's home and bade him get up and follow him to his own house where some medicine was to be mixed and then taken to the lady accordingly the poor lad came prepared the dose and set off with it some time between five and six on a winter's morning he was never seen again dr g waited thinking he was at his mother's house she waited considering that he had gone to his day's work and meanwhile as people remembered afterwards the small vessel bound to edinburgh sailed out of port the mother expected him back her whole life long but some years afterwards occurred the discoveries of the hare and burke horrors and people seemed to gain a dark glimpse at his fate but i have never heard that it was fully ascertained or indeed more than surmised i ought to add that all who knew him spoke emphatically as to his steadiness of purpose and conduct so as to render it improbable in the highest degree that he had run off to sea or suddenly changed his plan of life in any way my last story is one of a disappearance which was accounted for after many years there is a considerable street in manchester leading from the centre of the town to some of the suburbs this street is called at one part garrett and afterwards where it emerges into gentility and comparatively country brook street it derives its former name from an old black and white hall of from the time of richard the third or thereabouts to judge from the style of building they have closed in what is left of the old hall now but a few years since this old house was visible from the main road it stood low on some vacant ground and appeared to be half in ruins i believe it was occupied by several poor families who rented tenements in the tumble-down dwelling but formerly it was gerard hall 
what a difference between Gerard and Garrett, and was surrounded by a park with a clear brook running through it, with pleasant fish ponds, the name of these was preserved until very lately on a street near, orchards, dovecots, and similar appurtenances to the manor houses of former days. I am almost sure that the family to whom it belonged were Mosleys, probably a branch of the tree of the Lord of the Manor of Manchester. Any topographical work of the last century relating to their district would give the name of the last proprietor of the old stock, and it is to him that my story refers. Many years ago there lived in Manchester two old maiden ladies of high respectability. All their lives had been spent in the town and they were fond of relating the changes which had taken place within their recollection, which extended back to seventy or eighty years from the present time. They knew much of its traditionary history from their father as well, who, with his father before him, had been respectable attorneys in Manchester during the greater part of the last century. They were, also, agents for several of the county families, who, driven from their old possessions by the enlargement of the town, found some compensation in the increased value of any land which they might choose to sell. Consequently, the Messrs. S., father and son, were conveyances in good repute and acquainted with several secret pieces of family history, one of which related to Garrett Hall. The owner of this estate, some time in the first half of the last century, married young. He and his wife had several children and lived together in a quiet state of happiness for many years. At last, business of some kind took the husband up to London, a week's journey in those days. He wrote and announced his arrival. I do not think he ever wrote again. He seemed to be swallowed up in the abyss of the metropolis, for no friend, and the lady had many and powerful friends, could ever ascertain for her what had become of him. The prevalent idea was that he had been attacked by some of the street robbers who prowled about in those days, that he had resisted and had been murdered. His wife gradually gave up all hopes of seeing him again, and devoted herself to the care of her children, and so they went on, tranquilly enough, until the heir came of age, when certain deeds were necessary before he could legally take possession of the property. These deeds, Mr. S., the family lawyer, stated had been given up to him into the missing gentleman's keeping, just before the last mysterious journey to London, with which, I think, they were in some way concerned. It was possible that they were still in existence. Someone in London might have them in possession and be either conscious or unconscious of their importance. At any rate, Mr S's advice to his client was that he should put an advertisement in the London papers, worded so skilfully that anyone who might hold the important documents should understand to what it referred, and no one else. This was accordingly done, and although repeated at intervals for some time, it met with no success. But, at last, a mysterious answer was sent, to the effect that the deeds were in existence and should be given up, but only on certain conditions, and to the heir himself. The young man, in consequence, went up to London, and adjourned according to directions to an old house in Barbican, where he was told by a man, apparently awaiting him, that he must submit to be blindfolded, and must follow his guidance. He was taken through several long passages before he left the house. At the termination of one of these, he was put into a sedan chair, and carried about for an hour or more. He always reported that there were many turnings, and that he imagined he was set down finally, not very far from his starting point. When his eyes were unbandaged, he was in a decent sitting room with tokens of family occupation lying about. A middle-aged gentleman entered and told him that until a certain time had elapsed, which should be indicated to him in a particular way, but of which the length was not then named, he must swear to secrecy as to the means by which he obtained possession of the deeds. This oath was taken and then the gentleman, not without some emotion, acknowledged himself to be the missing father of the heir. It seems that he had fallen in love with a damsel, a friend of the person with whom he lodged. To this young woman he had represented himself as unmarried. She listened willingly to his wooing, and her father, 
who was a shopkeeper in the city, was not averse to the match, as the Lancashire squire had a goodly presence and many similar qualities, which the shopkeeper thought might be acceptable to his customers. The bargain was struck. The descendant of a knightly race married the only daughter of the city shopkeeper and became a junior partner in the business. He told his son that he had never repented the step he had taken, that his lowly-born wife was sweet, docile and affectionate, that his family by her was large, and that he and they were thriving and happy. He inquired after his first, or rather, I should say, his true wife with friendly affection, approved of what she had done with regard to his estate and the education of his children, but said that he considered he was dead to her, as she was to him. When he really died, he promised that a particular message, the nature of which he specified, should be sent to his son at Garrett. Until then, they would not hear more of each other, for it was of no use attempting to trace him under his incognito, even if the oath did not render such an attempt forbidden. I dare say the youth had no great desire to trace out the father, who had been one in name only. He returned to Lancashire, took possession of the property at Manchester, and many years elapsed before he received the mysterious intimation of his father's real death. After that, he named the particulars connected with the recovery of the title deeds to Mr. S. and one or two intimate friends. When the family became extinct or removed from Garrett, it became no longer any very closely kept secret, and I was told the tale of the disappearance by Miss S., the aged daughter of the family agent. Once more, let me say, I am thankful I live in the days of the detective police. If I am murdered or commit bigamy, at any rate, my friends will have the comfort of knowing all about it. A Disappearance From Household Words, a Weekly Journal Number 65 Saturday, June the 21st, 1851 a correspondent has favoured us with the sequel to the disappearance of the pupil of Dr. G, who vanished from North Shields in charge of certain potions he was entrusted with very early one morning to convey to a patient. Referring to page 249 of a recent number of household words, she says, Dr. G's son married my sister, and the young man who disappeared was a pupil in the house. When he went out with the medicine, he was hardly dressed, having merely thrown on some clothes, and he went in slippers, which incidents induced the belief that he was made away with. After some months his family put on mourning, and the G's, very timid people, were so sure that he was murdered that they wrote verses to his memory and became sadly worn by terror. But after a long time, I fancy but am not sure, about a year and a half, came a letter from the young man, who was doing well in America. His explanation was that a vessel was lying at the wharf about to sail in the morning, and the youth, who had long meditated evasion, thought it a good opportunity and stepped on board after leaving the medicine at the proper door. I spent some weeks at Dr. G's after the occurrence, and very doleful we used to be about it, but the next time I went they were naturally very angry with the inconsiderate young man. End of short stories from Household Words, 1850 to 1851, by Elizabeth Gaskell, read by Phil Benson. The Shah's English Gardener, by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, number 117, 9th of June, 1852. The Shah's English Gardener The facts of the following narration were communicated to me by Mr. Burton, the head gardener at Teddersley Park in Staffordshire. I had previously been told that he had been for a year or two in the service of the Shah of Persia, which induced me to question him concerning the motives which took him so far from England, and the kind of life which he led at Tehran. 
I was so much interested in the details he gave me that I made notes at the time which have enabled me to draw up the following account. Mr. Burton is a fine-looking, healthy man in the prime of life, whose appearance would announce his nation all the world over. He had completed his education as a gardener at Knights, when, in 1848, an application was made to him on behalf of the Shah of Persia by Colonel Shale, the English envoy at the court of Tehran, who proposed to Mr. Burton that he should return to Persia with the second Persian secretary to the embassy, Mirza Usan Kula, and take charge of the royal gardens at Tehran, at a salary of a hundred pounds a year, with rooms provided for him, and an allowance of two shillings a day, for the food of himself and the native servant whom he would find it necessary to employ. This prospect, and the desire which is so natural to young men to see countries beyond their own, led Mr. Burton to accept the proposal. The Mirza Uzankula and he left Southampton on the 29th of September, 1848, and went by steam to Constantinople. Thence they journeyed without accident to the capital of Persia. The seat of government was removed to Tehran about 70 years ago, when the Kujur dynasty became possessed of the Persian throne. Their faction was predominant in the north of Persia, and they, consequently, felt more secure in Tehran than in the ancient southern capital. Tehran is situated in the midst of a wide plain, from two to three hundred miles long, which has a most dreary appearance, being totally uncultivated, and the soil of which is a light kind of reddish loam that becomes pulverised after a long continuance of dry weather, and then rises as great clouds of sand, sometimes even obscuring the sun several hours in a day for several successive days. Bad news awaited Mr. Burton on his arrival at Tehran. The Shah, who had commissioned Colonel Shale to engage an English gardener, was dead. His successor cared little, either about gardening or his predecessor's engagements. Colonel Shale was in England. Mr. Burton's heart sunk a little within him, but having a stout English spirit and great faith in the British Embassy, he insisted on a partial fulfilment of the contract. Until this negotiation was completed, Mr. Burton was lodged in the house of Mirza Usankula. Mr. Burton was therefore, for a month, a member of a Persian household, belonging to one of the upper middle class. The usual mode of living in one house seemed pretty nearly the same in all that fell under the range of Mr. Burton's observation. They get up at sunrise when they have a cup of coffee. The few hours in the day in which the Persians condescend to labour in any way are from sunrise until seven or eight o'clock in the morning. After that, the heat becomes so intense frequently 108 or 109 degrees in the shade, that all keep within doors, lying about on mats in passages or rooms. At ten they have their first substantial meal, which consists of mutton and rice, stewed together in a rude saucepan, over a charcoal fire, built out of doors. Sometimes, in addition to this dish, they have a kind of soup or water meat, which is the literal translation of the Persian name, made of water, mutton, onions, parsley, fowls, rice, dried fruits, apricots, almonds, and walnuts stewed together. But this, as we may guess from the multiplicity of the ingredients, was a dainty dish. At four o'clock, the panting Persians, nearly worn out by the heat of the day, take a cup of strongly perfumed tea, with a little bitter orange juice squeezed into it, and after this tonic they recover strength enough to smoke and lounge. Dinner was the grand meal of the day, to which they invited friends. It was not unlike breakfast, but was preceded by a dessert, at which wine was occasionally introduced, but which always consisted of melons and dried fruits. The dinner was brought in on a pewter tray, but Mr. Burton remarked that the pewter dishes were very dingy. A piece of common print was spread on the ground, and cakes of bread put on it. They had no spoons for the soup water meat, but soaked their bread in it, or curled it round into a hollow shape, and fished up what they could out of the abyss. At the Mirza's they had spoons for the sour goat's milk, with ice, which seemed to be one of their delicacies. The ice is brought down from the mountains, and sold pretty cheaply in the bazaars. Sugar and salt are eaten, together with this iced sour goat's milk. 
smoking nagilas, beguiles the evening hours very pleasantly. They pluck a quantity of rose blossoms and put them into the water through which the smoke passes, but the roses last in season only a month. Mirza Usankula had a few chairs in the house for the use of the gentlemen of the embassy. At last the negotiation respecting Mr. Burton's engagement was ended. His friends at the embassy had insisted that the present Shah should install him in the office of Royal Gardener at the salary proposed by his predecessor. Accordingly, about a month after his arrival at Tehran, he took possession of two rooms, appropriated to his use, in the garden of El Kanai. The garden consisted of six acres, with a mud wall all around. There were avenues of fruit trees planted, with lucerne growing under them, which was cut for the food of the horses in the royal stable. But the lucerne and the trees gave this royal garden very much the aspect of an English orchard, and must have been a very disenchanting prospect for a well-trained gardener, accustomed to our flower-beds and vegetable gardens. The fruit trees were apricots, apples, pears and cherries, the latter of the same description as ours, but finer in quality. The apricots were of a kind which Mr. Burton had never seen before, with large sweet kernels. He brought some of the stones with him to England, and gave them to his old master, Mr. Knight. If this square pot of orchard ground, surrounded by a mud wall, was the cheerless prospect outside, the two rooms which Mr. Burton was to inhabit were not much more attractive. Bare of all furniture, with floors of mud and chaff beaten together, they did not even contain the mats which play so many parts in Persian houses. Mr. Burton's first care was to purchase mats and hire a servant to market and cook for him. The people at the embassy sent him the various bales of seeds, roots and implements which he had brought with him from England, and he hoped before long to introduce some improvements into Persian gardening. So little did he as yet know the nature of the people with whom he had to deal. But before he was well settled in his two rooms, while he was yet unpacking his English bales, some native plasterers told him that outside of his wooden door, which fastened only with a slight chain, Six men lay in wait for him to do him evil, partly prompted by the fact of his being a foreigner, partly in hopes of obtaining possession of some of the contents of these bales. It was two miles to the embassy, and Mr. Burton was without a friend nearer. His very informants would not stand by him, but would rather rejoice in his discomfiture. But being a brave, resolute man, he picked out a scythe from among his English implements, threw open the door, and began to address the six men, who sure enough lay couched near the entrance, in the best Persian he could muster. His Persian eloquence, or possibly the sight of the scythe wielded by a stout, resolute man, produced the desired effect. The six men, fortunately, went away, without having attacked him, for any effort at self-defence on his part would have strengthened the feeling of hostility already strong against him. Once more he was left in quiet to unpack his goods, with such shaded light as two windows covered over with paper and calico could give. But when his tools were unpacked, tools selected with such care and such a hoping heart in England, who were to use them? The men appointed as gardeners under him would not work, because they were never paid. If Mr. Burton made them work, he should pay them, they said. At length he did persuade them to labour, during the hours in which exertion was possible, even to a native. Mr. Burton began to inquire how these men were paid, or if their story was true that they never were. It was true that wages for labour done for the Shah were most irregularly given, and when the money could no longer be refused, it was paid in the form of bills upon some gate to a town, or some public bath a hundred or a hundred and twenty miles away, such gates and baths being royal property. Honest payment of wages being rare, of course stealing is plentiful, and it is even winked at by the royal officers. The gardeners under Mr. Burton, for instance, would gather the flowers he had cherished with care, and present them to any chief who came into the Bauhel Kanai, and the present they received in turn constituted their only means of livelihood. Sometimes Mr. Burton was the sole labourer in his garden, and he had the charge of Bauhel Koleza, twenty square acres in size, and at some distance from El Kanai where he lived. 
when the hot weather came on, he fell ill of diarrhoea, and for three months lay weary and ill on his mat, unable to superintend, if there had been gardeners, or to work himself, if there were none. After he recovered, he seems to have been hopeless of doing any good in such a climate, and among such a people. The Shah took little interest in horticulture. He sometimes came into the gardens of El Canai, in which his palace was situated, and would ask some questions, through an interpreter, in a languid, weary kind of way. Sometimes, when Mr. Burton had any vegetables ready, he requested leave to present them himself to the Shah. When this was accorded, he wove the twigs of the white poplar, the tree which most abounded on the great barren plain surrounding Tehran, and filling this with lettuces or peas, or similar garden produce, he was ushered with much ceremony into one of the courts, small yards, as Mr. Burton once irreverently called them, belonging to the palace. There, in a kind of balcony projecting from one of the windows, the Shah sat, and the English gardener, without shoes, but with the lambskin fez covering his head, bowed three times as he gave up his basket to be handed to the Shah. Mr. Burton did not perform the Persian salam, considering such a slave-like obeisance unbefitting a European. The Shah received these baskets of vegetables, some of which were new to him, with great indifference, not caring to ask any questions. The spirit of curiosity, however, was alive in the harem, if nowhere else, and one day Mr. Burton was surprised to receive a command to go and sow some annuals in one of the courts of the harem, for such was the Queen Mother's desire. So, taking a few packets of common flower seeds, he went through some rooms in the palace before he arrived at the courts, which open one out of another. These rooms Mr. Burton considered as little better, either in size, construction or furniture, than his own garden dwelling. But there are some apartments in this royal palace which are said to be splendid, one lined with plate glass, and several fitted up with the beautiful painted windows for which Persia is celebrated. On entering the courts belonging to the harem, Mr. Burton found himself attended by three or four soldiers and two eunuchs, all with drawn swords, which they made a little parade of holding above him, rather to his amusement, especially as he seems to have had occasional glimpses of peeping ladies, who ought rather to have had the swords held over them. Before passing from one yard to another, one or two soldiers would precede him, to see that the coast was clear, and if a veiled lady chanced, through that ignorance which is bliss all the world over, to come into the very yard where he was, the soldiers seized him, huddled him into a dark corner, and turned his face to the wall. She, meanwhile, passing through under the cover of her servant's large cloak, something like a chicken peeping from under the wing of the hen. Whatever might have been their danger from the handsome young Englishman, he at least was not particularly attracted by their appearance. The utmost praise he could bestow was that one or two were tolerably good-looking, and on being pressed for details, he said that those ladies of the harem of whom he caught a glimpse resembled all other Persian women, in having very large features, very coarse complexions, with large eyes. They, as well as the men, paint the eyebrows so as to make them appear to meet. They are stout made. Such were the observations which Mr. Burton made as he was passing through the yards or courts which led into the small garden where he was to sow his flower seeds. Here the Queen Mother sat in a projecting balcony, but as soon as she saw the stranger she drew back, she is about thirty-five years of age, and possesses much influence in the country, which, as she is a cruel and ambitious woman, has produced great evils. One day Mrs. Shale's maid, who had accompanied her mistress on a visit to the ladies in the harem, fell in with a French woman, who had been an inhabitant there for more than twenty years. She seemed perfectly contented with her situation, and had no wish to exchange it for any other. Every now and then Mr. Burton sent flowers to the harem, such as he could cultivate in the dry, hot garden, with no command of labour. Marvel of Peru, African marigolds, single stocks and violets planted along the sides of the walks between plains and poplars, were the flowers he gathered to form his nosegays. But all gardening was weary and dreary work, partly owing to the great heat of the climate, partly to the scarcity of water, 
but most especially because there was no service or assistance to be derived from any other man. The men appointed to assist him grew more careless and lazy than ever as time rolled on. He had no means of enforcing obedience or attention, and if he had had, he would not have dared to use it, and so to increase the odium that attached to him as a foreigner. Moreover, no one cared whether the gardens flourished or decayed. If it had not been for the kindness of some of the English residents, among whom he especially mentioned Mr. Reed, his situation would have been utterly intolerable. There was nothing in the external life of the place which could contemplate for his individual disappointment. At least he perceived nothing. One day, in crossing the marketplace, he saw eight men lying with their heads cut off, executed for being religious fanatics, who had assumed the character of prophets. At another time there were six men put to death for highway robbery, and the mode of death was full of horror, whatever their crimes might be. They were hung head downwards, with the right arm and leg cut off. One of them dragged out life in this state for three days. Even the minor punishments are cruel and vindictive, as they always are where the power and execution of the laws is uncertain. One of the penalties inflicted for slight offences is to have a string passed through the nostrils and be led for three successive days through the bazaars and marketplaces by a crier proclaiming the nature of his misdemeanour. Blindness is very common. Mr. Burton has often seen six or eight blind men walking in a string, each with his right arm on the shoulder of his precursor, partly caused by ophthalmia produced by the dust and partly because the Shah has it in his power to inflict the punishment of pulling both or one of the eyes out. The great-grandfather of the present Shah, Aga Mohammed, the founder of the Kujur dynasty, had large baskets full of the eyes of his enemies presented to him after his accession to the throne. Let us change the subject to attar of roses, though all the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten the memory of that last sentence. Attar of roses is made and sold in the bazaars. The rose employed is the common single pink, which must be gathered before the sudden rise of the hot sun causes the dew to evaporate. By the side of the attar sellers may be seen the Jew selling trinkets, the Armenians, Christians in name, and as such bound by no laws of Mahomet, selling a sweetish red wine, and the raki, a spirit made from the refuse of grapes and resembling gin, while through the bazaars men go, having leathern bags on their backs containing bad dirty water and a lump of ice in a basin, into which they pour out draughts for their customers. Ice is brought down from the mountains and sold at the rate of a large lump for two or three pools, a pool being a small copper coin, of which thirty make one koran, silver, value eleven pence, and ten korans make one to morn, a gold coin of the value of nine shillings. The drinking water is procured from open drains or from tanks, in which all the washing the Persians ever give their clothes is done. They use no soap even for shaving, but soapy water would be preferable to the vermin which float on the surface of the beverage obtained from these sources. No wonder that the cholera returns every three years, and is a fatal scourge, especially when we learn that the doctors and barbers in Tehran, as formerly in England, unite the two professions, and that the great resource in all cases of illness is the lancet. Besides the shops in the bazaars, where provisions and beverages of various kinds are sold, there are others for silks, carpets, embroidered pieces, something like the Indian shawls, but smaller in size, and purchased by the Europeans for waistcoats and cashmere shawls, which even there, and not always new, bear the high prices of from fifty pounds to one hundred pounds. Those which were presented to the ladies of the embassy were worth at Tehran one hundred pounds apiece. There are also lambskin caps or fezzes, about half a yard high, conical in shape, and open or crownless at the top, heavier than a hat, but much cooler, owing to the ventilation produced by this opening. No Europeans wear hats, except one or two at the embassy. Cotton materials are used for dresses by the common people, manufactured at Tehran. There are very few articles of British manufacture sold in the bazaars, 
but French, German and Russian things are bound. A fondness for watches seems to be a Persian weakness. Some of the higher classes will wear two at a time, like the English dandies sixty years ago, and sometimes both these watches will be in the state of standstill. It is therefore no wonder that a little German watchmaker who is settled at Tehran is making his fortune. The mode of reckoning time is from sunrise to sunset, prayers being said by the faithful before each of these. The day and night are each divided into watches of three hours long, subdividing the time between sunrise and midday, midday and sunset. Mr. Burton saw little of the religious ceremonies of the Persians. He had never been inside a mosque, but he had seen people saying their prayers at the appointed times, at the expiration of every watch through the day, he believed, on raised platforms, erected for the purpose, up and down the town. The form of washing the hands before they say their prayers is gone through by country people on the dusty plain, using soil instead of water, the more purifying article of the two, one would suppose, after hearing Mr. Burton's account of the state of the drains and tanks in Tehran. The priests are recognised by the white turbans which they wear as a class distinction, and our English gardener does not seem to have come in contact with any of them, excepting in occasional rencontres in the streets where the women, veiled and shrouded, shuffle along, their veils being transparent just at the eyes, so as to enable them to see without being seen, while their clumsy, shapeless mantles effectually prevent all recognition, even from husband or father. The higher class, the wives of Mirzas or noblemen, are conveyed in a kind of covered handbarrow from place to place. This species of rude carriage will hold two ladies sitting upright, and has a small door on either side. It is propelled by one mule before, and one behind. As long as these national peculiarities were novel enough to excite curiosity, Mr. Burton had something to relieve the monotony of his life, which was very hopeless in the horticultural line. By and by it sank into great sameness. The domestic changes were of much the same kind as the Vicar of Wakefield's migration from the blue bed to the brown. For three or four months in the hot season, Mr. Burton conveyed his mat up the mud staircase which led from his apartments, through a trap door, onto the flat roof, and slept there. When the hot weather was over, Mr. Burton came down under cover. He felt himself becoming utterly weary and enervated, and probably wondered, less than he had done on his first arrival, at the lazy way in which the natives worked sitting down, for instance, to build a wall. Indifference, which their religion may dignify in some things into fatalism, seemed to prevail everywhere and in every person. They ate their peas and beans unshelled, rather than take any unnecessary trouble, a piece of piggism which especially scandalised him. Twice in the year there were great religious festivals which roused the whole people into animation and enthusiasm. One in the spring was the Nuruz, when a kind of miracle play was acted simultaneously upon the various platforms in the city, the grandest representation of all being in the market place, where thirty or forty thousand attended. The subject of this play is the death of the sons of Ali, the Persians being Shia or followers of Ali, and as such regarded as schismatics by the more orthodox Turks, who do not believe in the three successors of Muhammad. This mystery is admirably performed, and excites the Persians to passionate weeping. A frank ambassador is invariably introduced, who comes to intercede for the sons of Ali. This is the tradition of the Persians, and although not corroborated by any European legend, it is so faithfully believed in by the Persians, that it has long procured for the Europeans a degree of kindly deference very different from the feeling with which they are regarded by the Ali-hating Turks. The other religious festival occurs some time in August, and is of much the same description. Some event, Mr. Burton believed it was the death of Muhammad, being dramatised, and acted in all the open public places. The weeping and wailing are as general at this representation as the other. Mr. Burton himself said, he was so cut up by it he could not help crying, and excused himself for what he evidently considered a weakness, by
by saying that everybody there was doing the same. Sometimes the Shah rode abroad. He and his immediate attendants were well mounted, but behind, around, came a rabble rout to the number of one, two, and even three thousand, on broken-down horses, on mules, on beggarly donkeys, or running on foot, their rags waving in the wind, everybody, anybody, anyhow. The soldiers in attendance did not contribute to the regularity or uniformity of the scene, as there is no regulation height, and the dwarf of four feet ten jostles his brother-in-arms, who towers above him at the stature of six feet six. In strange contrast with this wild tumult and disorderly crowd must be one of the Shah's amusements, which consists in listening to Mr. Burgess, the appointed English interpreter, who translates the Times, illustrated news, and occasionally English books, for the pleasure of the Shah. One wonders what ideas certain words convey, representative of the order and uniform regularity of England. In October 1849, Colonel Shale returned to Tehran after his sojourn in England, and soon afterwards it was arranged that Mr. Burton should leave Persia and shorten his time of engagement to the Shah by one half. Accordingly, as soon as he had completed a year in Tehran, he began to make preparations for returning to Europe, and about March 1850 he arrived at Constantinople, where he remained another twelve month. The remembrance of Mr. Burton's oriental life must be in strange contrast to the regular, well-ordered comfort of his present existence. End of the Shah's English Gardener by Elizabeth Gaskell Read by Phil Benson The Old Nurse's Story by Elizabeth Gaskell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From A Round of Stories by the Christmas Fire being the extra Christmas number of Household Words, Christmas 1852. The Old Nurse's Story You know, my dears, that your mother was an orphan and an only child, and I dare say you have heard that your grandfather was a clergyman up in Westmoreland where I come from. I was just a girl in the village school, when, one day, your grandmother came in to ask the mistress if there was any scholar there who would do for a nursemaid. And mighty proud I was, I can tell ye, when the mistress called me up and spoke to my being a good girl at my needle and a steady, honest girl, and one whose parents were very respectable, though they might be poor. I thought I should like nothing better than to serve the pretty young lady, who was blushing as deep as I was, as she spoke of the coming baby and what I should have to do with it. However, I see you don't care so much for this part of my story as for what you think is to come. So, I'll tell you at once, I was engaged and settled at the parsonage before Miss Rosamond, that was the baby who is now your mother, was born. To be sure, I had little enough to do with her when she came, for she was never out of her mother's arms and slept by her all night long, and proud enough was I sometimes when Mrs. trusted her to me. There never was such a baby before or since, though you've all of you been fine enough in your turns. But for sweet winning ways, you've none of you come up to your mother. She took after her mother, who was a real lady born, a Miss Furnival, a granddaughter of Lord Furnival's in Northumberland. I believe she had neither brother nor sister, and had been brought up in my lord's family till she had married your grandfather, who was just a curate son to a shopkeeper in Carlisle, but a clever, fine gentleman as ever was, and one who was a right-down hard worker in his parish, which was very wide and scattered all abroad over the Westmoreland fells. When your mother, little Miss Rosamond, was about four or five years old, both her parents died in a fortnight, one after the other. Ah, that was a sad time! My pretty young mistress and me was looking for another baby when my master came home from one of his long rides, wet and tired, and took the fever he died of. And then she never held up her head again, but just lived to see her dead baby 
and have it laid on her breast before she sighed away her life. My mistress had asked me on her deathbed never to leave Miss Rosamond, but if she had never spoken a word, I would have gone with the little child to the end of the world. The next thing, and before we had well stilled our sobs, the executors and guardians came to settle the affairs. They were my poor young mistress's own cousin, Lord Furnival, and Mr. Esthwaite, my master's brother, a shopkeeper in Manchester, not so well to do then as he was afterwards, and with a large family rising about him. Well, I don't know if it were their settling, or because of a letter my mistress wrote on her deathbed to her cousin, my lord, but somehow it was settled that Miss Rosamond and me were to go to Furnival Manor House in Northumberland, and my lord spoke as if it had been her mother's wish that she should live with his family, and as if he had no objections, for that one or two more or less could make no difference in so grand a household. So, though that was not the way in which I should have wished the coming of my bright and pretty pet to have been looked at, who was like a sunbeam in any family, be it never so grand, I was well pleased that all the folks in the dale should stare and admire when they heard I was going to be young lady's maid at my Lord Furnival's at Furnival Manor. But I made a mistake in thinking we were to go and live where my lord did. It turned out that the family had left Furnival Manor House fifty years or more. I could not hear that my poor young mistress had ever been there, though she had been brought up in the family, and I was sorry for that, for I should have liked Miss Rosamond's youth to have passed where her mother's had been. My lord's gentleman, from whom I asked as many questions as I durst, said that the manor house was at the foot of the Cumberland Fells, and a very grand place, that an old Miss Furnival, a great aunt of my lord's, lived there, with only a few servants, but that it was a very healthy place, and my lord had thought that it would suit Miss Rosamond very well for a few years, and that her being there might perhaps amuse his old aunt. I was bidden by my lord to have Miss Rosamond's things ready by a certain day, he was a stern, proud man, as they say all the Lord Furnival's were, and he never spoke a word more than was necessary. Folk did say he had loved my young mistress, but that, because she knew that his father would object, she would never listen to him, and married Mr. Esthwaite. But I don't know. He never married at any rate, but he never took much notice of Miss Rosamond, which I thought he might have done if he had cared for her dead mother. He sent his gentleman with us to the manor house, telling him to join him at Newcastle that same evening, so there was no great length of time for him to make us known to all the strangers, before he, too, shook us off, and we were left, two lonely young things, I was not eighteen, in the great old manor house. It seems like yesterday that we drove there. We had left our own dear parsonage very early, and we had both cried, as if our hearts would break though we were travelling in my lord's carriage, which I had thought so much of once. And now it was long past noon on a September day, and we stopped to change horses for the last time at a little smoky town, all full of colliers and miners. Miss Rosamond had fallen asleep, but Mr Henry told me to waken her that she might see the park and the manor house as we drove up. I thought it rather a pity, but I did what he bade me, for fear he should complain of me to my lord. We had left all signs of a town, or even a village, and were then inside the gates of a large wild park, not like the parks here in the south, but with rocks and the noise of running water, and gnarled thorn-trees and old oaks, all white and peeled with age. The road went up about two miles, and then we saw a great and stately house, with many trees close around it, so close that in some places their branches dragged against the walls when the wind blew, and some hung broken down, for no one seemed to take much charge of the place, to lop the wood or to keep the moss-covered carriageway in order. Only in front of the house all was clear. The great oval drive was without a weed, and neither tree nor creeper was allowed to grow over the long, many-windowed front at both sides of which a wing projected, which were each the ends of other side fronts. For the house, 
although it was so desolate, was even grander than I expected. Behind it rose the fells, which seemed unenclosed and bare enough, and on the left hand of the house as you stood facing it was a little old-fashioned flower garden, as I found out afterwards. A door opened out upon it from the west front. It had been scooped out of the thick dark wood for some old lady Furnival, but the branches of the great forest trees had grown and overshadowed it again, and there were very few flowers that would live there at that time. When we drove up to the great front entrance and went into the hall, I thought we should be lost, it was so large and vast and grand. There was a chandelier, all of bronze, hung down from the middle of the ceiling, and I had never seen one before, and looked at it all in amaze. Then, at one end of the hall, was a great fireplace, as large as the sides of the houses in my country, with massy andirons and logs and dogs to hold the wood, and by it were heavy old-fashioned sofas. At the opposite end of the hall, to the left as you went in, on the western side, was an organ built into the wall, and so large that it filled up the best part of that end. Beyond it, on the same side, was a door, and opposite, on each side of the fireplace, were also doors, leading to the east front, but these I never went through as long as I stayed in the house, so I can't tell you what lay beyond. The afternoon was closing in, and the hall, which had no fire lighted in it, looked dark and gloomy. But we did not stay there a moment. The old servant who had opened the door for us bowed to Mr. Henry and took us in through the door at the further side of the great organ and led us through several smaller halls and passages into the west drawing-room, where he said that Miss Furnival was sitting. Poor little Miss Rosamond held very tight to me, as if she were scared and lost in that great place and as for myself, I was not much better. The west drawing-room was very cheerful looking, with a warm fire in it, and plenty of good comfortable furniture about. Miss Furnival was an old lady, not far from eighty, I should think, but I do not know. She was thin and tall, and had a face as full of fine wrinkles, as if they had been drawn all over it with a needle's point. Her eyes were very watchful, to make up, I suppose, for her being so deaf as to be obliged to use a trumpet. Sitting with her, working at the same great piece of tapestry, was Mrs. Stark, her maid and companion, and almost as old as she was. She had lived with Miss Furnival ever since they both were young, and now she seemed more like a friend than a servant. She looked so cold and grey and stony, as if she had never loved or cared for anyone and I don't suppose she did care for anyone except her mistress. And owing to the great deafness of the latter, Mrs. Stark treated her very much as if she were a child. Mr. Henry gave some message from my lord, and then he bowed good-bye to us all, taking no notice of my sweet little Rosamond's outstretched hand, and left us standing there, being looked at by the two old ladies through their spectacles. I was right glad when they rung for the old footman who had shown us in at first, and told him to take us to our rooms. So we went out of that great drawing-room, and into another sitting-room, and out of that, and then up a great flight of stairs, and along a broad gallery, which was something like a library, having books all down one side, and windows and writing-tables all down the other, till we came to our rooms, which, I was not sorry to hear, were just over the kitchens, for I began to think I should be lost in that wilderness of a house. There was an old nursery that had been used for all the little lords and ladies long ago, with a pleasant fire burning in the grate, and the kettle boiling on the hob, and tea things spread out on the table. And out of that room was the night nursery, with a little crib for Miss Rosamond, close to my bed and old James called up Dorothy, his wife, to bid us welcome, and both he and she were so hospitable and kind that by and by Miss Rosamond and me felt quite at home, and by the time tea was over she was sitting on Dorothy's knee and chattering away as fast as her little tongue could go. I soon found out that Dorothy was from Westmoreland, and that bound her and me together, as it were, and I would never wish to meet with kinder people than were old James and his wife. 
James had lived pretty nearly all his life in my lord's family, and thought there was no one so grand as they. He even looked down a little on his wife, because, till he had married her, she had never lived in any but a farmer's household. But he was very fond of her, as well he might be. They had one servant under them to do all the rough work. Agnes they called her, and she and me and James and Dorothy, with Miss Furnival and Mrs Stark, made up the family, always remembering my sweet little Rosamond. I used to wonder what they had done before she came. They thought so much of her now. Kitchen and drawing room, it was all the same. The hard, sad Miss Furnival and the cold Mrs Stark looked pleased when she came fluttering in like a bird, playing and pranking hither and thither, with a continual murmur and a pretty prattle of gladness. I am sure they were sorry many a time when she flitted away into the kitchen, though they were too proud to ask her to stay with them, and were a little surprised at her taste, though, to be sure, as Mrs Stark said, it was not to be wondered at, remembering what stock her father had come of. The great old rambling house was a famous place for little Miss Rosamond, she made expeditions all over it with me at her heels, all except the east wing, which was never opened, and whither we never thought of going. But in the western and northern part was many a pleasant room, full of things that were curiosities to us, although they might not have been to people who had seen more. The windows were darkened by the sweeping boughs of the trees, and the ivy which had overgrown them, but in the green gloom we could manage to see old china jars and carved ivory boxes and great heavy books, and above all, the old pictures. Once, I remember, my darling would have Dorothy go with us to tell us who they all were, for they were all portraits of some of my lord's family, though Dorothy could not tell us the names of every one. We had gone through most of the rooms when we came to the old state drawing room over the hall, and there was a picture of Miss Furnival, or, as she was called in those days, Miss Grace, for she was the younger sister. Such a beauty she must have been, but with such a set, proud look, and such scorn looking out of her handsome eyes, with her eyebrows just a little raised, as if she wondered how anyone could have the impertinence to look at her, and her lip curled at us as we stood there gazing. She had a dress on, the like of which I had never seen before, but it was all the fashion when she was young. A hat of some soft white stuff, like a beaver, pulled a little over her brows, and a beautiful plume of feathers sweeping round it on one side, and her gown of blue satin was open in front to a quilted white stomacher. "'Well, to be sure,' said I, when I had gazed my fill, "'flesh is grass, they do say,' But who would have thought the Miss Furnival who had been such an out-and-out -out beauty to see her now? Yes, said Dorothy, folks change sadly, but what my master's father used to say was true. Miss Furnival, the elder sister, was handsomer than Miss Grace. Her picture is here somewhere. But if I show it you, you must never let on, even to James, that you've seen it. Can the little lady hold her tongue, think you? asked she. I was not so sure, for she was such a little, sweet, bold, open-spoken child. So I set her to hide herself, and then I helped Dorothy to turn a great picture that leaned with its face towards the wall and was not hung up as the others were. To be sure, it beat Miss Grace for beauty, and I think for scornful pride too, though in that matter it might be hard to choose. I could have looked at it an hour, but Dorothy seemed half frightened of having shown it to me, and hurried it back again, and bade me run and find Miss Rosamond, for that there were some ugly places about the house, where she should like ill for the child to go. I was a brave, high-spirited girl, and thought little of what the old woman said, for I liked hide-and-seek as well as any child in the parish, so off I ran to find my little one. As winter drew on, and the days grew shorter, I was sometimes almost certain that I heard a noise, as if someone was playing on the great organ in the hall. I did not hear it every evening, but certainly I did very often, usually when I was sitting with Miss Rosamond after I had put her to bed, and keeping quite still and silent in the bedroom, 
Then I used to hear it booming and swelling away in the distance. The first night, when I went down to my supper, I asked Dorothy who had been playing music, and James said, very shortly, that I was a gawk to take the wind soughing among the trees for music. But I saw Dorothy look at him very fearfully, and Bessie, the kitchen maid, said something beneath her breath, and went quite white. I saw they did not like my question, so I held my peace till I was with Dorothy alone, when I knew I could get a good deal out of her. So the next day I watched my time, and I coaxed and asked her who it was that played the organ, for I knew that it was the organ and not the wind well enough, for all I had kept silent before James. But Dorothy had had a lesson, I'll warrant, and never a word could I get from her. So then I tried Bessie, though I had always held my head rather above her, as I was even to James and Dorothy, and she was little better than their servant. So she said I must never tell, and if I ever told, I was never to say she had told me. But it was a very strange noise, and she had heard it many a time, but most of all on winter nights and before storms. And folks did say it was the old lord playing on the great organ in the hall, just as he used to do when he was alive. But who the old lord was, or why he played, or why he played on stormy winter evenings in particular, she either could not or would not tell me. Well, I told you I had a brave heart, and I thought it was rather pleasant to have that grand music rolling about the house, let who would be the player, for now it rose above the great gusts of wind, and wailed and triumphed, just like a living creature, and then it fell to a softness most complete. Only it was always music and tunes, so it was nonsense to call it the wind. I thought at first it might be Miss Furnival who played, unknown to Bessie, but one day, when I was in the hall by myself, I opened the organ and peeped all about it and around it, as I had done to the organ in Crossthwaite Church once before, and I saw it was all broken and destroyed inside, though it looked so brave and fine, and then, though it was noonday, my flesh began to creep a little, and I shut it up and ran away pretty quickly to my own bright nursery and I did not like hearing the music for some time after that, any more than James and Dorothy did. All this time, Miss Rosamond was making herself more and more beloved. The old ladies liked her to dine with them at their early dinner. James stood behind Miss Furnival's chair, and I behind Miss Rosamond's, all in state, and after dinner she would play about in a corner of the great drawing-room, as still as any mouse, while Miss Furnival slept, and I had my dinner in the kitchen. But she was glad enough to come to me in the nursery afterwards, for as she said, Miss Furnival was so sad, and Mrs. Stark so dull, but she and I were merry enough, and by and by I got not to care for that weird rolling music, which did one no harm, if we did not know where it came from. That winter was very cold. In the middle of October the frost began, and lasted many, many weeks. I remember, one day at dinner, Miss Furnival lifted up her sad, heavy eyes, and said to Mrs. Stark, I am afraid we shall have a terrible winter, in a strange kind of meaning way. But Mrs. Stark pretended not to hear, and talked very loud of something else. My little lady and I did not care for the frost, not we. As long as it was dry, we climbed up the steep brows, behind the house, and went up on the fells which were bleak and bare enough, and there we ran races in the fresh sharp air, and once we came down by a new path that took us past the two old gnarled holly trees which grew about halfway down by the east side of the house. But the days grew shorter and shorter, and the old lord, if it was he, played away more and more stormily and sadly on the great organ. One Sunday afternoon, it must have been towards the end of November, I asked Miss Dorothy to take charge of little Missy when she came out of the drawing-room after Miss Furnival had had her nap, for it was too cold to take her with me to church, and yet I wanted to go, and Dorothy was glad enough to promise, and was so fond of the child that all seemed well, and Bessie and I set off very briskly, though the sky hung heavy and black over the white earth, 
as if the night had never fully gone away, and the air, though still, was very biting and keen. "'We shall have a fall of snow,' said Bessie to me, and sure enough, even while we were in church, it came down thick, in great large flakes, so thick it almost darkened the windows. It had stopped snowing before we came out, but it lay soft, thick and deep beneath our feet as we tramped home. Before we got to the hall, the moon rose, and I think it was lighter then, what with the moon and what with the white dazzling snow, than it had been when we went to church between two and three o'clock. I have not told you that Miss Furnival and Mrs. Stark never went to church. They used to read the prayers together in their quiet, gloomy way. They seemed to feel the Sunday very long without their tapestry work to be busy at. So when I went to Dorothy in the kitchen to fetch Miss Rosamond and take her upstairs with me, I did not much wonder when the old woman told me that the ladies had kept the child with them and that she had never come to the kitchen as I had bidden her when she was tired of behaving pretty in the drawing-room. So I took off my things and went to find her and bring her to her supper in the nursery. But when I went into the best drawing-room, there sat the two old ladies, very still and quiet, dropping out a word now and then, but looking as if nothing so bright and merry as Miss Rosamond had ever been near them. Still, I thought she might be hiding from me. It was one of her pretty ways, and that she had persuaded them to look as if they knew nothing about her. So I went softly, peeping under this sofa and behind that chair, making believe I was sadly frightened at not finding her. "'What's the matter, Hester?' said Mrs. Stark sharply. I don't know if Miss Furnival had seen me, for as I told you, she was very deaf, and she sat quite still, idly staring into the fire with her hopeless face. "'I'm only looking for my little rosy posy,' replied I, still thinking that the child was there and near me, though I could not see her. "'Miss Rosamond is not here,' said Mrs. Stark. "'She went away more than an hour ago to find Dorothy.' and she too turned and went on looking into the fire. My heart sank at this, and I began to wish I had never left my darling. I went back to Dorothy and told her. James was gone out for the day, but she and me and Bessie took lights and went up into the nursery first, and then we roamed over the great large house, calling and entreating Miss Rosamond to come out of her hiding place and not frighten us to death in that way but there was no answer, no sound. Oh, said I at last, can she have got into the east wing and hidden there? But Dorothy said it was not possible, for that she herself had never been in there, that the doors were always locked, and my lord's steward had the keys, she believed. At any rate, neither she nor James had ever seen them. So I said I would go back and see it. After all, she was not hidden in the drawing-room unknown to the old ladies, and if I found her there, I said, I would whip her well for the fright she had given me, but I never meant to do it. Well, I went back to the west drawing-room, and I told Mrs. Stark we could not find her anywhere, and asked for leave to look all about the furniture there, for I thought now that she might have fallen asleep in some warm hidden corner. But no, we looked, Miss Furnival got up and looked, trembling all over, and she was nowhere there. Then we set off again, every one in the house, and looked in all the places we had searched before, but we could not find her. Miss Furnival shivered and shook so much that Mrs. Stark took her back into the warm drawing-room, but not before they had made me promise to bring her to them when she was found. Well a day! I began to think she never would be found when I bethought me to look into the great front court, all covered with snow. I was upstairs when I looked out, but it was such clear moonlight, I could see, quite plain, two little footprints, which might be traced from the hall door and round the corner of the east wing. I don't know how I got down, but I tugged open the great stiff hall door, and throwing the skirt of my gown over my head for a cloak, I ran out. I turned the east corner, and there a black shadow fell on the snow, but when I came again into the moonlight, 
there were the little footmarks going up, up to the fells. It was bitter cold, so cold that the air almost took the skin off my face as I ran. But I ran on, crying to think how my poor little darling must be perished and frightened. I was within sight of the holly trees when I saw a shepherd coming down the hill, bearing something in his arms, wrapped in his maud. He shouted at me and asked me if I'd lost the bairn, and when I could not speak for crying he bore towards me, and I saw my wee bairnie lying still and white and stiff in his arms, as if she had been dead. He told me he had been up the fells to gather in his sheep before the deep cold of night came on, and that under the holly trees, black marks on the hillside where no other bush was for miles around, he had found my little lady, my lamb, my queen, my darling, stiff and cold in the terrible sleep which is frost begotten. Oh, the joy and the tears of having her in my arms once again! For I would not let him carry her, but took her, more than all, into my own arms, and held her near my own warm neck and heart, and felt the life stealing slowly back again into her little gentle limbs. But she was still insensible when we reached the hall, and I had no breath for speech. We went in by the kitchen door. "'Bring the warming pan,' said I, and I carried her upstairs, and began undressing her by the nursery fire, which Bessie had kept up. I called my little Lammy all the sweet and playful names I could think of, even while my eyes were blinded by my tears, and at last, oh, at length she opened her large blue eyes. Then I put her into her warm bed, and sent Dorothy down to tell Miss Furnival that all was well, and I made up my mind to sit by my darling's bedside the live long night. She fell away into a soft sleep as soon as her pretty head had touched the pillow, and I watched by her till morning light, when she wakened up bright and clear, or so I thought at first, and my dears, so I think now. She said that she had fancied that she should like to go to Dorothy, for that both the old ladies were asleep, and it was very dull in the drawing room and that, as she was going through the west lobby, she saw the snow through the high window, falling, falling, soft and steady. But she wanted to see it lying pretty and white on the ground, so she made her way into the great hall, and then, going to the window, she saw it bright and soft upon the drive. But while she stood there, she saw a little girl, not so old as she was. But so pretty, said my darling, and this little girl beckoned to me to come out, and oh, she was so pretty and so sweet, I could not choose but go. And then this other little girl had taken her by the hand, and side by side the two had gone round the east corner. Now you are a naughty little girl and telling stories, said I. What would your good mamma that is in heaven and never told a story in her life say to her little Rosamond if she heard her? and I dare say she does, telling stories. Indeed, Hester, sobbed out my child, I'm telling you true, indeed I am. Don't tell me, said I, very stern, I tracked you by your footmarks through the snow, they were only yours to be seen, and if you had had a little girl to go hand in hand with you up the hill, don't you think the footprints would have gone along with yours? I can't help it, dear, dear Hester, said she, crying, if they did not. I never looked at her feet, but she held my hand fast and tight in her little one, and it was very, very cold. She took me up the fell path, up to the holly trees, and there I saw a lady weeping and crying. But when she saw me, she hushed her weeping, and smiled very proud and grand, and took me on her knee, and began to lull me to sleep. And that's all, Hester. But that is true. "'And my dear mamma knows it is,' said she, crying. "'So I thought the child was in a fever, "'and pretended to believe her as she went over her story, "'over and over again, and always the same. "'At last, Dorothy knocked at the door with Miss Rosamond's breakfast, "'and she told me the old ladies were down in the eating parlour "'and that they wanted to speak to me. "'They had both been into the night nursery the evening before,' but it was after Miss Rosamond was asleep, 
so they had only looked at her and not asked me any questions. I shall catch it, thought I to myself as I went along the north gallery. And yet, I thought, taking courage, it was in their charge I left her, and it's they that's to blame for letting her steal away unknown and unwatched. So I went in boldly and told my story. I told it all to Miss Furnival, shouting it close to her ear. But when I came to the mention of the other little girl out in the snow, coaxing and tempting her out, and willing her up to the grand and beautiful lady by the holly tree, she threw her arms up, her old and withered arms, and cried aloud, Oh, heaven forgive, have mercy. Mrs. Stark took hold of her, roughly enough, I thought, but she was past Mrs. Stark's management and spoke to me in a kind of wild warning and authority. Esther, keep her from that child. It will lure her to her death, that evil child. Tell her it's a wicked, naughty child. Then Mrs. Stark hurried me out of the room, where, indeed, I was glad enough to go. But Miss Furnival kept shrieking out, Oh, have mercy, wilt thou never forgive? It is many a long year ago. I was very uneasy in my mind after that. I durst never leave Miss Rosamond, night or day, for fear lest she might slip off again, after some fancy or other, and all the more because I thought I could make out that Miss Furnival was crazy from their odd ways about her, and I was afraid lest something of the same kind, which might be in the family, you know, hung over my darling, and the great frost never ceased all this time, and whenever it was a more stormy night than usual, between the gusts and through the wind, we heard the old lord playing on the great organ. But old lord or not, wherever Miss Rosamond went, there I followed, for my love for her, pretty, helpless orphan, was stronger than my fear for the grand and terrible sound. Besides, it rested with me to keep her cheerful and merry, as beseemed her age. So we played together and wandered together here and there and everywhere, for I never dared to lose sight of her again in that large and rambling house. And so it happened that one afternoon, not long before Christmas Day, we were playing together on the billiard table in the great hall. Not that we knew the right way of playing, but she liked to roll the smooth ivory balls with her pretty hands, and I liked to do whatever she did and by and by, without our noticing it, it grew dusk indoors, and though it was still light in the open air, and I was thinking of taking her back into the nursery, when all of a sudden she cried out, Look, Esther, look, there is my poor little girl out in the snow. I turned towards the long narrow windows, and there, sure enough, I saw a little girl, less than my Miss Rosamond, dressed all unfit to be out of doors, such a bitter night, crying and beating against the window panes as if she wanted to be let in. She seemed to sob and wail till Miss Rosamond could bear it no longer and was flying to the door to open it, when all of a sudden and close upon us the great organ pealed out so loud and thundering it fairly made me tremble. And all the more when I remembered me that, even in the stillness of that dead cold weather, I had heard no sound of little battering hands upon the window-glass, although the phantom child had seemed to put forth all its force. And although I had seen it wail and cry, no faintest touch of sound had fallen upon my ears. Whether I remembered all this at the very moment, I do not know. The great organ sound had so stunned me into terror. But this I know. I caught up Miss Rosamond before she got the hall door opened, and clutched her, and carried her away, kicking and screaming, into the large bright kitchen, where Dorothy and Agnes were busy with their mince pies. "'What is the matter with my sweet one?' cried Dorothy, as I bore in Miss Rosamond, who was sobbing as if her heart would break. "'She won't let me open the door for my little girl to come in, and she'll die if she's out on the fells all night. Cruel, naughty Hester,' she said, slapping me. But she might have struck harder, for I had seen a look of ghastly terror on Dorothy's face, which made my very blood run cold. "'Shut the back kitchen door fast and bolt it well,' said she to Agnes. She said no more, 
she gave me raisins and almonds to quiet miss rosamond but she sobbed about the little girl in the snow and would not touch any of the good things i was thankful when she cried herself to sleep in bed then i stole down to the kitchen and told dorothy i had made up my mind i would carry my darling back to my father's house in applethwaite where if we lived humbly we lived at peace i said i had been frightened enough with the old lord's organ playing but now that i had seen for myself this little moaning child all decked out as no child in the neighbourhood could be beating and battering to get in yet always without any sound or noise with the dark wound on its right shoulder and that miss rosamond had known it again for the phantom that had nearly lured her to her death which dorothy knew was true i would stand it no longer i saw dorothy change colour once or twice when i'd done she told me that she did not think i could take miss rosamond with me for that she was my lord's ward and i had no right over her and she asked me would i leave the child that i was so fond of just for sounds and sights that could do me no harm and that they had all had to get used to in their turns i was all in a hot trembling passion and i said it was very well for her to talk that knew what these sights and noises betokened and that had perhaps had something to do with the spectre child while it was alive and i taunted her so that she told me all she knew at last and then i wished i had never been told for it only made me more afraid than ever she said she had heard the tale from old neighbours that were alive when she was first married when folks used to come to the hall sometimes before it had got such a bad name on the countryside it might not be true or it might what she had been told the old lord was miss furnival's father miss grace as dorothy called her for miss maud was the elder and miss furnival by rights the old lord was eaten up with pride such a proud man was never seen or heard of and his daughters were like him no one was good enough to wed them although they had choice enough for they were the great beauties of their day as i had seen by their portraits where they hung in the state drawing-room but as the old saying is pride will have a fall and these two haughty beauties fell in love with the same man and he no better than a foreign musician whom their father had down from london to play music with him at the manor house for above all things next to his pride the old lord loved music he could play on nearly every instrument that was ever heard of and it was a strange thing it did not soften him but he was a fierce dour old man and had broken his poor wife's heart with his cruelty they said he was mad after music and would pay any money for it so he got this foreigner to come who made such beautiful music that they said the very birds on the trees stopped their singing to listen and by degrees this foreign gentleman got such a hold over the old lord that nothing would serve him but that he must come every year and it was he that had the great organ brought from holland and built up in the hall where it stood now he taught the old lord to play on it but many and many a time when lord furnival was thinking of nothing but his fine organ and his finer music the dark foreigner was walking abroad in the woods with one of the young ladies now miss maud and then miss grace miss maud won the day and carried off the prize such as it was and he and she were married all unknown to any one and before he made his next yearly visit she had been confined of a little girl at a farmhouse on the moors while her father and miss grace thought she was away at doncaster races but though she was a wife and a mother she was not a bit softened but as haughty and as passionate as ever and perhaps more so for she was jealous of miss grace to whom her foreign husband paid a deal of court by way of blinding her as he told his wife but miss grace triumphed over miss maud and miss maud grew fiercer and fiercer both with her husband and with her sister and the former who could easily shake off what was disagreeable and hide himself in foreign countries went away a month before his usual time that summer and half threatened that he would never come back again meanwhile 
the little girl was left at the farmhouse and her mother used to have her horse saddled and gallop wildly over the hills to see her once every week at the very least for where she loved she loved and where she hated she hated and the old lord went on playing playing on his organ and the servants thought the sweet music he made had soothed down his awful temper of which dorothy said some terrible tales could be told he grew infirm too and had to walk with a crutch and his son that was the present lord furnival's father was with the army in america and the other son at sea so miss maud had it pretty much her own way and she and miss grace grew colder and bitterer to each other every day till at last they hardly ever spoke except when the old lord was by the foreign musician came again the next summer but it was for the last time for they led him such a life with their jealousy and their passions that he grew weary and went away and never was heard of again and miss maud who had always meant to have her marriage acknowledged when her father should be dead was left now a deserted wife whom nobody knew to have been married with a child that she dared not own although she loved it to distraction living with a father whom she feared and a sister whom she hated when the next summer passed over and the dark foreigner never came both miss maud and miss grace grew gloomy and sad they had a haggard look about them though they looked handsome as ever but by and by miss maud brightened for her father grew more and more infirm and more than ever carried away by his music and she and miss grace lived almost entirely apart having separate rooms the one on the west side miss maud on the east those very rooms which were now shut up so she thought she might have a little girl with her and no one need ever know except those who dared not speak about it and were bound to believe that it was as she said a cottager's child she had taken a fancy to all this dorothy said was pretty well known but what came afterwards no one knew except miss grace and mrs stark who was even then her maid and much more of a friend to her than ever her sister had been but the servants supposed from words that were dropped that miss maud had triumphed over miss grace and told her that all the time the dark foreigner had been mocking her with pretended love he was her own husband the colour left miss grace's cheek and lips that very day for ever and she was heard to say many a time that sooner or later she would have her revenge and mrs stark was forever spying about the east rooms one fearful night just after the new year had come in when the snow was lying thick and deep and the flakes were still falling fast enough to blind anyone who might be out and abroad there was a great and violent noise heard and the old lord's voice above all cursing and swearing awfully and the cries of a little child and the proud defiance of a fierce woman and the sound of a blow and a dead stillness and moans and wailings dying away on the hillside then the old lord summoned all his servants and told them with terrible oaths and words more terrible that his daughter had disgraced herself and that he had turned her out of doors her and her child and that if ever they gave her help or food or shelter he prayed that they might never enter heaven and all the while miss grace stood by him white and still as any stone and when he had ended she heaved a great sigh as much as to say her work was done and her end was accomplished but the old lord never touched his organ again and died within the year and no wonder for on the morrow of that wild and fearful night the shepherds coming down the fell side found miss maud sitting all crazy and smiling under the holly trees nursing a dead child with a terrible mark on its right shoulder but that was not what killed it said dorothy it was the frost and the cold every wild creature was in its hole and every beast in its fold while the child and its mother were turned out to wander on the fells and now you know all and I wonder if you are less frightened now. I was more frightened than ever, but I said I was not. 
I wished Miss Rosamond and myself well out of that dreadful house for ever, but I would not leave her, and I dared not take her away. But oh, how I watched her and guarded her! We bolted the doors and shut the window shutters fast, an hour or more before dark, rather than leave them open five minutes too late. But my little lady still heard the weird child crying and mourning, and not all we could do or say could keep her from wanting to go to her and let her in from the cruel wind and the snow. All this time I kept away from Miss Furnival and Miss Stark as much as ever I could, for I feared them. I knew no good could be about them, with their grey hard faces and their dreamy eyes, looking back into the ghastly years that were gone. But even in my fear I had a kind of pity, for Miss Furnival at least. Those gone down to the pit can hardly have a more hopeless look than that which was ever on her face. At last I even got so sorry for her, who never said a word but what was quite forced from her, that I prayed for her. And I taught Miss Rosamond to pray for one who had done a deadly sin, but often when she came to those words she would listen and start up from her knees and say, I hear my little girl, plaining and crying very sad. Oh, let her in or she will die. One night, just after New Year's Day had come at last, and the long winter had taken a turn as I hoped, I heard the west drawing-room bell ring three times, which was the signal for me. I would not leave Miss Rosamond alone, for all she was asleep, for the old lord had been playing wilder than ever, and I feared lest my darling should waken to hear the spectre-child. See her I knew she could not, I had fastened the windows too well for that, so I took her out of her bed and wrapped her up in such outer clothes as were most handy, and carried her down to the drawing-room, where the old ladies sat at their tapestry work as usual. They looked up when I came in, and Mrs. Stark asked, quite astounded, why did I bring Miss Rosamond there out of her warm bed? I had begun to whisper, because I was afraid of her being tempted out while I was away by the wild child in the snow, when she stopped me short, with a glance at Miss Furnival, and said Miss Furnival wanted me to undo some work she had done wrong, and which neither of them could see to unpick. So I laid my pretty dear on the sofa, and sat down on a stool by them, and hardened my heart against them, as I heard the wind rising and howling. Miss Rosamond slept on sound, for all the wind blew so, and Miss Furnival said never a word, nor looked round when the gusts shook the windows. All at once she started up to her full height, and put up one hand, as if to bid us listen. I hear voices, said she, I hear terrible screams, I hear my father's voice. Just at that moment my darling wakened with a sudden start. My little girl is crying. Oh, how she's crying. And she tried to get up and go to her. But she got her feet entangled in the blanket, and I caught her up, for my flesh had begun to creep at these noises, which they heard while we could catch no sound. In a minute or two, the noises came and gathered fast, and filled our ears. We too heard voices and screams, and no longer heard the winter's wind that raged abroad. Mrs. Stark looked at me, and I at her, but we dared not speak. Suddenly, Miss Furnival went towards the door, out into the ante-room through the west lobby, and opened the door into the great hall. Mrs. Stark followed, and I durst not be left, though my heart almost stopped beating for fear. I wrapped my darling tight in my arms and went out with them. In the hall the screams were louder than ever. They sounded to come from the east wing, nearer and nearer, close on the other side of the locked-up doors, close behind them. Then I noticed that the great bronze chandelier seemed all alight, though the hall was dim, and that a fire was blazing in the vast hearth-place, though it gave no heat, and I shuddered up with terror and folded my darling closer to me but as I did so the east door shook, and she, suddenly struggling to get free from me, cried, Esther, I must go, my little girl is there, I hear her, she's coming, Esther, I must go. 
I held her tight with all my strength. With a set will I held her. If I had died, my hands would have grasped her still. I was so resolved in my mind. Miss Furnival stood listening, and paid no regard to my darling, who had got down to the ground, and whom I, upon my knees now, was holding with both my arms clasped round her neck, she still striving and crying to get free. All at once the east door gave way with a thundering crash, as if torn open in a violent passion, and there came into that broad and mysterious light the figure of a tall old man with grey hair and gleaming eyes. He drove before him with many a relentless gesture of abhorrence, a stern and beautiful woman with a little child clinging to her dress. "'Oh, Hester, Hester!' cried Miss Rosamond. "'It's the lady, the lady below the holly trees, and my little girl is with her. Hester, Hester, let me go to her. They're drawing me to them. I feel them, I feel them. I must go, I must go.' Again she was almost convulsed by her efforts to get away, but I held her tighter and tighter, till I feared I should do her a hurt, but rather that than let her go towards those terrible phantoms. They passed along towards the great hall door, where the winds howled and ravened for their prey, but before they reached that the lady turned, and I could see that she defied the old man with a fierce and proud defiance. But then she quailed, and then she threw up her arms, wildly and piteously to save her child, her little child, from a blow from his uplifted crutch. And Miss Rosamond was torn, as by a power stronger than mine, and writhed in my arms and sobbed, for this time the poor darling was growing faint. They want me to go with them, on to the fells, they are drawing me to them. Oh, my little girl, I would come, but cruel, wicked Hester holds me very tight. But when she saw the uplifted crutch, she swooned away, and I thanked God for it. Just at this moment, when the tall old man, his hair streaming as in the blast of a furnace, was going to strike the little shrinking child, Miss Furnival, the old woman by my side, cried out, Oh, father, father! spare the little innocent child but just then i saw we all saw another phantom shape itself and grow clear out of the blue and misty lights that filled the hall we had not seen her till now for it was another lady who stood by the old man with a look of relentless hate and triumphant scorn that figure was very beautiful to look upon with a soft white hat drawn over the proud brows and a red curling lip it was dressed in an open robe of blue satin. I had seen that figure before. It was the likeness of Miss Furnival in her youth, and the terrible phantoms moved on, regardless of old Miss Furnival's wild entreaty. And the uplifted dim lights, and the fire that gave no heat, went out of themselves, and Miss Furnival lay at our feet, stricken down by the palsy, death-stricken. Yes, she was carried to her bed that night, never to rise again. She lay with her face to the wall, muttering low, but muttering always. Alas, alas, what is done in youth can never be undone in age. End of the Old Nurse's Story by Elizabeth Gaskell Read by Phil Benson Cumberland Sheep Shearers by Elizabeth Gaskell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, number 148, 22nd of January, 1853. Three or four years ago, we spent part of a summer in one of the dales in the neighbourhood of Keswick. We lodged at the house of a small statesman, who added to his occupation of a sheep farmer 
that of a woollen manufacturer. His own flock was not large, but he bought up other people's fleeces, either on commission or for his own purposes, and his life seemed to unite many pleasant and various modes of employment. And the great jolly burly man throve upon all, both in body and mind. One day his handsome wife proposed to us that we should accompany her to a distant sheep-shearing to be held at the house of one of her husband's customers, where she was sure we should be heartily welcome, and where we should see an old-fashioned shearing, such as was not often met with now in the dales. I don't know why it was, but we were lazy and declined her invitation. It might be that the day was a broiling one, even for July, or it might be a fit of shyness, but whichever was the reason, it very unaccountably vanished soon after she was gone, and the opportunity seemed to have slipped through our fingers. The day was hotter than ever, and we should have twice as much reason to be shy and self-conscious, now that we should not have our hostess to introduce and chaperone us. However, so great was our wish to go, that we blew these obstacles to the winds, if there were any that day, and obtaining the requisite directions from the farm servant, we set out on our five-mile walk about one o'clock on a cloudless day in the first half of July. Our party consisted of two grown-up persons and four children, the youngest almost a baby, who had to be carried the greater part of that weary length of way. We passed through Keswick and saw the groups of sketching, boating tourists, on whom we, as residents for a month in the neighbourhood, looked down with some contempt as mere strangers, who were sure to go about blundering or losing their way, or being imposed upon by guides, or admiring the wrong things, and never seeing the right things. After we had dragged ourselves through the long straggling town, we came to a part of the highway where it wound between copses, sufficiently high to make a green gloom in a green shade. The branches touched and interlaced overhead, while the road was so straight that all the quarter of an hour that we were walking, we could see the opening of blue light at the other end, and note the quivering of the heated luminous air beyond the dense shade in which we moved. Every now and then we caught glimpses of the silver lake that shimmered through the trees, and now and then, in the dead noontide stillness, we could hear the gentle lapping of the water on the pebbled shore, the only sound we heard, except the low deep hum of myriads of insects revelling out their summer lives. We had all agreed that talking made us hotter, so we and the birds were very silent. Out again into the hot, bright, sunny, dazzling road, the fierce sun above our heads made us long to be at home, but we had passed the half-way, and to go on was shorter than to return. Now we left the highway, and began to mount. The ascent looked disheartening, but at almost every step we gained increased freshness of air, and the crisp, short mountain grass was soft and cool in comparison with the high road. The little wandering breezes, that came every now and then athwart us, were laden with fragrant scents, now of wild thyme, now of the little scrambling, creeping white rose, which ran along the ground and pricked our feet with its sharp thorns. And now we came to a trickling streamlet, on whose spongy banks grew great bushes of the bog myrtle, giving a spicy odour to the air. When our breath failed us during that steep ascent, we had one invariable dodge by which we hoped to escape the fat and scant of breath quotation. We turned round and admired the lovely views, which from each succeeding elevation became more and more beautiful. At last, perched on a level which seemed nothing more than a mere shelf of rock, we saw our destined haven, a grey stone farmhouse high over our heads, high above the lake as we were, with outbuildings enough around it to justify the Scotch name of a town, and near it one of those great bossy sycamores, so common in similar situations all through Cumberland and Westmoreland. 
one more long tug, and then we should be there. So cheering the poor, tired little ones, we set off bravely for that last piece of steep, rocky path and we never looked behind till we stood in the coolness of the deep porch, looking down from our natural terrace on the glassy Derwent water far, far below, reflecting each tint of the blue sky, only in darker, fuller colours every one. We seemed on a level with the top of Cat Bell, and the tops of great trees lay deep down, so deep that we felt as if they were close enough together and solid enough to bear our feet if we chose to spring down and walk upon them. Right in front of where we stood, there was a ledge of the rocky field that surrounded the house. We had knocked at the door, but it was evident that we were unheard in the din and merry clatter of voices within, and our original shyness returned. By and by, someone found us out, and a hearty burst of hospitable welcome ensued. Our coming was all right. It was understood in a minute who we were. Our real hostess was hardly less urgent in her civilities than our temporary hostess, and both together bustled us out of the room upon which the outer door entered, into a large bedroom which opened out of it. The state apartment in all such houses in Cumberland, where the children make their first appearance, and where the heads of the household lie down to die, if the great conqueror gives them sufficient warning for such decent and composed submission, as is best in accordance with the simple dignity of their lives. Into this chamber we were ushered, and the immediate relief from its dark coolness to our overheated bodies and dazzled eyes was inexpressibly refreshing. The walls were so thick that there was room for a very comfortable window seat in them, without there being any projection into the room, and the long, low shape prevented the skyline from being unusually depressed, even at that height. And so the light was subdued, and the general tint through the room deepened into darkness, where the eye fell on that stupendous bed, with its posts and its headpiece, and its footboard and its trappings of all kinds of the deepest brown, and the frame itself looked large enough for six or seven people to lie comfortably therein, without even touching each other. In the hearth place stood a great pitcher, filled with branches of odorous mountain flowers, and little bits of rosemary and lavender were strewed about the room, partly, as I afterwards learnt, to prevent incautious feet from slipping about on the polished oak floor. When we had noticed everything, and rested, and cooled, as much as we could do before the equinox, we returned to the company assembled in the house-place. This house-place was almost a hall in grandeur. Along one side ran an oaken dresser, all decked with the same sweet evergreens, fragments of which strewed the bedroom floor. Over this dresser were shelves, bright with the most exquisitely polished pewter. Opposite to the bedroom door was the great hospitable fireplace, ensconced within its proper chimney corners, and having the master's cupboard on its right-hand side. Do you know what a master's cupboard is? Mr. Wordsworth could have told you, aye, and have shown you one at Rydal Mount, too. It is a cupboard about a foot in width and a foot and a half in breadth, expressly reserved for the use of the master of the household. Here he may keep pipe and tankard, almanac and what not, and although no door bars the access of any hand, in this open cupboard his peculiar properties rest secure, for is it not the master's cupboard? There was a fire in the house-place, even on this hot day. It gave a grace and a vividness to the room, and being kept within proper limits, it seemed no more than was requisite to boil the kettle. For, I should say, that the very minute of our arrival, our hostess, so I shall designate the wife of the farmer at whose house the sheep-shearing was to be held, proposed tea, and although we had not dined, for it was but little past three, yet, on the principle of do at Rome as the Romans do, we assented with a good grace, thankful to have any refreshment offered us, 
short of water gruel after our long and tiring walk and rather afraid of our children cooling too quickly while the tea was preparing and it took six comely matrons to do it justice we proposed to mrs c our real hostess that we should go and see the sheep shearing she accordingly led us away into a back yard where the process was going on by a back yard i mean a far different place from what a londoner would so designate our back yard high up on the mountain side was a space about forty yards by twenty overshadowed by the noble sycamore which might have been the very one that suggested to coleridge this sycamore oft musical with bees such tents the patriarchs loved etc etc and in this deep cool green shadow sat two or three grey-haired sires smoking their pipes and regarding the proceedings with a placid complacency which had a savour of contempt in it for the degeneracy of the present times a sort of ah they don't know what good shearing is nowadays look in it that round shadow of the sycamore tree and the elders who sat there looking on were the only things not full of motion and life in the yard the yard itself was bounded by a grey stone wall and the moors rose above it to the mountain top we looked over the low walls on to the spaces bright with the yellow asphodel and the first flush of the purple heather the shadow of the farmhouse fell over this yard so that it was cool in aspect save for the ruddy faces of the eager shearers and the gay coloured linsey petticoats of the women folding the fleeces with tucked up gowns when we went first into the yard every corner of it seemed as full of motion as an antique frieze and like that had to be studied before i could ascertain the different actions and purposes involved on the left hand was a walled-in field of small extent full of sunshine and light with the heated air quivering over the flocks of panting bewildered sheep who were penned up therein awaiting their turn to be shorn at the gate by which this field was entered from the yard stood a group of eager-eyed boys panting like the sheep but not like them from fear but from excitement and joyous exertion their faces were flushed with brown crimson their scarlet lips were parted into smiles and their eyes had that peculiar blue lustre in them which is only gained by a free life in the pure and blithesome air as soon as these lads saw that a sheep was wanted by the shearers within they sprang towards one in the field the more boisterous and stubborn an old ram the better and tugging and pulling and pushing and shouting sometimes mounting astride of the poor obstreperous brute and holding his horns like a bridle they gained their point and dragged their captive up to the shearer like little victors as they were all glowing and ruddy with conquest the shearers sat each astride a long bench grave and important the heroes of the day the flock of sheep to be shorn on this occasion consisted of more than a thousand and eleven famous shearers had come walking in from many miles distance to try their skill one against the other for sheep shearings of a sort of rural olympics they were all young men in their prime strong and well made without coat or waistcoat and with upturned shirt sleeves they sat each across a long bench or narrow table and caught up the sheep from the attendant boys who had dragged it in they lifted it on to the bench and placing it by a dexterous knack on its back they began to shear the wool off the tail and under parts then they tied the two hind legs and the two forelegs together and laid it first on one side and then on the other till the fleece came off in one whole piece the art was to shear all the wool off and yet not to injure the sheep by any awkward cut if such an accident did occur a mixture of tar and butter was immediately applied but every wound was a blemish on the shearer's fame 
to shear well and completely and yet to do it quickly shows the perfection of the clippers some can finish off as many as six score sheep on a summer's day and if you consider the weight and uncouthness of the animal and the general heat of the weather you will see that with justice clipping or shearing is regarded as harder work than mowing but most good shearers are content with dispatching four or five score it is only on unusual occasions or when greek meets greek that six score are attempted or accomplished when the sheep is divided into its fleece and itself it becomes the property of two persons the women seize the fleece and standing by the side of a temporary dresser in this case made of planks laid across barrels beneath what sharp scant shadow could be obtained from the eaves of the house they fold it up this again is an art simple as it may seem and the farmers wives and daughters about langdale head are famous for it they begin with folding up the legs and then roll the whole fleece up tying it with the neck and the skill consists not merely in doing this quickly and firmly but in certain artistic pulls of the wool so as to display the finer parts and not by crushing up the fibre to make it appear coarse to the buyer six comely women were thus employed they laughed and talked and sent shafts of merry satire at the grave and busy shearers who were too earnest in their work to reply although an occasional deepening of colour or twinkle of the eye would tell that the remark had hit but they reserved their retorts if they had any until the evening when the day's labour would be over and when in the licence of country humour i imagine some of the saucy speakers would meet with their match as yet the applause came from their own party of women though now and then one of the old men sitting under the shade of a sycamore would take his pipe out of his mouth to spit and before beginning again to send up the softly curling white wreaths of smoke he would condescend on a short deep laugh and a well done maggie give it him lass for with the not unkindly jealousy of age towards youth the old grandfathers invariably took part with the women against the young men these sheared on throwing the fleeces to the folders and casting the sheep down on the ground with gentle strength ready for another troop of boys to haul it to the right-hand side of the farmyard where the great outbuildings were placed where all sorts of country vehicles were crammed and piled and seemed to throw up their scarlet shafts into the air as if imploring relief from the crowd of chandries and market carts that pressed upon them out of the sun in the dark shadow of the cart house a pan of red hot coals glowed in a trivet and upon them was placed an iron basin holding tar and raddle or ruddle hither the right-hand troop of boys dragged the poor naked sheep to be smitten that is to say marked with the initials or cipher of the owner in this case the sign of the possessor was a circle or spot on one side and a straight line on the other and after the sheep were thus marked they were turned out on to the moor and the crowd of bleating lambs that sent up an incessant moan for their lost mothers each found out the ewe to which it belonged the moment she was turned out of the yard and the placid contentment of the sheep that wandered away up the hillside with their little lambs trotting by them gave just the necessary touch of peace and repose to the scene there were all the classical elements for the representation of life there were the old men and maidens young men and children of the psalmist there were all the stages and conditions of being that sing forth their farewell to the departing crusaders in the saint's tragedy we were very glad indeed that we had seen the sheep shearing though the road had been hot and long and dusty and we were as yet unrefreshed and hungry when we had understood the separate actions of the busy scene we could begin to notice individuals i soon picked out a very beautiful young woman as an object of admiration and interest 
she stood by a buxom woman of middle age who had just sufficient likeness to point her out as the mother both were folding fleeces and folding them well but the mother talked all the time with a rich toned voice and a merry laugh and eye while the daughter hung her head silently over her work and i could only guess at the beauty of her eyes by the dark sweeping shadow of her eyelashes she was well dressed and had evidently got on her sunday gown although a good deal for the honour of the thing as the flowing skirt was tucked up in a bunch behind in order to be out of her way beneath the gown and far more conspicuous and probably far prettier was a striped petticoat of full deep blue and scarlet revealing the blue cotton stockings common in that part of the country and the pretty neat leather shoes the girl had tucked her brown hair back behind her eyes but if she had known how often she would have had occasion to blush i think she would have kept that natural veil more over her delicate cheek she blushed deeper and ever deeper because one of the shearers in every interval of his work looked at her and sighed neither of them spoke a word though both were as conscious of the other as could be and the bucks and mother with a sidelong glance took cognizance of the affair from time to time with no unpleased expression i had got thus far in my career of observation when our hostess for the day came to tell us that tea was ready and we arose stiffly from the sward on which we had been sitting and went indoors to the house place there all round were ranged rows of sedate matrons some with babies some without they had been summoned from over mountains and beyond wild fells and across deep dales to the shearing of that day just as their ancestors were called out by the fiery cross we were conducted to a tea-table at which in spite of our entreaties no one would sit down except our hostess who poured out tea of which more by and by behind us on the dresser were plates piled up with berry cake puff paste with gooseberries inside currant and plain bread and butter hot cakes buttered with honey if that is not irish and great pieces of new cheese to be put in between the honeyed slices and so toasted impromptu there were two black teapots on the tray and taking one of these in her left hand and one in her right our hostess held them up both on high and skilfully poured from each into one and the same cup the teapots contained green and black tea and this was her way of mixing them which she considered far better she told us than if both the leaves had been masked together the cups of tea were dosed with lump upon lump of the finest sugar but the rich yellow fragrant cream was dropped in but very sparingly i reserved many of my inquiries suggested by this dale tea drinking to be answered by mrs c with whom we were lodging and i asked her why i could neither get cream enough for myself nor milk sufficient for the children when both were evidently so abundant and our entertainers so profusely hospitable she told me that my request for each was set down to modesty and a desire to spare the grocer's stuff which as costing money was considered the proper thing to force upon visitors while the farm produce was reckoned too common and every day for such a choice festivity and such honoured guests so i drank tea as strong as brandy and as sweet as syrup and had to moan in secret over my children's nerves my children found something else to moan over before the meal was ended the good farmer's wife would give them each sweet butter on their oat cake or clapbread and sweet butter is made of butter sugar and rum melted together and potted and is altogether the most nauseous compound in the shape of a dainty i ever tasted my poor children thought it so as i could tell by their glistening piteous eyes and trembling lips as they vainly tried to get through what their stomachs rejected i got it from them by stealth and ate it myself in order to spare the feelings of our hostess who evidently considered it as a choice delicacy 
but no sooner did she perceive that they were without sweet butter than she urged them to take some more and bade me not to scrimp it for they had enough and to spare for everybody this sweet butter is made for express occasions the clippings and christmas and for these two seasons all christenings in a family are generally reserved when we had eaten and eaten and hungry as we were we found it difficult to come up to our hostess's ideas of the duty before us she took me into the real working kitchen to show me the preparations going on for the refreshment of the seventy people there and then assembled rounds of beef hams fillets of veal and legs of mutton bobbed indiscriminately with with plum puddings up and down in a great boiler from which a steam arose when she lifted up the lid reminding one exceedingly of camacho's wedding the resemblance was increased when we were shown another boiler out of doors placed over a temporary framework of brick and equally full with the other if indeed not more so just at this moment as she and i stood on the remote side of the farm buildings within sound of all the pleasant noises which told of merry life so near and yet out of sight of any of them gazing forth on the moorland and the rocks and the purple crest of the mountain the opposite base of which fell into wattenlath the gate of the yard was opened and my rustic beauty came rushing in her face all afire when she saw us she stopped suddenly and was about to turn when she was followed and the entrance blocked up by the handsome young shearer i saw a knowing look on my companion's face as she quietly led me out by another way who is that handsome girl asked i it's just isabel crossthwaite she replied her mother is a cousin of my master's widow of a statesman near appleby she is well to do and isabel is her only child heiress as well as beauty thought i but all I said was, And who is the young man with her? That, said she, looking up at me with surprise, that's our Tom. You see, his father and me and Margaret Crosthwaite have fixed that these young ones are to wed each other, and Tom is very willing, but she is young and skittish. But she'll come too. She'll come too. He'll not be the best shearer this day, anyhow as he was last year down in buttermere but he'll maybe come round for next year so spoke middle age of the passionate loves of the young i could fancy that isabel might resent being so calmly disposed of and i did not like or admire her the less because by and by she plunged into the very midst of the circle of matrons as if in the eleusinian circle she could alone obtain a sanctuary against her lover's pursuit she looked so much and so truly annoyed that i disliked her mother and thought the young man unworthy of her until i saw the mother come and take into her arms a little orphan child whom i learnt she had bought from a beggar on the roadside that was ill-using her this child hung about the woman and called her mammy in such pretty trusting tones that i became reconciled to the matchmaking widow for the sake of her warm heart and as for the young man the woe-begone face that he presented from time to time at the open door to be scouted and scolded thence by all the women while isabel resolutely turned her back upon him and pretended to be very busy cutting bread and butter made me really sorry for him experienced spectators could see the end of all this coyness and blushing as well as if we were in church at the wedding from four to five o'clock on a summer's day is a sort of second noon for heat and now that we were up on this breezy height it seemed so disagreeable to think of going once more into the close woods down below and to brave the parched and dusty road that we gladly and lazily resigned ourselves to stay a little later and to make our jolly three o'clock tea serve for dinner so i strolled into the busy yard once more and by watching my opportunity i crossed between men women boys sheep and barking dogs and got to an old man sitting under the sycamore who had been pointed out to me as the owner of the sheep and the farm 
For a few minutes he went on, doggedly puffing away, but I knew that this reserve on his part arose from no want of friendliness, but from the shy reserve which is the characteristic of most Westmoreland and Cumberland people. By and by he began to talk, and he gave me much information about his sheep. He took a walk from a landowner with so many sheep upon it, in his case one thousand and fifty, which was a large number, about six hundred being the average. Before taking the walk, he and his landlord each appointed two knowledgeable people to value the stock. The walk was taken on lease of five or seven years, and extended ten miles over the fells in one direction. He could not exactly say how far in another, but more, yes, certainly more. At the expiration of the lease, the stock are again numbered and valued in the same way. If the sheep are poorer and gone off, the tenant has to pay for their depreciation in money. If they have improved in quality, the landlord pays him, but one way or another the same number must be restored, while the increase of each year and the annual fleeces form the tenant's profit. Of course they were all of the black-faced or mountain breed, fit for scrambling and endurance, and capable of being nourished by the sweet but scanty grass that grew on the fells. To take charge of his flock he employed three shepherds, one of whom was my friend Tom. They had other work down on the farm, for the farm was down compared with the airy heights to which these sheep will scramble. The shepherd's year begins before the 20th of March, by which time the ewes must be all safely down in the home pastures, at hand in case they or their lambs require extra care at yeaning time. About the 16th of June, the sheep washing begins. Formerly, said my old man, men stood bare-legged in a running stream, dammed up so as to make a pool which was more cleansing than any still water, with its continual foam and fret, and struggled to overcome the obstacle that impeded its progress. And these men caught the sheep, which were hurled to them by the people on the banks, and rubbed it and soused it well. But now, alas, for these degenerate days, folk were content to throw them in head downwards, and thought that they were washed enough, with swimming to the bank. However, this proceeding was managed in a fortnight after the shearing or clipping came on, and people were hidden to it from twenty miles off or better, but not as they had been fifty years ago. Still, if a family possessed a skilful shearer in the person of a son, or if the good wife could fold fleeces well and deftly, they were sure of a gay week in clipping time, passing from farm to farm in merry succession, giving their aid, feasting on the fat of the land, sweet butter, amongst other things, and much good may it do them, until they in their turn called upon their neighbours for help. In short, good old-fashioned sheep shearings are carried on much in the same sort of way as an American bee. As soon as the clipping is over, the sheep are turned out upon the fells, where their greatest enemy is the fly. The ravens do harm to the young lambs in May and June, and the shepherds scale the steep grey rocks to take a raven's nest with infinite zest and delight. But no shepherd can save his sheep from the terrible fly, the common flesh fly, which burrows in the poor animal and lays its obscene eggs, and the maggots eat it up alive. To obviate this as much as ever they can, the shepherds go up on the fells about twice a week in summer time, and, sending out their faithful dogs, collect the sheep into great circles. The dogs running on the outside, and keeping them in. The quick-eyed shepherd stands in the midst, and if a sheep make an effort to scratch herself, the dog is summoned, and the infected sheep brought up to be examined, the piece cut out and salved. But notwithstanding this, in some summers scores of sheep are killed in this way. Thundery and close weather is particularly productive of this plague. The next operation which the shepherd has to attend to 
is about the middle or end of October, when the sheep are brought down to be salved, and an extra man is usually hired on the farm for this week. But it is no feasting or merrymaking time like a clipping. Sober business reigns. The men sit astride on their benches, and besmear the poor helpless beast with a mixture of tar and bad butter, or coarse grease, which is supposed to promote the growth and fineness of the wool, by preventing skin diseases of all kinds, such as would leave a patch bare. The mark of ownership is renewed with additional tar and rattle, and they are sent up once more to their breezy walk, where the winter winds begin to pipe and to blow, and to call away their brethren from the icy north. Once a week the shepherds go up and scour the fells, looking over the sheep and seeing how the herbage lasts. And this is the dangerous and wild time for the shepherds. The snows and the mists, more to be dreaded even than snow, may come on, and there is no lack of tales about the Christmas hearth, of men who have gone up to the wild and desolate fells, and have never been seen more, but whose voices are yet heard calling on their dogs, or uttering fierce despairing cries for help. And so they will call till the end of time, till their whitened bones have risen again. Towards the middle of January, great care is necessary, as by this time the sheep have grown weak and lean with lack of food, and the excess of cold. Yet as the mountain sheep will not eat turnips, but must be fed with hay, it is a piece of economy to delay beginning to feed them as long as possible, and to know the exact nick of time requires as much skill as must have been possessed by Eunice's father in Miss Austin's delightful novel, who required his gruel thin, but not too thin, thick, but not too thick. And so the shepherd's calendar worked round to yeaning time again. It must be a pleasant employment, reminding one of Wordsworth's lines. In that fair clime the lonely herdsman stretched, on the soft grass through half the summer's day, etc. And of shepherd's boys with their reedy pipes, taught by Pan, and of the Chaldean shepherds, studying the stars, of Poussin's picture of the good shepherd, of the shepherds keeping watch by night, and I don't know how many other things, not forgetting some of Cooper's delightful pieces. While I was thus rambling on in thought, my host was telling me of the prices of wool that year, for we had grown quite confidential by this time. Wool was sold by the stone. He expected to get ten or twelve shillings a stone, it took three or four fleeces to make a stone. Before the Australian wool came in, he had got twenty shillings, aye, and more. But now, and again we sighed over the degeneracy of the times, till he took up his pipe, not pandian, for consolation, and I bethought me of the long walk home and the tired little ones who must not be worried. So, with much regret, we took our leave, the fiddler had just arrived as we were wishing good-bye. The shadow of the house had overspread the yard. The boys were more in number than the sheep that remained to be shorn. The busy women were dishing up great smoking rounds of beef. And in addition to all the provision I had seen in the boilers, large-mouthed ovens were disgorging berry pies without end, and rice puddings stuck full of almonds and raisins. As we descended the hill, we passed a little rustic bridge, with a great alder bush near it. Underneath sat Isabel, as rosy red as ever, but dimpling up with smiles, while Tom lay at her feet, and looked up into her eyes. His faithful sheep-dog sat by him, but flapped his tail vainly, in hope of obtaining some notice. His master was too much absorbed for that. Poor fly, every dog has his day, and yours was not this 10th of July. End of Cumberland Sheep Shearers by Elizabeth Gaskell
Chapter One of Morton Hall by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a Weekly Journal, Number One Hundred and Ninety One, Nineteenth of November, eighteen fifty three. Morton Hall in two chapters. Chapter the First. Our old hall is to be pulled down, and they are going to build streets on the site. I said to my sister, Ethelinda, if they really pull down Morton Hall, it will be a worse piece of work than the repeal of the Corn Laws. And after some consideration, she replied that if she must speak what was on her mind, she would own that she thought that the Papists had something to do with it, that they had never forgiven the Morton who had been with Lord Monteagle when he discovered the gunpowder plot, for we knew that somewhere in Rome there was a book kept, and which had been kept for generations, giving an account of the secret private history of every English family of note, and registering the names of those to whom the Papists owed either grudges or gratitude. We were silent for some time, but I am sure the same thought was in both our minds. Our ancestor, a side-bottom, had been a follower of the Morton of that day. It had always been said in the family that he had been with his master when he went with the Lord Monteagle and found Guy Fawkes and his dark lantern under the Parliament House, and the question flashed across our minds. Were the side-bottoms marked with a black mark in that terrible mysterious book which was kept under lock and key by the Pope and the Cardinals in Rome. It was terrible, yet somehow rather pleasant to think of. So many of the misfortunes which had happened to us through life, and which we had called mysterious dispensations, but which some of our neighbours had attributed to our want of prudence and foresight, were accounted for at once if we were objects of the deadly hatred of such a powerful order as the Jesuits, of whom we had lived in dread ever since we had read the female Jesuit. Whether this last idea suggested what my mother said next, I can't tell. We did know the female Jesuit's second cousin, so might be said to have literary connections. And from that the startling thought might spring up in my sister's mind, for, said she, Biddy! My name is Bridget, and no one but my sister calls me Biddy. Suppose you write some account of Morton Hall. We have known much in our time of the Mortons, and it will be a shame if they pass away completely from men's memories while we can speak or write. I was pleased with the notion, I confess, but I felt ashamed to agree to it all at once, though even as I objected for modesty's sake, it came into my mind how much I had heard of the old place in its former days and how it was, perhaps, all I could do now for the Mortons, under whom our ancestors had lived as tenants for more than three hundred years. So at last I agreed, and, for fear of mistakes, I showed it to Mr Swinton, our young curate, who has put it quite in order for me. Morton Hall is situated about five miles from the centre of Drumble. It stands on the outskirts of a village, which, when the hall was built, was probably as large as Drumble in those days, and even I can remember when there was a long piece of rather lonely road, with high hedges on either side, between Morton Village and Drumble. Now it is all street, and Morton seems but a suburb of the great town near. Our farm stood where Liverpool Street runs now, and people used to come to snipe shooting just where the Baptist Chapel is built. Our farm must have been older than the hall, for we had a date of 1460 on one of the cross-beams. My father was rather proud of this advantage, for the hall had no date older than 1554, and I remember his affronting Mrs Dawson the housekeeper by dwelling too much on this circumstance one evening when she came to drink tea with my mother, when Ethelinda and I were mere children. But my mother, seeing that Mrs Dawson would never allow that any house in the parish could be older than the hall, and that she was getting very warm, and almost insinuating that the side-bottoms had forged the date to disparage the squire's family 
and set themselves up as having the older blood, asked Mrs. Dawson to tell us the story of old Sir John Morton before we went to bed. I slyly reminded my father that Jack, our man, was not always so careful as might be in housing the Alderney in good time in the autumn evenings. So he started up and went off to see after Jack, and Mrs. Dawson and we drew nearer the fire to hear the story about Sir John. Sir John Morton had lived some time about the restoration. The Mortons had taken the right side, so when Oliver Cromwell came into power, he gave away their lands to one of his Puritan followers, a man who had been but a praying, canting Scotch peddler till the war broke out, and Sir John had to go and live with his royal master at Bruges. The upstart's name was Carr, who came to live at Morton Hall, and, I'm proud to say, we, I mean our ancestors, led him a pretty life. He had hard work to get any rent at all from the tenantry, who knew their duty better than to pay it to a roundhead. If he took the law to them, the law officers fared so badly that they were shy of coming out to Morton, all along that lonely road I told you of, again. Strange noises were heard about the hall, which got the credit of being haunted. But as those noises were never heard before or since that Richard Carr lived there, I leave you to guess if the evil spirits did not know well over whom they had power, over schismatic rebels and no one else. They durst not trouble the Mortons, who were true and loyal and were faithful followers of King Charles in word and deed. At last old Oliver died, and folks did say that on that wild and stormy night his voice was heard high up in the air where you could hear the flocks of wild geese skirl, crying out for his true follower Richard Carr to accompany him in the terrible chase the fiends were giving him before carrying him down to hell. Anyway, Richard Carr died within a week. Summoned by the dead or not, he went his way down to his master and his master's master. Then his daughter Alice came into possession. Her mother was somehow related to General Monk, who was beginning to come into power about that time. So, when Charles II came back to his throne, and many of the sneaking Puritans had to quit their ill-gotten land and turn to the right about, Alice Carr was still left at Morton Hall to queen it there. She was taller than most women, and a great beauty, I have heard, but for all her beauty she was a stern, hard woman, the tenants had known her to be hard in her father's lifetime, but now that she was the owner and had the power, she was worse than ever. She hated the Stuarts worse than ever her father had done, had calves head for dinner every 30th of January, and when the first 29th of May came round, and every mother's son in the village gilded his oak leaves and wore them in his hat, she closed the windows of the great hall with her own hands, and sat throughout the day in darkness and mourning. People did not like to go against her by force, because she was a young and beautiful woman. It was said the king got her cousin, the Duke of Albemarle, to ask her to court, just as courteously as if she had been the Queen of Sheba, and King Charles, Solomon, praying her to visit him in Jerusalem. But she would not go, not she. She lived a very lonely life for now the king had got his own again, no servant but her nurse would stay with her in the hall, and none of the tenants would pay her any money, for all that her father had purchased the lands from the parliament, and paid the price down in good red gold. All this time Sir John was somewhere in the Virginian plantations, and the ships sailed from thence only twice a year. But his royal master had sent for him home, and home he came that second summer after the restoration. No one knew if Mistress Alice had heard of his landing in England or not. All the villagers and tenantry knew, and were not surprised, and turned out in their best dresses with great branches of oak to welcome him as he rode into the village one July morning, with many gay-looking gentlemen by his side, laughing and talking and making merry, and speaking gaily and pleasantly to the village people. 
They came in on the opposite side to the Drumble Road. Indeed, Drumble was nothing of a place then, as I have told you. Between the last cottage in the village and the gates to the old hall, there was a shady part of the road, where the branches nearly met overhead, and made a green gloom. If you'll notice, when many people are talking merrily out of doors in sunlight, they will stop talking for an instant, when they come into the cool green shade, and either be silent for some little time, or else speak graver and slower and softer. And so old people say those gay gentlemen did, for several people followed to see Alice Carr's pride taken down. They used to tell how the cavaliers had to bow their plumed hats in passing under the unlopped and drooping boughs. I fancy Sir John expected that the lady would have rallied her friends and got ready for a sort of battle to defend the entrance to the house. But she had no friends. She had no nearer relations than the Duke of Albemarle, and he was mad with her for having refused to come to court, and so save her estate according to his advice. Well, Sir John rode on in silence. The tramp of the many horses' feet and the clumping sound of the clogs of the village people were all that was heard. Heavy as the great gate was, they swung it wide on its hinges, and up they rode to the hall steps, where the lady stood in her close plain Puritan dress, her cheeks one crimson flush, her great eyes flashing fire, and no one behind her, or with her, or near her, or to be seen, but the old trembling nurse catching at her gown in pleading terror. Sir John was taken aback. He could not go out with swords and warlike weapons against a woman. His very preparations for forcing an entrance made him ridiculous in his own eyes. And he well knew, in the eyes of his gay scornful comrades too. So he turned him round about and bade them stay where they were, while he rode close to the steps and spoke to the young lady. And there they saw him, hat in hand, speaking to her, and she, lofty and unmoved, holding her own, as if she had been a sovereign queen with an army at her back. What they said no one heard, but he rode back very grave and much changed in his look, though his grey eye showed more hawk-like than ever, as if seeing the way to his end though as yet afar off. He was not one to be jested with before his face, so when he professed to have changed his mind, and not to wish to disturb so fair a lady in possession, he and his cavaliers rode back to the village inn, and roistered there all day, and feasted the tenantry, cutting down the branches that had incommoded them in their morning's ride, to make a bonfire on the village green, in which they burnt a figure which some called Old Knoll, and others Richard Carr. And it might do for either, folk said, for unless they had given it the name of a man, most people would have taken it for a forked log of wood. But the lady's nurse told the villagers afterwards that Mistress Alice went in from the sunny hall steps into the chill house shadow, and sat her down and wept, as her poor faithful servant had never seen her do before and could not have imagined her proud young lady ever doing. All through that summer's day she cried, and if for very weariness she ceased for a time, and only sighed, as if her heart were breaking, they heard through the upper windows, which were open because of the heat, the village bells ringing merrily through the trees, and bursts of choruses to gay cavalier songs, all in favour of the Stuarts. All the young lady said was, once or twice, Oh, God, I am very friendless. And the old nurse knew it was true, and could not contradict her, and always thought, as she said long after, that such weary weeping showed there was some great sorrow at hand. I suppose it was the dreariest sorrow that ever a proud woman had, but it came in the shape of a gay wedding. How the village never knew! The gay gentleman rode away from Morton the next day as lightly and carelessly as if they had attained their end, and Sir John had taken possession. And by and by the nurse came timorously out to market in the village, 
and Mistress Alice was met in the woodwalks, just as grand and as proud as ever in her ways, only a little more pale and a little more sad. The truth was, as I have been told, that she and Sir John had each taken a fancy to each other in that parley they held on the hall steps. She, in the deep wild way in which she took the impressions of her whole life, deep down as if they were burnt in. Sir John was a gallant-looking man, and had a kind of foreign grace and courtliness about him. The way he fancied her was very different, a man's way, they tell me. She was a beautiful woman to be tamed, and made to come to his beck and call. And perhaps he read in her softening eyes that she might be won, and so all legal troubles about the possession of the estate come to an end in an easy, pleasant manner. He came to stay with friends in the neighbourhood. He was met in her favourite walks with his plumed hat in his hand, pleading with her, and she looking softer and far more lovely than ever. And lastly, the tenants were told of the marriage then nigh at hand. After they were wedded, he stayed for a time with her at the hall, and then off back to court. They do say that her obstinate refusal to go with him to London was the cause of their first quarrel. But such fierce strong wills would quarrel the first day of their wedded life. She said that the court was no place for an honest woman, but surely Sir John knew best, and she might have trusted him to take care of her. However, he left her all alone, and at first she cried most bitterly and then she took to her old pride, and was more haughty and gloomy than ever. By and by she found out hidden conventicles, and as Sir John never stinted her of money, she gathered the remnants of the old Puritan party about her, and tried to comfort herself with long prayers, snuffled through the nose, for the absence of her husband. But it was of no use. Treat her as he would, she loved him still with a terrible love. Once, they say, she put on her waiting-maid's dress and stole up to London to find out what kept him there, and something she saw or heard that changed her altogether, for she came back as if her heart was broken. They say that the only person she loved with all the wild strength of her heart had proved false to her, and if so, what wonder! At the best of times she was but a gloomy creature, and it was a great honour for her father's daughter to be wedded to a Morton. She should not have expected too much. After her despondency came her religion. Every old Puritan preacher in the country was welcome at Morton Hall. Surely that was enough to disgust Sir John. The Mortons had never cared to have much religion, but what they had had been good of its kind hitherto. So, when Sir John came down, wanting a gay greeting and a tender show of love, his lady exhorted him and prayed over him and quoted the last Puritan text she had heard at him. And he swore at her and at her preachers and made a deadly oath that none of them should find harbour or welcome in any house of his. She looked scornfully back at him, and said she had yet to learn in what county of England the house he spoke of was to be found. But in the house her father purchased, and she inherited, all who preached the gospel should be welcome, let kings make what laws, and king's minions swear what oaths they would. He said nothing to this, the worst sign for her, but he set his teeth at her, and in an hour's time he rode back to the French witch that had beguiled him, before he went away from Morton, he set his spies. He longed to catch his wife in his fierce clutch and punish her for defying him. She had made him hate her with her puritanical ways. He counted the days till the messenger came, splashed up to the top of his deep leather boots, to say that my lady had invited the canting puritan preachers of the neighbourhood to a prayer meeting and a dinner and a night's rest at her house. Sir John smiled as he gave the messenger five gold pieces for his pains, and straight took post-horses and rode long days till he got to Morton. And only just in time, 
for it was the very day of the prayer meeting. Dinners were then at one o'clock in the country. The great people in London might keep late hours and dine at three in the afternoon or so, but the Mortons, they always clung to the good old ways, and as the church bells were ringing twelve when Sir John came riding into the village, he knew he might slack and bridle, and, casting one glance at the smoke which came hurrying up as if from a newly mended fire, just behind the wood, where he knew the hall kitchen chimney stood, Sir John stopped at the smithy and pretended to question the smith about his horse's shoes. But he took little heed of the answers, being more occupied by an old serving man from the hall, who had been loitering about the smithy half the morning, as folk thought afterwards, to keep some appointment with Sir John. When their talk was ended, Sir John lifted himself straight in his saddle, cleared his throat, and spoke out aloud. "'I grieve to hear your lady is so ill.' The smith wondered at this, for all the village knew of the coming feast at the hall. The spring chickens had been bought up, and the cane lambs killed, for the preachers in those days, if they fasted, they fasted, if they fought, they fought, if they prayed, they prayed, sometimes for three hours at a standing. And if they feasted, they feasted, and knew what good eating was, believe me. My lady ill, said the smith, as if he doubted the old prim serving man's word. And the latter would have chopped in with an angry asseveration. He had been at Worcester, and fought on the right side. But Sir John cut him short. My lady is very ill, good Master Fox. It touches her here, continued he, pointing to his head. I am come down to take her to London, where the king's own physician shall prescribe for her. And he rode slowly up to the hall. The lady was as well as ever she had been in her life, and happier than she had often been, for in a few minutes some of those whom she esteemed so highly would be about her. Some of those who had known and valued her father, her dead father to whom her sorrowful heart turned in its woe as the only true lover and friend she had ever had on earth. Many of the preachers would have ridden far, was all in order in their rooms and on the table in the great dining parlour. She had got into restless hurried ways of late. She went round below, and then she mounted the great oak staircase, to see if the tower bedchamber was all in order for old Master Hilton, the oldest among the preachers. Meanwhile, the maidens below were carrying in mighty cold rounds of spiced beef, quarters of lamb, chicken pies, and all such provisions, when suddenly, they knew not how, they found themselves each seized by strong arms, their aprons thrown over their heads after the manner of a gag, and themselves borne out of the house on to the poultry-green behind, where, with threats of what worse might befall them, they were sent with many a shameful word. Sir John could not always command his men, many of whom had been soldiers in the French wars, back into the village. They scudded away like frightened hares. My lady was strewing the white-headed preacher's room with the last year's lavender, and stirring up the sweet-pot on the dressing-table when she heard a step on the echoing stairs. It was no measured tread of any Puritan. It was the clang of a man of war coming nearer and nearer with loud, rapid strides. She knew the step. Her heart stopped beating, not for fear, but because she loved Sir John even yet. And she took a step forward to meet him, and then stood still and trembled, for the flattering false thought came before her that he might have come yet in some quick impulse of reviving love, and that his hasty step might be prompted by the passionate tenderness of a husband. But when he reached the door, she looked as calm and indifferent as ever. "'My lady,' said he, "'you are gathering your friends to some feast. "'May I know who are thus invited to revel in my house? "'Some graceless fellows, I see, "'from the store of meat and drink below, "'wine-bibbers and drunkards, I fear.' "'But by the working glance of his eye "'she saw that he knew all, "'and she spoke with a cold distinctness. "'Master Ephraim Dixon, "'Master Zerub Babel Hopkins, 
Master, help me, or I perish Perkins, and some other godly ministers, come to spend the afternoon in my house. He went to her, and in his rage he struck her. She put up no arm to save herself, but reddened a little with the pain, and then, drawing her neckerchief on one side, she looked at the crimson mark on her white neck. "'It serves me right,' she said. "'I wedded one of my father's enemies, "'one of those who would have hunted the old man to death. "'I gave my father's enemy house and lands "'when he came as a beggar to my door. "'I followed my wicked wayward heart in this "'instead of minding my dying father's words. "'Strike again and avenge him yet more.' "'But he would not, because she bade him.' He unloosed his sash, and bound her arms tight, tight together, and she never struggled or spoke. Then, pushing her so that she was obliged to sit down on the bedside. "'Sit there,' he said, "'and hear how I will welcome the old hypocrites you have dared to ask to my house, my house, and my ancestor's house, long before your father, a canting peddler, hawked his goods about and cheated honest men.' and opening the chamber window right above those hall steps where she had awaited him in her maiden beauty scarce three short years ago he greeted the company of preachers as they rode up to the hall with such terrible hideous language my lady had provoked him past all bearing you see that the old men turned round aghast and made the best of their way back to their own places meanwhile Sir John's serving men below had obeyed their master's orders. They had gone through the house, closing every window, every shutter, and every door, but leaving all else just as it was, the cold meats on the table, the hot meats on the spit, the silver flagons on the sideboard, all just as if they were ready for a feast. And then Sir John's head servant, he that I spoke of before, came up and told his master all was ready. "'Is the horse and pillion all ready? Then you and I must be my lady's tire-women. And as it seemed to her, in mockery, but in reality with a deep purpose, they dressed the helpless woman in her riding things all awry, and, strange and disorderly, Sir John carried her downstairs, and he and his man bound her on the pillion, and Sir John mounted before.' The man shut and locked the great house door, and the echoes of the clang went through the empty hall with an ominous sound. "'Throw the key,' said Sir John, "'deep into the mere yonder. My lady may go seek it if she lists, when next I set her arms at liberty. Till then I know whose house Morton Hall shall be called.' "'Sir John, it shall be called the devil's house, and you shall be his steward.' But the poor lady had better have held her tongue, for Sir John only laughed, and told her to rave on. As he passed through the village with his serving-men riding behind, the tenantry came out, and stood at their doors, and pitied him for having a mad wife, and praised him for his care of her, and of the chance he gave her of amendment, by taking her up to be seen by the king's physician. But somehow the hall got an ugly name, the roast and boiled meats, the ducks, the chickens, had time to drop into dust before any human being now dared to enter in, or indeed had any right to enter in, for Sir John never came back to Morton, and as for my lady, some said she was dead, and some said she was mad and shut up in London, and some said Sir John had taken her to a convent abroad. "'And what did become of her?' asked we creeping up to Mrs. Dawson. "'Nay, how should I know?' "'But what do you think?' we asked pertinaciously. "'I cannot tell. I have heard that after Sir John was killed at the Battle of the Boyne, she got loose and came wandering back to Morton, to her old nurse's house. But indeed, she was mad then, out and out, and I've no doubt Sir John had seen it coming on. She used to have visions and dream dreams, and some thought her a prophetess, and some thought her fairly crazy. What she said about the Mortons was awful. She doomed them to die out of the land, 
and their house to be razed to the ground, while peddlers and hucksters, such as her own people, her father, had been, should dwell where the nightly Mortons had once lived. One winter's night she strayed away, and the next morning they found the poor crazy woman frozen to death in Drumble Meeting House Yard, and the Mr. Morton who had succeeded to Sir John had her decently buried where she was found by the side of her father's grave. We were silent for a time. And when was the old hall opened, Mrs. Dawson, please? Oh, when the Mr. Morton, our Squire Morton's grandfather, came into possession. He was a distant cousin of Sir John's, a much quieter kind of man. He had all the old rooms opened wide and aired and fumigated, and the strange fragments of musty food were collected and burnt in the yard. But somehow that old dining parlour had always a charnel house smell, and no one ever liked making merry in it, thinking of the grey old preachers whose ghosts might even then be scenting the meats afar off, and trooping unbidden to a feast that was not that of which they were balked. I was glad for one when the squire's father built another dining room, and no servant in the house will go an errand into the old dining parlour after dark, I can assure ye. I wonder if the way the last Mr. Morton had to sell his land to the people at Drumble had anything to do with old Lady Morton's prophecy, said my mother musingly. Not at all, said Mrs. Dawson sharply. My lady was crazy, and her words not to be minded. I should like to see the cotton spinners of Drumble offer to purchase land from the squire. Besides, there's a strict entail now. They can't purchase the land if they would. A set of trading peddlers indeed. I remember Ethelinda and I looked at each other at this word, peddlers, which was the very word she had put into Sir John's mouth when taunting his wife with her father's low birth and calling. We thought... We shall see. Alas, we have seen. Soon after that evening, our good old friend Mrs. Dawson died. I remember it well, because Ethelinda and I were put into mourning for the first time in our lives. A dear little brother of ours had died only the year before, and then my father and mother had decided that we were too young that there was no necessity for their incurring the expense of black frocks. We mourned for the little delicate darling in our hearts, I know, and to this day I often wonder what it would have been to have had a brother. But when Mrs. Dawson died, it became a sort of duty we owed to the squire's family to go into black, and very proud and pleased Ethelinda and I were with our new frocks. I remember dreaming Mrs. Dawson was alive again, and crying because I thought my new frock would be taken away from me. But all this has nothing to do with Morton Hall. When I first became aware of the greatness of the squire's station in life, his family consisted of himself, his wife, a frail delicate lady, his only son, little master, as Mrs. Dawson was allowed to call him, the young squire, as we in the village always termed him. His name was John Marmaduke. He was always called John, and after Mrs. Dawson's story of the old Sir John, I used to wish he might not bear that ill-omened name. He used to ride through the village in his bright scarlet coat, his long, fair, curling hair falling over his lace collar, and his broad black hat and feather shading his merry blue eyes. Ethelinda and I thought then, and I always shall think, there never was such a boy. He had a fine high spirit too of his own, and once horse-whipped a groom twice as big as himself, who had thwarted him. To see him and Miss Phyllis go tearing through the village on their pretty Arabian horses, laughing as they met the west wind, and their long golden curls flying behind them, you would have thought them brother and sister rather than nephew and aunt. For Miss Phyllis was the squire's sister, much younger than himself. Indeed, at the time I speak of, I don't think she could have been above seventeen, and the young squire, her nephew, was nearly ten. 
I remember Mrs. Dawson sending for my mother and me up to the hall that we might see Miss Phyllis dressed ready to go with her brother to a ball given at some great lord's house to Prince William of Gloucester, nephew to good old George the Third. When Mrs. Elizabeth, Mrs. Morton's maid, saw us at tea in Mrs. Dawson's room, she asked Ethelinda and me if we would not like to come into Miss Phyllis's dressing room and watch her dress. And then she said, if we could promise to keep from touching anything, she would make interest for us to go. We would have promised to stand on our heads and would have tried to do so too to earn such a privilege. So in we went and stood together, hand in hand, up in a corner, out of the way, feeling very red and shy and hot, till Miss Phyllis put us at our ease by playing all manner of comical tricks, just to make us laugh, which at last we did outright, in spite of all our endeavours to be grave, lest Mrs. Elizabeth should complain of us to my mother. I recollect the scent of the maréchal powder with which Miss Phyllis's hair was just sprinkled, and how she shook her head like a young colt to work the hair loose, which Mrs. Elizabeth was straining up over a cushion. Then Mrs. Elizabeth would try a little of Mrs. Morton's rouge, and Miss Phyllis would wash it off with a wet towel, saying that she liked her own paleness better than any perfumer's colour. And when Mrs. Elizabeth wanted just to touch her cheeks once more, she hid herself behind the great armchair, peeping out with her sweet merry face, first at one side and then at another, till we all heard the squire's voice at the door, asking her, if she was dressed, to come and show herself to madam, her sister-in-law. For as I said, Mrs. Morton was a great invalid, and unable to go to any grand parties like this. We were all silent in an instant, and even Mrs. Elizabeth thought no more of the rouge, but how to get Miss Phyllis's beautiful blue dress on quick enough. She had cherry-coloured knots in her hair, and her breast-knots were of the same ribbon. Her gown was open in front to a quilted white silk shirt. We felt very shy of her as she stood there fully dressed. She looked so much grander than anything we had ever seen, and it was like a relief when Mrs. Elizabeth told us to go down to Mrs. Dawson's parlour, where my mother was sitting all this time. Just as we were telling how merry and comical Miss Phyllis had been, in came a footman. Mrs. Dawson, said he, the squire bids me to ask you to go with Mrs. Sidebottom into the west parlour to have a look at Miss Morton before she goes. We went too, clinging to my mother. Miss Phyllis looked rather shy as we came in and stood just by the door. I think we all must have shown her that we had never seen anything so beautiful as she was in our lives before for she went very scarlet at our fixed gaze of admiration, and to relieve herself she began to play all manner of antics, whirling round and making cheeses with her rich silk petticoat, unfurling her fan, a present for Madame to complete her dress, and peeping first on one side and then on the other, just as she had done upstairs, and then catching hold of her nephew and insisting that he should dance a minuet with her until the carriage came, which proposal made him very angry, as it was an insult to his manhood, at nine years old, to suppose he could dance. It was all very well for girls to make fools of themselves, he said, but it did not do for men. And Ethelinda and I thought we had never heard so fine a speech before. But the carriage came before we had half feasted our eyes enough, and the squire came from his wife's room to order the little master to bed, and hand his sister to the carriage. I remember a good deal of talk about royal dukes and unequal marriages that night. I believe Miss Phyllis did dance with Prince William, and I have often heard that she bore away the bell at the ball, and that no one came near her for beauty and pretty merry ways. In a day or two after, I saw her scampering through the village, looking just as she did before she had danced with a royal duke. We all thought she would marry someone great, and used to look out for the lord who was to take her away. But poor madam died, and there was no one but Miss Phyllis to comfort her brother, 
for the young squire was gone away to some great school down south, and Miss Phyllis grew grave and reined in her pony to keep by the squire's side, when he rode out on his steady old mare in his lazy, careless way. We did not hear so much of the doings at the hall now Mrs. Dawson was dead, so I cannot tell how it was. But by and by there was talk of bills that were once paid weekly, being now allowed to run to quarter day. And then, instead of being settled every quarter day, they were put off to Christmas, and many said they had hard enough work to get their money then. A buzz went through the village that the young squire played high at college, and that he made away with more money than his father could afford. But when he came down to Morton, he was as handsome as ever, and I, for one, never believed evil of him, though I'll allow others might cheat him, and he never suspect it. His aunt was as fond of him as ever, and he of her. Many is the time I have seen them out walking together, sometimes sad enough, sometimes merry as ever. By and by my father heard of sales of small pieces of land, not included in the entail, and at last things got so bad that the very crops were sold, yet green upon the ground, for any price folks would give, so that there was but ready money paid. The squire at length gave way entirely, and never left the house, and the young master in London, and poor Miss Phyllis used to go about trying to see after the workmen and labourers, and save what she could. By this time she would be above thirty, Ethelinda and I were nineteen and twenty-one when my mother died, and that was some years before this. Well, at last the squire died. They do say of a broken heart as his son's extravagance, and though the lawyers kept it very close, it began to be rumoured that Miss Phyllis's fortune had gone too. Anyway, the creditors came down on the estate like wolves, it was entailed, and it could not be sold, but they put it into the hands of a lawyer who was to get what he could out of it, and have no pity for the poor young squire who had not a roof for his head. Miss Phyllis went to live by herself in a little cottage in the village at the end of the property, which the lawyer allowed her to have because he could not let it to anyone. It was so tumbled down and old. We never knew what she lived on, poor lady, but she said she was well in health, which was all we durst ask about. She came to see my father just before he died, and he seemed made bold with the feeling that he was a dying man, so he asked what I had longed to know for many a year. Where was the young squire? He had never been seen in Morton since his father's funeral. Miss Phyllis said that he was gone abroad, but in what part he was then she herself hardly knew. Only she had a feeling that sooner or later he would come back to the old place where she should strive to keep a home for him whenever he was tired of wandering about and trying to make his fortune. Trying to make his fortune still? asked my father, his questioning eyes saying more than his words. Miss Phyllis shook her head with a sad meaning in her face, and we understood it all. He was at some French gaming table, if he was not at an English one. Miss Phyllis was right. It might be a year after my father's death, when he came back, looking old and grey and worn. He came to our door, just after we had barred it one winter's evening. Ethelinda and I still lived at the farm, trying to keep it up and make it pay, but it was hard work. We heard a step coming up the straight pebble walk, and then it stopped right at our door, under the very porch, and we heard a man's breathing, quick and short. "'Shall I open the door?' said I. "'No, wait,' said Ethelinda, for we lived alone and there was no cottage near us. We held our breaths. There came a knock. "'Who's there?' I cried. "'Where does Miss Morton live? Miss Phyllis?' We were not sure if we should answer him, for she, like us, lived alone. "'Who's there?' again said I. "'Your master,' he answered, proud and angry. "'My name is John Morton. Where does Miss Phyllis live?' We had the door unbarred in a trice, and begged him to come in, to pardon our rudeness. 
we would have given him of our best, as was his due from us, but he only listened to the directions we gave him, to his aunts, and took no notice of our apologies. End of chapter 1 of Morton Hall Chapter 2 of Morton Hall by Elizabeth Gaskell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. From Household Words, number 192 Up to this time we had felt it rather impertinent to tell each other of our individual silent wonder as to what Miss Phyllis lived on but I know in our hearts we each thought about it, with a kind of respectful pity for her fallen low estate. Miss Phyllis, that we remembered like an angel for beauty, and like a little princess for the imperious sway she exercised, and which was such sweet compulsion that we had all felt proud to be her slaves. Miss Phyllis was now a worn, plain woman, in homely dress, tending towards old age, and looking, at that time I dared not have spoken so insolent a thought, not even to myself, but she did look as if she had hardly the proper nourishing food she required. One day I remember Mrs. Jones, the butcher's wife, she was a drumble person, saying in her saucy way that she was not surprised to see Miss Morton so bloodless and pale, for she only treated herself to a Sunday dinner of meat, and lived on slop and bread and butter all the rest of the week. Ethelinda put on her severe face, a look that I'm afraid of to this day, and said, Mrs. Jones, do you suppose Miss Morton can eat your half-starved meat? You do not know how choice and dainty she is, as becomes one born and bred like her. What was it we had to bring for her only last Saturday from the grand new butchers in Drumble, Biddy? We took our eggs to market in Drumble every Saturday, for the cotton spinners would give us a higher price than the Morton people, the more fools they. I thought it rather cowardly of Ethelinda to put the story-telling on me, but she always thought a great deal of saving her soul, more than I did, I'm afraid, for I made answer, as bold as a lion, two sweetbreads at a shilling apiece, and a four-quarter of house lamb at eighteen pence a pound. So off went Mrs. Jones in a huff, saying, their meat was good enough for Mrs. Donkin, the great mill-owner's widow, and might serve a beggarly Morton any day. When we were alone, I said to Ethelinda, I am afraid that we shall have to pay for our lies at the great day of account. And Ethelinda answered very sharply, She's a good sister in the main. Speak for yourself, Biddy. I never said a word. I only asked questions. How could I help it if you told lies? I'm sure I wondered at you, how glib you spoke out what was not true. But I knew she was glad I told the lies in her heart. After the poor squire came to live with his aunt, Miss Phyllis, we ventured to speak a bit to ourselves. We were sure they were pinched, they looked like it. He had a bad hacking cough at times, though he was so dignified and proud, he would never cough when anyone was near. I have seen him up before it was day, sweeping the dung off the roads to try and get enough to manure the little plot of ground behind the cottage, which Miss Phyllis had let alone but which her nephew used to dig in and till. For, said he, one day, in his grand slow way, he was always fond of experiments in agriculture. Ethelinda and I do believe that the two or three score of cabbages he raised were all they had to live on that winter, besides the bit of meal and tea they got at the village shop. One Friday night I said to Ethelinda, It is a shame to take these eggs to Drumble to sell, and never to offer one to the squire on whose lands we were born. She answered, I've thought so many a time. But how can we do it? I for one dare not offer them to the squire, and as for Miss Phyllis, it would seem like impertinence. I'll try at it, said I. So that night I took some eggs, fresh yellow eggs from our own pheasant hen, the like of which there were not for twenty miles round, and I laid them softly after dusk, on one of the little stone seats in the porch of Miss Phyllis's cottage. But alas, 
when we went to market at Drumble early the next morning, there were my eggs, all shattered and splashed, making an ugly yellow pool in the road just in front of the cottage. I had meant to have followed it up by a chicken or so, but I saw now that it would never do. Miss Phyllis came now and then to call on us. She was a little more high and distant than she had been when a girl, and we felt we must keep our place. I suppose we had affronted the young squire, for he never came near our house. Well, there came a hard winter, and provisions rose, and Ethelinda and I had much ado to make ends meet. If it had not been for my sister's good management, we should have been in debt, I know, but she proposed that we should go without dinner, and only have a breakfast and tea, to which I agreed you may be sure. One baking day I had made some cakes for tea, potato cakes we call them. They had a savoury hot smell about them, and to tempt Ethelinda, who was not quite well, I cooked a rasher of bacon. Just as we were sitting down, Miss Phyllis knocked at our door. We let her in. God only knows how white and haggard she looked. The heat of our kitchen made her totter, and for a while she could not speak but all the time she looked at the food on the table, as if she feared to shut her eyes, lest it should all vanish away. It was an eager stare, like that of some animal, poor soul. "'If I durst,' said Ethelinda, wishing to ask her to share in our meal, but being afraid to speak out. I did not speak, but handed her the good hot buttered cake, on which she seized, and putting it up to her lips as if to taste it, she fell back in her chair, crying. We had never seen a Morton cry before, and it was something awful. We stood silent and aghast. She recovered herself, but did not taste the food. On the contrary, she covered it up with both her hands, as if afraid of losing it. If you'll allow me, said she, in a stately kind of way, to make up for our having seen her crying, I'll take it to my nephew and she got up to go away. But she could hardly stand for very weakness, and had to sit down again. She smiled at us, and said she was a little dizzy, but it would soon go off. But as she smiled, the bloodless lips were drawn far back over her teeth, making her face seem somehow like a death's head. "'Miss Martin,' said I, "'do honour us by taking tea with us this once.' The squire, your father, once took a luncheon with my father, and we are proud of it to this day. I poured her out some tea, which she drank. The food she shrank away from, as if the very sight of it turned her sick again. But when she rose to go, she looked at it with her sad, wolfish eyes, as if she could not leave it. And at last she broke into a low cry, and said, Oh, Bridget, we are starving for want of food. I can bear it, I don't mind, but he suffers, oh, how he suffers, let me take him food for this one night. We could hardly speak, our hearts were in our throats, and the tears ran down our cheeks like rain. We packed up a basket and carried it to her very door, never venturing to speak a word, for we knew what it must have cost her to say that. When we left her at the cottage, we made her our usual deep courtesy, but she fell upon our necks and kissed us. For several nights after, she hovered round our house about dusk, but she would never come in again and face us in candle and firelight, much less meet us by daylight. We took our food to her as regularly as might be, and gave it to her in silence and with the deepest courtesies we could make. We felt so honoured. We had many plans now she had permitted us to know of her distress. We hoped she would allow us to go on serving her in some way, as became us as side-bottoms. But one night she never came. We stayed out in the cold, bleak wind, looking into the dark for her thin, worn figure, all in vain. Late the next afternoon, the young squire lifted the latch and stood right in the middle of our house-place. The roof was low overhead and made lower by the deep beams supporting the floor above. He stooped as he looked at us and tried to form words, 
but no sound came out of his lips i never saw such gaunt woe no never at last he took me by the shoulder and led me out of the house come with me he said when we were in the open air as if that gave him strength to speak audibly i needed no second word we entered miss phyllis's cottage a liberty i had never taken before what little furniture was there it was clear to be seen were cast off fragments of the old splendour of morton hall no fire grey wood ashes lay on the hearth an old settee once white and gold now doubly shabby in its fall from its former estate on it lay miss phyllis very pale very still her eyes shut tell me he gasped is she dead i think she is asleep but she looks so strange as if she might be he could not say the awful word again i stooped and felt no warmth only a cold chill atmosphere seemed to surround her she is dead i replied at length oh miss phyllis miss phyllis and like a fool i began to cry but he sat down without a tear and looked vacantly at the empty hearth i dared not cry any more when i saw him so stony sad i did not know what to do i could not leave him and yet i had no excuse for staying i went up to miss phyllis and softly arranged the grey ragged locks about her face ay said he she must be laid out who so fit to do it as you and your sister children of good old robert sidebottom oh my master i said this is no fit place for you let me fetch my sister to sit up with me all night and honour us by sleeping at our poor little cottage i did not expect he would have done it but after a few minutes silence he agreed to my proposal i hastened home and told ethelinda and both of us crying we heaped up the fire and spread the table with food and made up a bed in one corner of the floor while i stood ready to go i saw ethelinda open the great chest in which we kept our treasures and out she took a fine holland shift that had been one of my mother's wedding shifts and seeing what she was after i went upstairs and brought down a piece of rare old lace a good deal darned to be sure but still old brussels point bequeathed to me long ago by my godmother mrs dawson we huddled these things under our cloaks locked the door behind us and set out to do all we could now for poor miss phyllis we found the squire sitting just as we left him i hardly knew if he understood me when i told him how to unlock our door and gave him the key though i spoke as distinctly as ever i could for the choking in my throat at last he rose and went and ethelinda and i composed her poor thin limbs to decent rest and wrapped her in the fine holland shift and then i plaited up my lace into a close cap to tie up the wasted features when all was done we looked upon her from a little distance a morton to die of hunger said ethelinda solemnly we should not have dared to think that such a thing was within the chances of life do you remember that evening when you and i were little children and she a merry young lady peeping at us from behind her fan we did not cry any more we felt very still and awestruck after a while i said i wonder if after all the young squire did go to our house he had a strange look about him if i dared i would go and see i opened the door the night was black as pitch the air very still i'll go said i and off i went not meeting a creature for it was long past eleven i reached our house the window was long and low and the shutters were old and shrunk i could peep between them well and see all that was going on he was there sitting over the fire never shedding a tear but seeming as if he saw his past life in the embers the food we had prepared was untouched once or twice during my long watch i was more than an hour away 
he turned towards the food and made as though he would have eaten it and then shuddered back but at last he seized it and tore it with his teeth and laughed and rejoiced over it like some starved animal i could not keep from crying then he gorged himself with great morsels and when he could eat no more it seemed as if his strength for suffering had come back he threw himself on the bed and such a passion of despair i never heard of much less ever saw i could not bear to witness it the dead miss phyllis lay calm and still her trials were over i would go back and watch with ethelinda when the pale grey morning dawn stole in making us shiver and shake after our vigil the squire returned we were both mortal afraid of him we knew not why he looked quiet enough the lines were worn deep before no new traces were there he stood and looked at his aunt for a minute or two then he went up into the loft above the room where we were he brought a small paper parcel down bade us keep on our watch yet a little time first one and then the other of us went home to get some food it was a bitter black frost no one was out who could stop indoors and those who were out cared not to stop to speak towards afternoon the air darkened and a great snowstorm came on we durst not be left only one alone yet at the cottage where miss phyllis had lived there was neither fire nor fuel so we sat and shivered and shook till morning the squire never came that night nor all next day what must we do asked ethelinda broken down entirely i shall die if i stop here another night we must tell the neighbours and get help for the watch so we must said i very low and grieved i went out and told the news at the nearest house taking care you may be sure never to speak of the hunger and cold miss phyllis must have endured in silence it was bad enough to have them come in and make their remarks on the poor bits of furniture for no one had known their bitter straits even as much as ethelinda and me and we had been shocked at the bareness of the place i did hear that one or two of the more ill-conditioned had said it was not for nothing we had kept the death to ourselves for two nights that to judge from the lace on her cap there must have been some pretty pickings ethelinda would have contradicted this but i bade her let it alone it would save the memory of the proud mortons from the shame that poverty is thought to be and as for us why we could live it down but on the whole people came forward kindly money was not wanting to bury her well if not grandly as became her birth and many a one was bidden to the funeral who might have looked after her a little more in her lifetime among others was squire hargreaves from bothwick hall over the moors he was some kind of far-away cousin to the mortons so when he came he was asked to go chief mourner in squire morton's strange absence which i should have wondered at the more if i had not thought him almost crazy when i watched his ways through the shutter that night squire hargreaves started when they paid him the compliment of asking him to take the head of the coffin where is her nephew asked he no one has seen him since eight o'clock last thursday morning but i saw him at noon on thursday said squire hargreaves with a round oath he came over the moors to tell me of his aunt's death and to ask me to give him a little money to bury her on the pledge of his gold shirt buttons he said i was a cousin and could pity a gentleman in sore need that the buttons were his mother's first gift to him and that i was to keep them safe for some day he would make his fortune and come back to redeem them he had not known his aunt was so ill or he would have parted with these buttons sooner though he held them as more precious than he could tell me i gave him money but i could not find in my heart to take the buttons he bade me not to tell of all this but when a man is missing it is my duty to give all the clue i can and so their poverty was blazoned abroad but folk forgot it all in the search for the squire on the moorside two days they searched in vain 
the third upwards of a hundred men turned out hand in hand step to step to leave no foot of ground unsearched they found him stark and stiff with squire hargreaves money and his mother's gold buttons safe in his waistcoat pocket and we laid him down by the side of his poor aunt phyllis after the squire john marmaduke morton had been found dead in that sad way on the dreary moors the creditors seemed to lose all hold on the property which indeed during the seven years they had had it they had drained as dry as a sucked orange but for a long time no one seemed to know who rightly was the owner of morton hall and lands the old house fell out of repair the chimneys were full of starlings nests the flags in the terrace in front were hidden by the long grass the panes in the windows were broken no one knew how or why for the children of the village got up a tale that the house was haunted ethelinda and i went sometimes in the summer mornings and gathered some of the roses that were being strangled by the bindweed that spread over all and we used to try and weed the old flower garden a little but we were no longer young and the stooping made our backs ache still we always felt happier if we cleared but ever such a little space yet we did not go there willingly in the afternoons and left the garden always long before the first slight shade of dusk we did not choose to ask the common people many of them were weavers for the drumble manufacturers and no longer decent hedges and ditches we did not choose to ask them i say who was squire now or where he lived but one day a great london lawyer came to the morton arms and made a pretty stir he came on behalf of a general morton who was squire now though he was far away in india he had been written to and they had proved him heir though he was a very distant cousin farther back than sir john i think and now he had sent word they were to take money of his that was in england and put the house in thorough repair for that three maiden sisters of his who lived in some town in the north would come and live at morton hall till his return so the lawyer sent for a drumble builder and gave him directions we thought it would have been prettier if he had hired john cobb the morton builder and joiner he that had made the squire's coffin and the squire's father before that instead came a troop of drumble men knocking and tumbling about in the hall and making their jests up and down all those stately rooms ethelinda and i never went near the place till they were gone bag and baggage and then what a change the old casement windows with their heavy leaded panes half overgrown with vines and roses were taken away and great staring sash windows were in their stead new grates inside all modern new-fangled and smoking instead of the brass dogs which held the mighty logs of wood in the old squire's time the little square turkey carpet under the dining-table which had served miss phyllis was not good enough for these new mortons the dining-room was all carpeted over peeped into the old dining parlour that parlour where the dinner for the puritan preachers had been laid out the flag parlour as it had been called of late years but it had a damp earthy smell and was used as a lumber room we shut the door quicker than we had opened it we came away disappointed the hall was no longer like our own honoured morton hall after all these three ladies are mortons said ethelinda to me we must not forget that we must go and pay our duty to them as soon as they have appeared in church accordingly we went but we had heard and seen a little of them before we paid our respects at the hall their maid had been down in the village their maid as she was called now but a maid of all work she had been until now as she very soon let out when we questioned her however we were never proud and she was a good honest farmer's daughter out of northumberland what work she did make with the queen's english the folk in lancashire are said to speak broad but i could always understand our own kindly tongue 
whereas when mrs turner told me her name both ethelinda and i could have sworn she said donna and were afraid she was an irishwoman her ladies were what you might call past the bloom of youth miss sophronia miss morton properly was just sixty miss annabella three years younger and miss dorothy or baby as they called her when they were by themselves was two years younger still mrs turner was very confidential to us partly because i doubt not she had heard of our old connection with the family and partly because she was an arrant talker and was glad of anybody who would listen to her so we heard the very first week how each of the ladies had wished for the east bedroom that which faced the north-east which no one slept in in the old squire's days but there were two steps leading up into it and said miss sophronia she would never let a younger sister have a room more elevated than she had herself she was the eldest and she had a right to the steps so she bolted herself in for two days while she unpacked her clothes and then came out looking like a hen that has laid an egg and defies any one to take that honour from her but her sisters were very deferential to her in general that must be said they never had more than two black feathers in their bonnets while she had always three mrs turner said that once when they thought miss annabella had been going to have an offer of marriage made to her miss sophronia had not objected to her wearing three that winter but when it all ended in smoke miss annabella had to pluck it out as became a younger sister poor miss annabella she had been a beauty mrs turner said and great things had been expected of her her brother the general and her mother had both spoilt her rather than cross her unnecessarily and so spoil her good looks which old mrs morton had always expected would make the fortune of the family her sisters were angry with her for not having married some great rich gentleman though as she used to say to mrs turner how could she help it she was willing enough but no rich gentleman came to ask her we agreed that it really was not her fault but her sisters thought it was and now that she had lost her beauty they were always casting it up what they would have done if they had had her gifts there were some miss burrells they had heard of each of whom had married a lord and these miss burrells had not been such great beauties so miss sophronia used to work the question by the rule of three and put it in this way if miss burrell with a tolerable pair of eyes a snub nose and a wide mouth married a baron what rank of peer ought our pretty annabella to have espoused and the worst was miss annabella who had never had any ambition wanted to have married a pure curate in her youth but was pulled up by her mother and sisters reminding her of the duty she owed to her family miss dorothy had done her best miss morton always praised her for it with not half the good looks of miss annabella she had danced with an honourable at harrogate three times running and even now she persevered in trying which was more than could be said of miss annabella who was very broken-spirited i do believe mrs turner had told us all this before we had ever seen the ladies we had let them know through mrs turner of our wish to pay them our respects so we ventured to go up to the front door and rap modestly we had reasoned about it before and agreed that if we were going in our everyday clothes to offer a little present of eggs or to call on mrs turner as she had asked us to do the back door would have been the appropriate entrance for us but going however humbly to pay our respects and offer our reverential welcome to the miss mortons we took rank as their visitors and should go to the front door we were shown up the wide stairs along the gallery up two steps into miss sophronia's room she put away some papers hastily as we came in we heard afterwards that she was writing a book to be called the female chesterfield or letters from a lady of quality to her niece and the little niece sat there in a high chair with a flat board tied to her back and her feet in stocks on the rail of the chair so that she had nothing to do but listen to her aunt's letters 
which were read aloud to her as they were written, in order to mark their effect on her manners. I was not sure whether Miss Sophronia liked our interruption, but I do know little Miss Cordelia Manesty did. "'Is the young lady crooked?' asked Ethelinda, during a pause in our conversation. I had noticed that my sister's eyes would rest on the child, although by an effort she sometimes succeeded in looking at something else occasionally. "'No, oh, indeed, ma'am,' said Miss Morton, "'but she was born in India, and her backbone has never properly hardened. Besides, I and my two sisters each take charge of her for a week, and their systems of education, I might say non-education, differ so totally and entirely from my ideas that when Miss Manesty comes to me, I consider myself fortunate if I can undo the <coughs> that has been done during a fortnight's absence. Cordelia, my dear, repeat to these good ladies the geography lesson you learnt this morning. You learnt this morning? Poor little Miss Manesty began to tell us a great deal about some river in Yorkshire, of which we had never heard though I dare say we ought to, and then a great deal more about the towns that it passed by and what they were famous for. And all I can remember, indeed, could understand at the time, was that Pomfret was famous for Pomfret cakes, which I knew before. But Ethelinda gasped for breath before it was done. She was so nearly choked up with astonishment. And when it was ended, she said, Pretty dear, it's wonderful. Miss Morton looked a little displeased and replied, Not at all. Good little girls can learn anything they choose, even French verbs. Yes, Cordelia, they can. And to be good is better than to be pretty. We don't think about looks here. You may get down, child, and go into the garden, and take care you put your bonnet on, or you'll be all over freckles. We got up to take leave at the same time, and followed the little girl out of the room. Ethelinda fumbled in her pocket. "'Here's sixpence, my dear, for you. "'Nay, I'm sure you may take it from an old woman like me, "'to whom you've told over more geography "'than I ever thought there was out of the Bible.' "'For Ethelinda always maintained "'that the long chapters in the Bible, "'which were all names, were geography, "'and though I knew well enough they were not, "'yet I had forgotten what the right word was, "'so I let her alone.' for one hard word did as well as another. Little Miss looked as if she was not sure if she might take it, but I suppose we had two kindly old faces, for at last the smile came into her eyes, not to her mouth. She had lived too much with grave and quiet people for that, and looking wistfully at us, she said, Thank you, but won't you go and see Aunt Annabella? We said we should like to pay our respects to both her other aunts if we might take that liberty, and perhaps she would show us the way. But at the door of a room she stopped short and said, sorrowfully, I mayn't go in. It is not my week for being with Aunt Annabella. And then she went slowly and heavily towards the garden door. That child is cowed by somebody, said I to Ethelinda, but she knows a great deal of geography. Ethelinda's speech was cut short by the opening of the door in answer to our knock. The once beautiful Miss Annabella Morton stood before us and bade us enter. She was dressed in white with a turned-up velvet hat and two or three short drooping black feathers in it. I should not like to say she rouged, but she had a very pretty colour in her cheeks. That much can do neither good nor harm. At first she looked so unlike anybody I had ever seen, that I wondered what the child could have found to like in her, for like her she did, that was very clear. But when Miss Annabella spoke, I came under the charm. Her voice was very sweet and plaintive, and suited well with the kind of things she said. All about charms of nature, and tears and grief, and such sort of talk, which reminded me rather of poetry, very pretty to listen to, though I never could understand it as well as plain comfortable prose. Still, I hardly know why I liked Miss Annabella. I think I was sorry for her, though whether I should have been if she had not put it in my head, I don't know. The room looked very comfortable. 
a spinet in a corner to amuse herself with, and a good sofa to lie down upon. By and by we got her to talk of her little niece. She too had her system of education. She said she hoped to develop the sensibilities, and to cultivate the tastes. While with her, her darling niece read works of imagination, and acquired all that Miss Annabella could impart of the fine arts. We neither of us quite knew what she was hinting at at the time, but afterwards, by dint of questioning little Miss, and using our own eyes and ears, we found that she read aloud to her aunt while she lay on the sofa. Santo Sebastiano, or the young protector, was what they were deep in at this time, and as it was in five volumes, and the heroine spoke broken English, which required to be read twice over to make it intelligible, it lasted them a long time. She also learned to play on the spinet. Not much, for I never heard above two tunes, one of which was God Save the King, and the other was not. But I fancy the poor child was lectured by one aunt, and frightened by the other's sharp ways and numerous fancies. She might well be fond of her gentle pensive, Miss Annabella told me she was pensive, so I know I am right in calling her so, aunt with her soft voice, and her never-ending novels, and the sweet scents that hovered about the sleepy room. No one tempted us towards Miss Dorothy's apartment, when we left Miss Annabella, so we did not see the youngest Miss Morton this first day. We had each of us treasured up many little mysteries to be explained by our dictionary, Mrs. Turner. Who is little Miss Manesty? we asked in one breath when we saw our friend from the hall. And then we learnt that there had been a fourth, a younger Miss Morton, who was no beauty and no wit and no anything. So Miss Sophronia, her eldest sister, had allowed her to marry a Mr. Manesty, and ever after spoke of her as my poor sister Jane. She and her husband had gone out to India, and both had died there, and the general had made it a sort of condition with his sisters that they should take charge of the child, or else none of them liked children except Miss Annabella. Miss Annabella likes children, said I. Then that's the reason children like her. I can't say she likes children, for we never have any in our house but Miss Cordelia, but her she does like dearly. Poor little miss, said Ethelinda, does she never get a game of play with other little girls? And I am sure from that time Ethelinda considered her in a diseased state from this very circumstance, and that her knowledge of geography was one of the symptoms of the disorder, for she used often to say, I wish she did not know so much geography. I'm sure it is not quite right. Whether or not her geography was right, I don't know but the child pined for companions. A very few days after we had called, and yet long enough to have passed her into Miss Annabella's week, I saw Miss Cordelia in a corner of the church green, playing with awkward humility, along with some of the rough village girls, who were as expert at the game as she was unapt and slow. I hesitated a little, and at last I called to her. "'How do you do, my dear?' I said. How come you here so far from home? She reddened and then looked up at me with her large serious eyes. Aunt Annabel sent me into the wood to meditate, and, and it was very dull, and I heard these little girls playing and laughing, and I had my sixpence with me, and it was not wrong, was it, ma'am? I came to them and told one of them I would give it to her if she would ask the others to let me play with them. But, my dear, they are some of them. Very rough little children, and not fit companions for a Morton. But I'm a manisty, ma'am, she pleaded, with so much entreaty in her ways, that if I had not known what naughty bad girls some of them were, I could not have resisted her longing for companions of her own age. As it was, I was angry with them for having taken her sixpence, but when she told me which it was, and saw that I was going to reclaim it, she clung to me and said, Oh, don't, ma'am, you must not. I gave it to her quite of my own self. So I turned away, for there was truth in what the child said. 
but to this day I have never told Ethelinda what became of her sixpence. I took Miss Cordelia home with me, while I changed my dress to be fit to take her back to the hall, and on the way, to make up for her disappointment, I began talking of my dear Miss Phyllis and her bright pretty youth. I had never named her name since her death to any one but Ethelinda, and that only on Sundays and quiet times. And I could not have spoken of her to a grown-up person, but somehow to Miss Cordelia it came out quite natural. Not of her latter days, of course, but of her pony and her little black King Charles dogs, and all the living creatures that were glad in her presence when first I knew her. And nothing would satisfy the child, but I must go into the hall garden and show her where Miss Phyllis's garden had been. We were deep in our talk, and she was stooping down to clear the plot from weeds, when I heard a sharp voice cry out, Cordelia, Cordelia, dirtying your frock with kneeling on the wet grass. It is not my week, but I shall tell your Aunt Annabella of you. And the window was shut down with a jerk. It was Miss Dorothy and I felt almost as guilty as poor little Miss Cordelia, for I had heard from Mrs. Turner that we had given great offence to Miss Dorothy by not going to call on her in her room that day on which we had paid our respects to her sisters, and I had a sort of idea that seeing Miss Cordelia with me was almost as much of a fault as the kneeling down on the wet grass. So I thought I would take the bull by the horns. "'Will you take me to your Aunt Dorothy, my dear?' said I. The little girl had no longing to go into her Aunt Dorothy's room, as she so evidently had at Miss Annabella's room. On the contrary, she pointed it out to me at a safe distance, and then went away in the measured step she was taught to use in that house, where such things as running, going upstairs two steps at a time, or jumping down three, were considered undignified and vulgar. Miss Dorothy's room was the least prepossessing of any. Somehow it had a northeast look about it, though it did face direct south, and, as for Miss Dorothy herself, she was more like a cousin Betty than anything else. If you know what a cousin Betty is, and perhaps it is too old-fashioned a word to be understood by anyone who has learnt the foreign languages. But when I was a girl, there used to be poor crazy women rambling about the country, one or two in a district. They never did any harm that I know of. They might have been born idiots, poor creatures, or crossed in love. Who knows? But they roamed the country, and were well known at the farmhouses, where they often got food and shelter for as long a time as their restless minds would allow them to stay in any one place. And the farmer's wife would, maybe, rummage up a ribbon or a feather, or a smart old breadth of silk, to please the harmless vanity of these poor crazy women. And they would go about, so bedizened sometimes, that, as we called them always Cousin Betty, we made it into a kind of proverb for anyone dressed in a flyaway showy style, and said they were like a Cousin Betty. So now you know what I mean, that Miss Dorothy was like. Her dress was white, like Miss Annabella's, but instead of the black velvet hat her sister wore, she had on, even in the house, a small black silk bonnet. This sounds as if it should be less like a cousin Betty than a hat, but wait till I tell you how it was lined, with strips of red silk, broad near the face, narrow near the brim, for all the world like the rays of the rising sun, as they are painted on the public house sign and her face was like the sun, as round as an apple, and with rouge on, without any doubt. Indeed, she told me once, a lady was not dressed unless she had put her rouge on. Mrs. Turner told us she studied reflections a great deal, not that she was a thinking woman in general, I should say, and that this rayed lining was the fruit of her study. She had her hair pulled together, so that her forehead was quite covered with it, and I won't deny that I rather wished myself at home, as I stood facing her in the doorway. She pretended she did not know who I was, and made me tell all about myself. And then it turned out she knew all about me, and she hoped I had recovered from my fatigue the other day. 
"'What fatigue?' asked I, immovably. "'Oh, she had understood I was very much tired after visiting her sisters. "'Otherwise, of course, I should not have felt it too much to come on to her room. "'She kept hinting at me in so many ways "'that I could have asked her gladly to slap my face and have done with it. "'Only I wanted to make Miss Cordelia's peace with her "'for kneeling down and dirtying her frock. "'I did say what I could to make things straight, "'but I don't know if it did any good.' Mrs. Turner told me how suspicious and jealous she was of everybody, and of Miss Annabella in particular, who had been set over her in her youth because of her beauty. But since it had faded, Miss Morton and Miss Dorothy had never ceased pecking at her, and Miss Dorothy worst of all. If it had not been for little Miss Cordelia's love, Miss Annabella might have wished to die. She did often wish she had the smallpox as a baby, Miss Morton was stately and cold to her, as one who had not done her duty to her family, and was put in the corner for her bad behaviour. Miss Dorothy was continually talking at her, and particularly dwelling on the fact of her being the older sister. Now she was but two years older, and was still so pretty and gentle-looking, that I should have forgotten it continually but for Miss Dorothy. The rules that were made for Miss Cordelia she was to eat her meals standing, that was one thing. Another was that she was to drink two cups of cold water before she had any pudding, and it just made the child loathe cold water. Then there were ever so many words she might not use. Each aunt had her own set of words which were ungenteel or improper for some reason or another. Miss Dorothy would never let her say red. It was always to be pink or crimson or scarlet. Miss Cordelia used at one time to come to us and tell us she had a pain at her chest, so often that Ethelinda and I began to be uneasy, and questioned Mrs. Turner to know if her mother had died of consumption. And many a good pot of currant jelly have I given her, and only made her pain at the chest worse. For, would you believe it, Miss Morton told her never to say she had got a stomach ache, for that it was not proper to say so. I had heard it called by a worse name still in my youth, and so had Ethelinda, and we sat and wondered to ourselves how it was that some kinds of pain were genteel and others were not. I said that old families like the Mortons generally thought it showed good blood to have their complaints as high in the body as they could. Brain fevers and headaches had a better sound, and did perhaps belong more to the aristocracy. I thought I had got the right view in saying this, when Ethelinda would put in, that she had often heard of Lord Toffy having the gout and being lame, and that nonplussed me. If there is one thing I do dislike more than another, it is a person saying something on the other side, when I am trying to make up my mind. How can I reason if I am to be disturbed by another person's arguments? But though I tell all these peculiarities of the Miss Mortons, they were good women in the main. Even Miss Dorothy had her times of kindness, and really did love her little niece, though she was always laying traps to catch her doing wrong. Miss Morton I got to respect, if I never liked her. They would ask us up to tea, and we would put on our best gowns, and taking the house key in my pocket, we used to walk slowly through the village, wishing that people who had been living in our youth could have seen us now going by invitation to drink tea with the family at the hall. Not in the housekeeper's room, but with the family, mind you. But since they began to weave in Morton, everybody seemed too busy to notice us. So we were fain to be content with reminding each other how we should never have believed it in our youth that we could have lived to this day. After tea, Miss Morton would set us to talk of the real old family, whom they had never known and you may be sure we told of all their pomp and grandeur and stately ways. But Ethelinda and I never spoke of what was to ourselves like the memory of a sad, terrible dream. So they thought of the squire in his coach and four as high sheriff, and madam lying in her morning room in her Genoa velvet wrapping robe, all over peacock's eyes. It was a piece of velvet the squire brought back from Italy, 
when he had been the grand tour, and Miss Phyllis going to a ball at a great lord's house and dancing with a royal duke. The three ladies were never tired of listening to the tale of splendour that had been going on here, while they and their mother had been starving in genteel poverty up in Northumberland. And as for Miss Cordelia, she sat on a stool at her Aunt Annabella's knee, her hand in her aunt's, and listened open-mouthed and unnoticed to all we could say. One day the child came crying to our house. It was the old story. Aunt Dorothy had been so unkind to Aunt Annabella. The little girl said she would run away to India and tell her uncle, the general, and seemed in such a paroxysm of anger and grief and despair that a sudden thought came over me. I thought I would try and teach her something of the deep sorrow that lies awaiting all at some part of their lives, and of the way in which it ought to be borne, by telling her of Miss Phyllis's love and endurance for her wasteful handsome nephew. So, from little, I got to more, and I told her all, the child's great eyes filling slowly with tears, which brimmed over and came rolling down her cheeks, unnoticed as I spoke. I scarcely needed to make her promise not to speak about all this to anyone. She said, I could not, no, not even to Aunt Annabella. And to this day she never has named it again, not even to me. But she tried to make herself more patient and more silently helpful in the strange household among whom she was cast. By and by, Miss Morton grew pale and grey and worn amid all her stiffness. Mrs. Turner whispered to us that for all her stern, unmoved looks, she was ill unto death, that she had been secretly to see the great doctor at Drumble, and he had told her she must set her house in order. Not even her sisters knew this, but it preyed upon Mrs. Turner's mind, and she told us. Long after this, she kept up her week of discipline with Miss Cordelia, and walked in her straight, soldier-like way about the village, scolding people for having too large families, and burning too much coal, and eating too much butter. One morning she sent Mrs. Turner for her sisters, and while she was away, she rummaged out an old locket made of the four Miss Morton's hair, when they were all children. And threading the eye of the locket with a piece of brown ribbon, she tied it round Cordelia's neck, and kissing her, told her that she had been a good girl, and had cured herself of stooping, that she must fear God and honour the King, and that now she might go and have a holiday. Even while the child looked at her in wonder at the unusual tenderness with which this was said, a grim spasm passed over her face, and Cordelia ran in a fright to call Mrs. Turner. But when she came, and the other two sisters came, she was quite herself again. She had her sisters in her room alone when she wished them good-bye, so no one knows what she said or how she told them, who were thinking of her as in health, that the signs of near approaching death, which the doctor had foretold, were upon her. One thing they both agreed in saying, and it was much that Miss Dorothy agreed in anything, that she bequeathed her sitting-room, up the two steps, to Miss Annabella, as being next in age. Then they left her room, crying, and went both together into Miss Annabella's room, sitting hand in hand, for the first time since childhood, I should think, listening for the sound of the little handbell, which was to be placed close by her in case, in her agony, she required Mrs. Turner's presence. But it never rang. Noon became twilight. Miss Cordelia stole in from the garden with its long black-green shadows and strange eerie sounds of the night wind through the trees and crept to the kitchen fire. At last Mrs. Turner knocked at Miss Morton's door and hearing no reply, went in and found her cold and dead in her chair. I suppose that some time or other we had told them of the funeral the old squire had, Miss Phyllis's father, I mean. He had had a procession of tenantry half a mile long to follow him to the grave. 
Miss Dorothy sent for me to tell her what tenantry of her brother's could follow Miss Morton's coffin. But what, with people working in mills and land having passed away from the family, we could but muster up twenty people, men and women and all. And one or two were dirty enough to be paid for the loss of their time. Poor Miss Annabella did not wish to go into the room up two steps, nor yet dared she stay behind, for Miss Dorothy, in a kind of spite for not having had it bequeathed to her, kept telling Miss Annabella it was her duty to occupy it, that it was Miss Sophronia's dying wish, and that she should not wonder if Miss Sophronia were to haunt Miss Annabella if she did not leave her warm room, full of ease and sweet scent, for the grim northeast chamber. We told Mrs. Turner we were afraid Miss Dorothy would lord it sadly over Miss Annabella, and she only shook her head, which, from so talkative a woman, meant a great deal. But just as Miss Cordelia had begun to droop, the general came home, without anyone knowing he was coming. Sharp and sudden was the word with him. He sent Miss Cordelia off to school, but not before she had had time to tell us that she loved her uncle dearly, in spite of his quick hasty ways. He carried his sisters off to Cheltenham, and it was astonishing how young they made themselves look before they came back again. He was always here, there, and everywhere, and very civil to us, into the bargain, leaving the key of the hall with us whenever they went from home. Miss Dorothy was afraid of him, which was a blessing, for it kept her in order, and really I was rather sorry when she died. And, as for Miss Annabella, she fretted after her till she injured her health, and Miss Cordelia had to leave school to come and keep her company. Miss Cordelia was not pretty. She had too sad and grave a look for that. But she had winning ways, and was to have her uncle's fortune some day, so I expected to hear of her being soon snapped up. But the general said her husband was to take the name of Morton, and what did my young lady do but begin to care for one of the great mill-owners at Drumble, as if there were not all the lords and commons to choose from besides? Mrs. Turner was dead, and there was no one to tell us about it, but I could see Miss Cordelia growing thinner and paler every time they came back to Morton Hall. And I longed to tell her to pluck up a spirit and be above a cotton spinner. One day, not half a year before the General's death, she came to see us, and told us, blushing like a rose, that her uncle had given his consent, and so, although he had refused to take the name of Morton, and had wanted to marry her without a penny, and without her uncle's leave, it had all come right at last, and they were to be married at once. And their house was to be a kind of home for her Aunt Annabella, who was getting tired of being perpetually on the ramble with the general. "'Dear old friends,' said our young lady, "'you must like him. I am sure you will.' He is so handsome and brave and good. Do you know, he says a relation of his ancestors lived at Morton Hall in the time of the Commonwealth. His ancestors, said Ethelinda. Has he got ancestors? That's one good point about him at any rate. I didn't know cotton spinners had ancestors. What is his name? asked I. Mr. Marmaduke Carr, said she, sounding each R with the old Northumberland burr which was softened into a pretty pride and effort to give distinctiveness to each letter of the beloved name. Carr, said I, Carr and Morton, be it so, it was prophesied of old. But she was too much absorbed in the thoughts of her own secret happiness to notice my poor sayings. He was and is a good gentleman, and a real gentleman too, they never lived at Morton Hall. Just as I was writing this, Ethelinda came in with two pieces of news. Never again say I am superstitious. There is no one living in Morton that knows the tradition of Sir John Morton and Alice Carr. Yet the first part of the hall the Drumble Builder has pulled down is the old stone dining parlour where the great dinner for the preachers mouldered away 
flesh from flesh, crumb from crumb. And the streets they are going to build right through the rooms through which Alice Carr was dragged in her agony of despair at her husband's loathing hatred is to be called Carr Street. And Miss Cordelia has got a baby, a little girl, and writes in pencil two lines at the end of her husband's note to say she means to call it Phyllis. Phyllis Carr, I am glad he did not take the name of Morton. I like to keep the name of Phyllis Morton in my memory, very still and unspoken. End of Morton Hall by Elizabeth Gaskell